test, test. Dobře, zkouším něco říkat. Raz, dva, tři, čtyři.
Hello, so we are trying the audio from here. Can you hear us? Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. So it seems to be set up correctly. Okay, uh, do I need to open the front, uh, front camera? Okay. Can you see me? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it seems to be all good. We see you and we hear you. So, uh, nice. So Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Uh, when do I start? Uh, I can I start? In five minutes. Uh, so, yeah. At 10 a.m. here, which is in five minutes. Uh, okay, five minutes. Mm -hmm, five minutes to go. So, yeah, yeah, you have a lot of people here, which you don't see. Uh, but I hope it will go well. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> yeah. So, uh, I, now I'm... And share the slides with the full window, uh, with the full screen. Can you see it clearly? The respite with tension, the, the title, can you see it clearly? Can, can you see the slides? The respite with tension, I share the window. Yeah, 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 I can see the slides. Uh, and uh, everything seems to be fine. So. Oh, okay. Uh, when uh, if, if it's time to begin, uh, remind me. Thank you. Ah, uh, no, I broke it. Uh, um, yeah. mm -hmm. I think this is better. Okay, so we are ready. 
and uh, yeah, so a couple of minutes and I will be back. Okay. Okay, hello. I hope you can hear me. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Uh, so okay. Good. Uh, okay, so welcome uh, to the uh, second day of uh, Colron. And it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the uh, first speaker, which is speaking over the Zoom, as you can see. And it's uh, Jean, and we will uh, speak about the RISC-V uh, extension support in GCC. Okay, uh, can I start now? Uh, hi, uh, can you hear me? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm from Rebo Technology. Uh, today, I'm going to give a talk about the uh, respite extension support in GCC. Okay. Uh, the RISC-V RVBGC that I have open source in the RISC-V Foundation repo, uh, uh, it has been widely used by many people uh, so far. And uh, now I'm working on the pushing the code to the GCC upstream. Uh, hopefully the GCC team will support the RVB intrinsic. Okay, uh, this is the outline I'm gonna do present you. Uh, the first is the basics uh, of the RVV. Uh, I will pick up some uh, RVV ISA, I, the basics to, to introduce. Uh, the second is the intrinsic support. The, uh, the next is the automatic support. 
And then the evaluation between the RVB GC and the RVB cloud. And, and the final is that the challenges and the to-do list about the RVB GC. Okay. Uh, the first thing I'm going to talk about is the uh, programming model of the RVB. Uh, the first is that we have a 32 vector register. Every register has a fixed uh, vector length space of the state. Uh, the second is that uh, I'm going to talk about is that we have the vector type register. Uh, this register is to specify the operation. Uh, for example, like uh, unlike the ARM SB or X86, they encode the uh, vector element with in uh, encoder encoder instruction. But uh, in RVB, we need to specify the vector length, uh, uh, vector element width in this V type register to tell the CPU or tell the hardware uh, whether uh, the operation. Uh, whether it's the, doing the operation on 8 bits or 16 bits or 32 bits, like uh, at a And uh, the next is the vector length register. This register is to specify the number of the element to be updated uh, with the result from the from vector reg uh, instruction. So uh, the next is the vector byte length. Uh, I call it the length B. Uh, this is the uh, design time cost in any implementation. It is useful for the vector length agnostic auto vectorization. Uh, I'm going to talk about this uh, in the following cha uh, chapters. So here, this is the, an example of, of uh, how we can see the RBV uh, clearly. This is the sequence. You can see here, we use the V set V length. This is a special configuration instruction to specify the V type and the vector and the vector lengths. So here you can see here, this is, we specify the uh, vector lengths with three elements. And this is, uh, we specify the vector V type, meaning this, we doing the operation, vector operation on uh, element with, with is 32. So this is a vector add instruction, for example. So in this instruction, let's suppose the vector length is 128 bits. And then you can see here, for the V length is the three elements and the mass like like this. You can say this will be updated to the test. Uh, this will not be updated to the test. And this will update. Because there are four elements. The last element, because we specify the V length is three elements, the this one is the tail. This will not be updated. Okay. The next thing I'm going to talk about is the configuration configuration setting uh, setting instruction. Well, this is the uh, instruction that I have shown you that is is the reset links instruction. Uh, it's used to specify to uh, specify the vector links and the V type. Okay. Okay. Here is a simple example from the RVBISA. Uh, so far, I'm gone, I'm, uh, I didn't talk about too much details about the RVB. So if you want more details, you can read the RVB ISA like in the GitHub. Okay, uh, this is a simple instruction how the loop, uh, like this is a vector vect add example, how the loop work for the uh, RVB. You can see here, this uh, with every length doing the two things, you can you can uh, say that is uh, is calculate the uh, element uh, to be updated in the current iteration and then set the elements, uh, how many elements that we uh, will update to uh, in the current iteration. So this is the how uh, number of the element uh, we will update in the current iteration. And this is, you can call it, this is the rest of the element to be updated. So here, the key is here, you can see here, this is a subtraction. Every time in the iteration, we will subtract the uh, the rest, the A0 and uh, to T0 until the A, A0 to be, Z, to be zero and then it's see the loop. Okay, this is the RBB uh, ISA basic. Uh, I'm gonna, I, I talk about this. So now let's go, go into the major part of the 
uh, I'm going to talk about. This is the first is the intrinsic support in uh, RVV GCC. Okay. Uh, uh, the first thing I'm going to introduce you is the built-in framework. The built-in framework uh, I I do I do is using the uh, uh, using the special special. Uh, uh, follow the ARM SBE, like uh, you can see here. This is the uh, header of the RVV intrinsic. You can see here the RVV intrins intrinsic header organization, like ARM SBE. I didn't, unlike the NEO or the S86 uh, headers, uh, I didn't uh, I didn't include the, uh, the RVV intrinsic wrapper to uh, in the header. Uh, this uh, this we can gain benefits from this organization. The first is that we don't need to include the wrappers in the header, so we can uh, reduce the compilation time of the five wrapper in uh, header because we have uh, in RVV. I say we have over eighty k built-in functions. If we do uh, too much. Uh, wrappers in the header, uh, it will reduce the com will increase the uh, compiling compilation time significantly. And also, uh, if you short the uh, implementation in the RVV in the GSC, it's easier to maintain. Okay. <clears throat> the first thing is that I'm going to talk about is that how I uh, do do some implementation to uh, change the GCC IR uh, in this built-in framework. Let's take a look at this. This is uh, one of the RBB intrinsic API. Uh, in this API, we we need to first generate the VLEFF uh, instruction. The second is that we need to read the vector names and store the vector names into this new value. So if we call this single user, call this single intrinsic, in the GCC IR, uh, I will change this the statement into this and this. So you can hear, see here. The first I call, uh, I put the first statement is that called the VLEFF. Um, and then the last thing, uh, the next thing is that I read the relay. So you can see here the assembly, the first is uh, this, these two instructions. Okay. The next I'm going to talk about is the insert reset VLAN pass. As I said about, as I said before, that every vector instruction we need to use reset VLANs to specify the VLANs and the VType. Yeah. So you can see here this instruction is uh, I I did this instruction. You can see here this is the VType. You can say here. Yeah. So I specify the VType here. And then this is the VLANs. So this is the VLANs. Um, uh, the compiler uh, should insert the reset VLANs for every intrinsic automatically uh, and correctly. Uh, this pass I implement is using the RTL pass and and the uh, aggregate and the algorithm interpretation is following the LVMO because I have uh, tried the uh, LVMO, uh, RVV LVMO, uh, it works very, uh, very well. So I follow the um, implementation. Like, uh, so the implementation is uh, almost the same as the LVMO. Yeah, uh, so this is the LVMO implementation. Okay. Uh, this is the insert relays. Um, ask how 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 it works. Uh, the first thing is that uh, I collect uh, the information how the basic block, each basic block of that relays and we type. Uh, the second is that uh, do the flow control uh, flow analysis and propagate the relays we type status. The last thing is that I I insert the basic relays for each instruction. So here I'm going to share some intrinsic, uh, interesting, interesting uh, optimization ideas uh, of this. So you can, sorry, yeah, you can see in this example here. Uh, here, this is uh, you can see here 
uh, for the for the loop, uh, the interest inside the loop, he can either go uh, from the uh, from the first condition, either the second condition. So you can see here we set we set relays in this basic block, and set in this basic block. How, however, in the inside the loop, we don't need to insert we set relays. This is a uh, uh, this is an interesting idea that uh, I, I show you. I think it is interesting that I use the PHI information to do the optimization. Okay, this is another optimization, uh, but I'm going to skip this. Um, okay, uh, even though I, I have talked about that the, um, the implementation uh, of the inservilience pass, uh, are almost the same as the Clown and uh, LVM and GDC. Uh, this I so I uh, but I there is some difference. So I create this is uh, we have the difference bet uh, register spilling between the LVM and GDC. Yeah, uh, this is the for register spilling here. So for this is the coaching of the LVM. You can uh, you can see here. For 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 the register spilling for the uh, in LVM, they use the whole register uh, store to blue store to do this. Meaning that they even though this is only one eighth, meaning uh, not a full register register uh, to store, but in the LVM they store the whole register and load the whole register. However, for for, for us uh, for the GC, we don't do do this. I do this using the uh, this store uh, instruction and with the um, reset relays uh, to only store only spill uh, one eighth of the register. So it, uh, our GC spill size is smaller than the LVM. That is the difference between GCC and the LVM. Okay. Um, the final things of the RVV uh, intrinsic support uh, I'm going to talk about is the 64-bit uh, handling in the RV32 system. Uh, let me intro uh, talk, uh, introduce you the background. Uh, we have a set of the instruction we call vector scalar instruction, meaning like, for example, this is a V at VX instruction here. Uh, this is the vector register, and this is the general purpose register, or you can call scalar register. The operation, uh, the, the meaning of this operation is that add a one value into each ele active element, uh, active element of the v, uh, uh, this vector register. So here, this is an example of, I call it this intrinsic here. So in the RV64, system uh the element bits uh links in, uh, in each scalar register is 64 so each scalar general register can hold uh 64 bit value however for rv32 system you can see here this is the com uh, compile option uh, at each general register can only hold 32 bit so if you want to uh, to store the value of the, oh no, sorry, it's for this. Uh, if you want to store the value of integer 64 into the register, you need to um, spend two register. So we need a, so, we, so in the, so in the 64 system, you can see here, it's very simple, just call this instruction. However, for the RV32 bit, we need some special. The first is that we need to store this 64 value into the memory. Here, you can see here, used to uh, store that is, uh, instruction to the memory. And then we use the instruction to load uh, this scalar in integer uh, 64 bit value from the memory and then broadcast to the whole vector register and then finally we do the vector add vector add with vector mv and vector you can see here vv this is the vx this is the we we, uh, we do the implementation in the gc but 
Uh, at this overall, this implementation is the same as the LVM, uh, but there is some difference between GC and LVM here. I'm going to, uh, this is how I implement that. Uh, I, I, I do the implementation in the Gimpo, uh, Gimpo, uh, Gimpo GC CIR. Uh, this is uh, how I implement, so you can see here. I first I use the broadcast instruction to duplicate, and then the, and then I generate the vector add between vector and vector. Which is it? Sorry, if I may stop you, there's a question in the audience. Uh, yeah. So sorry. Uh, hey, a uh, couple of questions. Uh, first question is: You said there are like eighty thousand intrinsics. Are those table generated, or does somebody actually write them by hand? Uh, I, you, you mean how, how do I implement this intrinsic in the GC? You mean? Okay. Uh, I, 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 actually, I didn't uh, count uh, how many exactly how, how many are uh, intrinsic in the GCC, uh, RVV intrinsic document. Uh, but I, I know the approximate the, uh, the number of the intrinsic. Yeah. Uh, this uh, this in the this has been in, implemented in the LVM table gene, and uh, I I also implemented in the GC two. Okay. Um, uh, so does anybody know how how these were generated? I mean, is this? It sounds like it's a nightmare to you know maintain, right? Um, uh, I, I, sorry, I, I didn't understand your question clearly. Can you hold, say again? Hold on, somebody in the audience uh, wants to say something. Hello, uh, it's Kito. Uh, I guess I can answer that. The, the, why, why the number of the intrinsic is, is so huge is because the uh, type system in the RV uh, is has some different combination with the uh, data wise. For example, the A bit, 64 bit, 32 bit, and 64 bit. Then there is four combination for single instruction. And then there is another concept called ELMO. It can use in the uh, sequence, uh, uh, more than one register. So one, two, four, eight register can be a group. So four data type uh, across the four different ELMO. Yeah, this is the V type. Yeah. We specify the V melt, uh, we call it regi yeah, uh, so register. It's, so, so it's, yeah, it's kind of uh, uh, and com uh, and combination, so you just list all the instruction and the generate a lot of uh, intrinsic. So, as I remember, the uh, in fact the vector in instruction is only a uh, two thousand. But if you combine with the different type and the wise, then it become the eighty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. You can see here. I write this. This is the element with there are four types. Maybe in the future, we need to support 128. And then this is the vector register grouping. You can see here one eighth, meaning there are one four. This is one half of the register. This is uh, one register. This two register, four register, and eight register. You can see each, each instruction, we, we have four multiply seven, maybe one, no, two, I, three. I, I understand how the combinatorics work. I just didn't understand how it was set up, if it was table driven or. Uh, somebody actually wrote these things by hand. That's what I was asking. Um, so uh, I can take it offline. I, I did have another question about uh, how do you specify to the compiler what the actual hardware is capable of for the target, and uh, or is it is it done at runtime, or do you have to do it at compile time? Uh, because you know, obviously, they're you know quite different implementations of vector, right? Uh. Okay. Uh, do, do, did you understand my question? <laughs> Sorry, I did not understand. Maybe Kito, can you, can you say it again? I don't can translate for me. You should say it in Chinese. Okay, basically, uh, this most uh, information is come from the, the ISA string, dash and arc, RBC, blah, 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 blah. Okay. And uh, the arc string has now encoded some <laughs> essential information, like uh, the minimal vector length and uh, what the uh, data wise has supported. So the 
GC implementation is relies on loss info to generate the code. Okay, now I understand your question now. You mean how uh, I, I use the scripting or I handwriting the, how, the intrinsic generation? Yeah, you, you know how I maintain this, right? Actually, well, the, maintain, the maintenance of this RVV intrinsic support is not very difficult. Yeah, just because we, I have uh, iterators uh, just encoding the, in the GSC implementation, so it's not that hard. So, yeah, because if, we, uh, if I say again here, okay, here, if I define this, you can see here, define RVV function. There is an iterator you can see here. This is a BI, meaning there, uh, all, all the machine model, or you can call machine model, or all the RVV vector types are in these iterators. So I just only, for the maintenance, I just only define one single line here. I, and then the GC will add all the intrinsic related to the V add, the, all the vector types. Uh, related to the V add inside the GCC uh, declaration, uh, am I? Uh, uh, am I? Is this clear? Okay. okay. Hey, oh, wait. Oh. wait. Maybe, maybe, maybe I can back to the next question. Let's move. Start. Okay, moving. Uh, 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 can I uh, keep uh, move on the next page? <laughs> Okay, can I move on to the next page? Sorry, can I move on to, to the next page? <laughs> yes, you can. Okay. Uh, the uh, the diff uh, yeah for for this uh, uh, for this handling, uh, I'm going to show you the difference between LVM and the GC. You can you can see see here. Oh no, this is uh, this is one of reduce the duplicate vector register. You can say here if we specify for this uh, uh, or X, so we just only duplicate or broadcast a vector register only one time and only once, and then use them in the following instruction. Okay, this is the difference. I'm not, I need to talk about. Sorry, sorry. this is a difference between the code chain between the GC and the LVM. You can see here the X. This uh, this intrinsic you can see here are in, are inside the loop here. Uh, in GC, we are able to hoist uh, vector duplic duplication or broadcast outside the loop. And uh, this is a uh, Cloud LVM code chain. You can see here the vector broadcasting inside the loop. So this is the difference between the GC and the LVM. Uh, you can see here, this is the compliance broadcast. You can see the code chain for LVM. Okay. That is clear, right? Okay. Uh, the next, the next is the register coalescing optimization. I'm going to talk about. This is the ARM example for. Uh, this is an example of ARM. Uh, you can see here. Uh, in this example, the ARM uh, generate redundant move instruction here. So this is also the problem for RVV. So I implement uh, register coalescing in the RVV. So you can see here, there is no move register, register uh, redundant, no, uh, no redundant register move instruction here. Uh, this I have to done the uh, register call lazy. Okay, the next stuff is I'm going to talk about, uh, and I think this is a big, uh, is the auto vectorization support. Okay, uh, the auto vectorization support, uh, I'm is that we support all of this auto vectorization. And uh, we, for the RVV, we support scalable vector, uh, vector links. So we have a vector links agnostic or vector links specific, meaning that this one, it, this auto vectorization, meaning during the compilation, the compiler 
uh, doesn't uh, doesn't know the actual vector length of the hardware. And this one is the specify the hardware vector length to the GC. Okay. Okay. Let's talk. Uh, let's take a look about the uh, the difference between RSV S eighty six and IBM between the RVV. The difference. Uh, I'm going to point out the difference that the ARM SV and the 688 uh, 86 uh, target they support BF 16 uh, floating point uh, type, but in RVV we don't support this. And uh, the next is that uh, the ARM SV only need the predication uh, vector vector operation predicate by the mask uh, also with the uh, X86. But for the RVV, we need to support uh, vector links, a uh, predicate by the vector links only, or predicate by the mask only. And also we need to support the predicate, vector predication by mask and links both. Uh, here I'm going to tell you why we need this support. You can see here, this is the one, this is the Example here. This is the example predicate by links here. You can see here the iteration, the loop iteration n is a variable, meaning the compiler doesn't know is uh, how many ML we need to deal with. So we introduce links load and links add. So this is the operation uh, include or uh, predicate by the links only. Okay. The next is that the links is known for the, meaning the comp compiler know the iteration, how many iteration we, we need to deal with. Uh, there is control flow here. So for RVV, uh, we also have the, uh, we, other vector operation also can be predicated by the mask, but the mask can only generate by the compile instruction. You can see here, this is a mask flow, and this is the compile instruction, compile pattern. You can see here, this is a, Compare instruction. So we have a conditional add. This is the predicate by the mask only. Also, the last is I want to introduce you is the, we also need the operation predicate by mask and links both. You can see this simple code here. This is a code is that the loop length is a variable. You can see here. Uh, and uh, there is also a control flow here. Clear? So we need the support here. This is called link mask load, meaning predicate by links and mask both. And also we had the links conditional add here. So yeah, this is the in interest interesting that I'm going to introduce you. Okay. <clears throat> so these are these are the stuff that I already uh, support in the RVVJC and uh, include so many middle end changes in the future. After I support the RVV intrinsic, I'm gonna to push them to the GDC upstream. I hope the global reviewers can help me. Okay, thanks. Okay, mm, the auto vectorization support uh, is, well, it is a very interesting part for the RVV. Uh, actually, so far I have introduced over 100 patterns. Maybe I'm going to optimize it because it's to be 100 customized uh, patterns in the middle end uh, for the auto vectorization. Uh, I'm going to optimize this to uh, minimize these patterns uh, in the future. Yeah, it is still too big, right? <laughs> okay. Uh, here and also we have a special instruction we call reset relay instruction to calculate the outer wing vector length. So I introduce a violence pattern to the GC uh, to, to optimize the auto vectorization using the RBV feature. Yeah, I'm going to talk about all of this in the following pages. <clears throat> the first I'm going to talk about is the VLA auto vectorization. You can see here, this is a very simple code vector add, and uh, you can see here, this is the reset v -links. Uh You can, because this is the real uh, vector links agnostic, so we need to read the v b to 
to this scalar register, uh, meaning uh, we, the compiler need to read the vector length from the hardware uh, in the wrong time because we don't know the vector length. So here, and then every time he bump the pointer, I think you can see here, this is the value that we do this uh, reading B length B. You can see here, right? It's very clear. And then uh, following the sequence uh, introduced by the RVBI say, you can see here, this is, we I bump the point uh, up, decrement the counter, you can see here. We set we length, we generate the output. This is output. The output meaning that the number of the element uh, we update or we, yeah, we, we, we operate in the current uh, iteration. So we, uh, uh, every, every iteration, we need to subtract the output of the reset billion instruction until the, the total, you can call it total or red, or you can call it the rest of the element we need to deal with until to, the, to be the zero, and then it sits the loop. Yeah, makes sense? Okay, this is the VLS auto vectorization meaning I specify this. Uh, I show you there is the difference between the clown and the uh, GC. So here, in this, uh, in this example, VLS auto vectorization, we, need, we don't need, because the compiler understand uh, how many, uh, uh, no, uh, understand the vector length of the hardware. So we, need, we bound the pointer just directly with, uh, you can see here, with the, with the vector links that we specified, right? So we don't need to read the VLSB. Okay, uh, this is we call uh, fixed links, uh, vector links, uh, auto, uh, auto vectorization, meaning if we specify the vector links to be this number, we can only run the binary uh, on the machine with this uh, uh, vector links. However, uh, even though you can see here the, in the cloud, the code chain uh, is worse than GC, but in this code chain, he can uh, run, run, uh, run this uh, binary in the vector length larger than this number. Uh, I call it, maybe I call it, this is called minimum, maybe I, I'm going to call it this minimum length VLS auto vectorization. Uh, I, I definitely will uh, support it in the in the future, maybe in the upstream GC. Okay. Okay, uh, the next is the, I'm going to talk about the patterns that I support in the auto vectorization. Here I list all of these patterns. This is the example patterns that already supported in the GCC middle end. All of these implementation are only the risk five backend support. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm not going to talk about this much. Uh, so, because the time is limited, so this I call the normal standard patterns. Uh, I have support all of them in the risk five port that can. Uh, I'm not. I, I come, I'm going to skip this part because uh, uh, because I, I think this is uh, this is only the backend support. Uh, it's very simple uh, and not very interesting. The next is that I'm going to talk about the middle end changes to support the auto vectorization uh, using RBV features. So I so I include so many middle end changes and many uh, patterns for the auto vectorization. The first thing is that I need to introduce is the wire links pattern. Okay, uh, because the RSB or uh, X eighty uh, six, they do the auto vectorization using the mask operator vector, predi uh, vector predication. However, for the RVV, we as I show you, we need the um, vector predicate by the vector links. And we also have the reset V links, uh, this special configuration setting instruction to set the vector links and uh, calculate the vector links. So I introduce this pattern for RVV auto vectorization. Okay. Uh, this is the simple code. That's how I that this is a, a simple ad that I, I already showed you here. You can see here, this is the wire length. Uh, 
uh, pattern. The key is here. This is you can call the current uh, number, meaning the rest of the number we need to deal with. And this is the output of the violence, meaning the number of the elements we, uh, we operate in the current iteration. So you can see here, every time in this iteration inside the loop, we need to subtract by the output of the violence. Yeah, it, it's clear. So the code you can see here, uh, this is the RVV ISA example. You can see here uh, the code is very similar, almost the same. So the RVVGC can uh, use the RVV uh, feature to do auto vectorization. <laughs> okay, the next is uh, I'm going to introduce some interesting, interesting patterns that uh, I add to the middle end. This is the link mask low store. Yeah, I have shown you that there is uh, there is the predicate control flow here, and also we need to predicate by the names. So we need to introduce the link mask flow and the link mask store. I I support them in the middle end. So yeah, here you can see here this is the link mask. So in the GCR you can see here this is the links and this is a mask. So the uh, you can see here this is the mask. So the assembly is like this, uh, link bus load and link bus store. Okay, the next is the link scatter load and link scatter store, yeah. For the scatter and scatter, we predicate by the links only. There is no control flow here. So here you can see it's very obvious, right? This is, I, sub I add a middle edge. Maybe. Also the next, you can see here, this is the predicate. Uh, this is a scatter load and scatter store predicate by the links only. The next is the scatter load, scatter store predicate by links and mask both. So you can see, you can see the difference. This is the C code only predicate by links. There is no control flow. And this is the code that I add the control flow here. So we need to support uh, links mask scatter load and link mask scatter store. Yeah, it's quite. Obvious, right? Uh, sorry, may I ask okay. you? May I stop you? There's a question in the audience again. So uh, I can see why you need the, the LEN variants, but could you like unify them with the LEN mask ones? As I think the ISA allows to use an all active mask on, on, on the set vector length, so you we don't need to triplicate all the function, but only duplicate them, and, and have the vectorizer basically specify the, the a constant all set mask when vectorizing only for the len case. Okay, you mean optimize, uh, because I introduced too much patterns, uh, optimize it, uh, so it's like unified the patterns, right? The, yes, the, the, yes. So, so, so. Uh, sure. Definitely, I'm going to optimize in the future because this is, yeah, uh, as I told you that I introduced over 100 patterns. I think uh, I agree with you that this is, this is the thing I need to optimize because I introduced too much here. Yeah, it's okay. I'm going to optimize it and merge some of these patterns and then unify so we can reduce the patterns. Yeah. Okay, uh, can I move on? Okay, yeah. the next is the, okay, uh, sorry? Yes, we can move on, thank you. Okay, the next is the links, low links, and the links, low links, the same as the, as I before just, yeah, you, you can say this is redundant. I can, uh, I should, you know, just uh, merge them to, to a single pattern. Maybe in the future, I'm going to optimize it. And so this is the non common operation, meaning links FMA. I, I talk about this is the link FMA, the common operation. This is I call ALU operation. So you can hear this is FMA, meaning the multiply and then add to the best. So I introduced the links FMA uh in the middle end 
yeah uh, maybe this yeah used to so we have uh so for this i'll introduce links so links at links mouth and links fma links is 10 uh like that is, uh, is too much right too many patterns yeah i, I will figure out i will try to figure out to uh, figure out way, the way to reduce this pattern maybe it's too large too too big okay this is links conditional meaning uh yeah you can see here there is control flow there is a condition and there is links predicate so i introduced links condition at sub like fma links condition in this support so you can see here this operation is predicated by the mask and uh, by the links both okay uh, the next is the uh, auto vectorization support for the vector scale operation uh in the gcc we don't support uh the vector operation between the vector and the scalar. For all for the for the code like this, we first duplicate in the GC, we first duplicate the this this value into a vector and then do the vector and vector operation. So I introduce uh, uh, operation between vector and scalar so we can use this instruction VX instruction. This is the uh, special instruction that the RVV has. Okay, uh, this is the same. This is the vector scalar, but this is the scalar minus the vector. Okay. Uh, the next is the mix operation. You can see here. The mix operation, the, the interesting part is that you can see here. This is unsigned. This is a signed value. I call it a mix operation. So I support this in, also in the GC. This is, uh, we can use the RVVI instruction, uh, this is a missed operation in the RVV uh, ISA. Uh, do the return multiply add between a sign value and the unsigned value. Okay. Okay, uh, the next is the reduction. We have the in order reduction and the unordered reduction. So for the in order reduction, we need to to the re, uh, this is uh, actually in order reduction and power is special for the floating point reduction. You can see here this is float. So for the in order reduction, I introduced the links float left plus. So in this case, the this is the in order reduction here. In short, this is the in order reduction, floating point reduction in RVVI say. Uh, in this case, the uh, the operation is that they do the reduction uh, in order from from the uh, from the element zero to, uh, to the highest value. Okay. Okay. The next thing is the unordered reduction here, meaning that in the floating point, if you specify the fast mass, uh, we will need. Uh, we will re uh, use the unordered reduction. Okay, but in this we need to TMU. Uh, if you want to want to understand, you can read the I R V I say. So in this case, we use the unordered floating point reduction, meaning that the reduction operation is unordered. We don't care about uh, uh, the sequence that or the order you do the reduction. Okay. The next is the SLP auto vectorization. The key is that you can see here, the vector length of A is half of the B. So this is, uh, so here, I shift the vector length and then generate the, uh, do the SLP auto vectorization using the, uh, in the RVD. So here, this is the code chain. I also support the SLP auto vectorization uh, using uh, in the RVD, I say. Okay, the next is the evaluation between the GC and cloud. Uh, the evaluation is that I use the spy simulator, which is count the number of the, uh, how many instructions during the runtime, that's the meaning, how many instructions the simulator exactly run. So here, this is, uh, I pick up some, some interesting benchmark. This is one of the benchmark I call the person detection algorithm, meaning just I don't I, I don't learn this algorithm. Uh, I, I guess it's just to recognize the picture whether it is a person. You can see here 
The red is the GC. Uh, I use the, this is as a base, meaning vector length 128 uh, LVM uh, performance. So you can see here overall, the, this is a red. Red is the GC performance. You can see here the overall the GC is better than the LVM. But I didn't claim that this is always the case because this is just the instruction count uh, running on the spike. Uh, if it's run on the hardware, uh, then maybe there is another case. I just only show you that the instruction number, the GEC compile is uh, is smaller than the uh, than the LVM, less than the LVM. So the other thing is the micro speech algorithm in the tensor flow. Yeah, you can see here. In this case, the GEC overload uh, has a big performance speed up than the LVM. Okay, the next benchmark I'm going to show you is the TSVC here. Uh, you can see here, this is the line. The line uh, on the left is the benchmark. The number of the benchmark is the GC better than the LVM. The, left, uh, the, right, side, the right side is the LVM is better than the GC. These three cases, you can see here, the LVM uh, overall is much uh, better than the GC. I have analyzed these three cases. These cases just because the uh, GC failed to optimize. This is a long question uh, in two years ago. There is a, uh, this is an issue in the bug zero. Yeah, this is overall the same. Uh, this is the bug zero here. I hope someone can fix it maybe or in the future I'm going to fix it. This is the known issue in the GC that the LVM can uh, auto vectorize but the GC failed to auto vectorize. Okay, the final benchmark I'm going to show you is the I call Eigen. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, the yellow is I, I can you can see here the yellow box, uh, let, let me introduce, the when the box is longer or the bigger, the difference between the GEC and the LVM is, is larger. You can see here the yellow boxes, uh, is the GEC better the, than the cloud? Uh, the, these boxes, uh, or like a blue boxes, are the cloud better? You can see here, these three benchmark, GEC overall is, uh, is much more uh, better than the cloud, uh, very greatly, right? 30 times better than the LVM. Okay, let's take a look at the GC. The worst case in, for the GC, you can see here. This is here. Meaning just the performance of the GC is only 20%, uh, 20% of the cloud. So maybe in the future, I'm going to focus to uh, optimize them. Uh, this is for vector length specified uh, auto vectorization, no fast mass. The next is the fast mass overall uh, are similar. The next is the vector length agnostic. For the vector length agnostic, you can show here, this is very big. Almost all of the benchmark, the GC are better than the cloud. And uh, also the same, these three benchmark, the GC is so huge, uh, the uh, huge, the, the uh, greatly better than the LVM here. Maybe uh, uh, if you're interested, you can you can download the icon to uh, decide to compile them to, yeah, to try them. Yeah, very interesting, right? Okay, uh, the final stuff. Uh, time, uh, I'm going to run out of time. The final stuff is the challenge and do this, I'm going to show you, is that uh, the challenge is that too much middle end changes in the GC I need to uh, uh, change in the GC middle ends to support RVV auto vectorization. So maybe I need the help to, to, to make this change. And to do this, uh, the first is the min minimum length VLS auto vectorization. Also, RVV cost model. Uh, so far, I use the default cost model. 
and also more optimized and tax of the automatization. Also, we need to support here. Yeah, this is a very big topic to implement, meaning just for GC, both for both GC and LLVM, they they use the LMUL equal to one by default for the autovectorization. You can see here, if I use the command option specify, you can see M1, M2, M4. These need the user specify uh, the register group you use in the autovectorization. Uh, I think the compiler should, should not let the user to uh, define it or let the user to configure it. I, I think the compiler should figure out an algorithm to pick up the best uh, register group for the auto vectorization. Uh, this is a huge part. Maybe if you have any ideas of this, uh, maybe send me, send me the email or, or some paper reference. Uh, tell me how to do it so that I didn't figure out how to do it. Okay. Uh, thank you. This is all I have. Thanks. Uh, does anyone have, have any question? Not many questions, so I will start. So um, as for getting all of this stuff, even in the middle and upstream, I would suggest to simply start um, implementing the backend support for the patterns that are already there in the middle end, and then like try to merge piecemeal because I, as I understand, all the development that you did didn't really happen publicly visible on the GCC list, so there was no discussion at all um, of, of what you did, and that, as I suggested, for merging of some of the patterns, that will inevitably lead to some comments that you need to spend more work on, on what you've done right now. So, uh, and, but, uh, so at, at the moment, it's very difficult to do any experiment with risk v vectorization because there's no support at all, right? And even if you implement some patterns, so just do backend support, it's probably that the vectorizer would already do something, at least if you like fix the vector length uh, or something like that. Maybe so. Maybe you can merge, propose merge for the parts that can be done without any middle end changes so that people can somehow play with it and, and get a feeling for how code is generated. Okay, yeah, yeah, I agree with you, mate. Uh, after I support the RV intrinsic, uh, I'm going to first support the fixed links. Maybe this is uh, where the first thing, a fixed links, vector links, uh, auto vectorization. Uh, maybe uh, we, I don't need to change the middle S, just I only support in the back end. And then, uh, to f and then to uh, push code related to the middle ends, right? Uh, yeah, I'm going to do it step by step. Yeah, I agree with you. Hi, I have uh, basically two questions. Uh, the first one is, uh, you you have a lot of uh, customized pattern which will be introduced in the middle end, right? Yes. So, yes. is those uh, pattern? Did you have any study uh, whether they can be used by some other uh, platform? So, yeah. For example, if 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 you introduce some pattern in the middle end, it's uh, it's only specific for the risk five. So, if it can be used by some other platform. Yeah, for other architecture, then I think it might be uh, reasonable to introduce in the middle end. Otherwise, seems not very good, right? Uh, I definitely can tell you hmm. these of the uh, patterns definitely can be used by other platform. Uh, I introduced this platform not my ideas. It's according to the LVM. For example, for the link. Uh, links mask load. Uh, can you remember? These patterns are not my ideas. It's the idea from the LVM. The LVM, you can, you can search VP or you can see VP intrinsic support in LVM. You can Google it. 
these are the support uh, predicate, I mean, called vector operation predicate by mask and links both. These kind of the patterns are already su uh, uh, supported in the LVM. I just copy and implement these ideas in the GC. So I can definitely to tell you it makes sense to support them in the middle end. <coughs> uh, can you can you can you understand my question? Uh, my answer. You can search VP in intrinsic support in LVM. Uh, this are okay. <coughs> yeah, I will try to search it. Oh, uh, 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 maybe we can discuss a little bit uh, offline on this. But uh, another question is uh, the you you have the uh, the performance data show the LLVM and GCC and TCC doing much better than LLVM. So do you have any study on what's the reason for that? Uh, I'm, I didn't claim that always the performance GCC is better than the LVM. As I show you, some of the benchmark I, I will show you in the icon, right? Uh, the LVM is better than GCC. Just uh, for the GC better, the benchmark GC better than LVM uh, is much better. You can say the difference is big. Uh, if you want, uh, if you say that, uh, how can I do this? I do this just according to the RBV ISA. I I do the optimization according to the RBV ISA and some uh, automatization papers and do the study and the optimize them in the GC. Uh, for the benchmark that GEC not better than the LVM, I'm still working on it to make the GEC overall better than the LVM. This is the, my goal, right? Yeah, I yeah. think the uh, good, better understanding on um, why GCC is doing better than LVM might be also helpful. And uh, I, uh, I noticed in your uh, very early slides, you mentioned uh, there are some loop in. Uh, loop optimization happened for GCC, but not happened for the LLVM, right? You yeah. have one slide on. So is, that's one of the reasons the speed up uh, uh, GCC compared to the LLVM. So is uh, uh, LLVM do the vectorization in a very late stage? Yes. Uh, as I told you, LVM introduced the vector predication intrinsic, uh, like uh, the same as the link mask I introduced in the GC. Uh, they introduced these patterns in the LVM, but they didn't fully support them in the middle end. They just oh, okay. uh, support, them, mm. uh, support them in progress. Uh, as I told you, you should search VP intrinsic in LVM. It's very obvious. It's a lot of materials in the Google, but I fully support the VP intrinsic. You can call VP intrinsic uh, in GC. So that's why uh, overall the GC is better than the LVM. Again, the the optimization ideas not my uh, not my creative ideas. I I do this optimization just for uh, just reference to the VP intrinsic support in LVM. Even though they didn't fully support in the middle end, I fully support in the GC. That's it, the case why GC is much better than the LVM. But I definitely, I, I think the LVM is finally will, will, uh, will, 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 uh, will support them fully in the middle end because I'm, I'm working on it in the LVM too. Yeah, okay, so, you. yeah. So, uh, we already have uh, the other buff uh, on the risk five. Uh, so, uh, we need to finish with this talk. Uh, but you can okay. move the discussion to the rest five buff, which is uh, on the other Zoom link. So if you move there, you know, you can continue. Uh, so, yeah, but thank you for a very okay. interesting talk and a lot of okay. questions. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Bye. Uh, now we are unmuted. So we can. Oh, okay. All right. Uh, am I on the screen? Because I wanted to show you something. Uh, please wait a minute. Okay. <laughs> So this is the uh, G Prof and G headquarters. If uh, 
we could host the next cauldron. I know we're competing with the big competition, but um, this is this is where we're based. Well, if only dreams came true. So. Okay, so I believe uh, that uh, the technology should work. Okay. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce the next speaker, uh, which is Arun uh, van der Pass, and uh, you will speak about uh, the new uh, GM profiler. Yeah. I believe, yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for either staying or arriving. Uh, the other room, they, they don't know what they will miss. So um, you're the privileged ones. Um, I'm going to try to make this uh, entertaining and, and informative. It's going to be a somewhat different talk from what you have seen before. I'm not a compiler person. I actually like to harass compiler people uh, because I'm more on the end user side. I'm, I'm deeply involved with GProf and G, and I do the coding, but um, a lot of what you guys are talking about, you're way smarter than I am, um, is beyond me. So bear with me, uh, I can answer, definitely answer questions, and I'll try to do that in the best possible way, but this, this is really a joint work with um, Vladimir Mazensev and our manager, Kurt Gobel. Uh, Vladimir couldn't be here, so I'll, um, I'll, take, the, um, I'll take the risk of uh, presenting here. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting us. Like I said, this is going to be a, a little bit of a different talk. And um, as I said, I'm going to try to make it informative if my, if my laser pointer works. And um, it's all about GProf and G, the next generation GNU profiling tool. So I put together the following agenda. I want to give you a very brief history and status um, then, of course, I'll, I'll start talking about GProf and G itself, a little overview. So I'd like to go wide, in a way. Then I really want to get to the demos and example part um, as quickly as possible. I'll say a little bit about future directions, but there should actually be a timestamp there, because that can change in five minutes. It's just what we're currently thinking about, what we would do. And one of the reasons why we're happy to be here is that it provide us feedback. Uh, you help us prioritize, um, so, um, so take that with a bit of a grain of salt. It's more like what's in our head, and again, that can change before lunch. Uh, then I'm going to do a what we call a technology preview of the GUI. The GUI isn't ready, but it's close enough to being ready to give you a feel for what it's about. And at the end, uh, we'll have a Q&A session, which I always find surprising because I don't pretend to have the answer to every possible question asked to me. So we'll see. I'll do my best, that's for sure. Um, a little bit of the, um, the history of GProf and G. Again, I'll keep that very short, just that you have an idea where this tool comes from. Um, it all started a long time ago, and, and actually at the, that time we had marketing people that changed the name quicker than we could rename our files. So um, the la latest name was Oracle Developer Studio Performance Analyzer, which was way too long anyhow. Um, but the big thing is this tool was actually developed for over 20 years. Um, so in the process, we built up a lot of users, and many of them came with ugly applications. So it's somewhat battle-hardened. It doesn't mean we don't have bugs and all that stuff, but it's, it has been maturing for a while. But the focus was on the Spark processor, the studio compilers, and the Solaris operating system. And as you know, this came from Sun, so th that was not a surprise. There has been an x86 version on Linux for quite a while, but really the focus of the company and the whole tool group was more on Spark. Um, but what we did, we took that source tree as a basis for GProf and G. And um, what we did was the first thing we did, create a standalone ver version for Linux. Because in the old days, you would have to install all of Studio just to do your performance analysis. You don't need to do that anymore. This is a standalone product. 
We tried to adapt the, the source code to the GNU coding standards. We're still finding pockets here and there. We're like, ah, oh, okay, we missed that. So um, that's a little bit of work in progress, but we, I think we, we got the big, the big things. Um, we also tried to adapt the build process to be compliant with other bin utils components. Um, a new thing is that we uh, ported to ARM. That's our very first port to ARM. So bear with us, but we, we got started on that. We fixed several bugs as we hit them along the way. And one thing we did, uh, which was actually uh, being on the user side, a long standing wish, we redesigned the user interface. And I hope you like what, uh, what, what we have. So it all started to the outside world a little more over a year ago when we submitted our code for the review to the Ben Udles community. And um, of course, we've been working on it for quite a while, but that was the time that all, we got all the signatures and we could go public and like, okay, tell us what you like, tell us what you don't like. So that, that started it. And uh, as you know, all these mails are archived, so you can look it up if you want. Uh, then to our delight, March 9, we got the approval. And, um, a, a person I shall not mention by name sent us, it's okay, you can go. Um, so um, we were very, very excited about that. And um, when we want to thank the reviewers. Uh, we, we're new to this. Um, that's the bottom line. We have some people in our team that have been doing this for all of their, all of their life and maybe even before that. But uh, we're still learning, so you've been all very patient and kind. So we really appreciate that. And we try to be a good citizen, that's, that's for sure. So thank you for that. And then the, the other milestone happened in August of this year when we were part of 2.39. Uh, so now GProf and G is included. And when you go to the page, there's a one-line description that, um, that tells you what GProf and G is about. So uh, again, you all know this. I'll, I'll do that very quickly because I really want to go to the, to the demos. Okay. Uh, of course, uh, if you find a bug or you have some idea that you want to share with us, we're, we're in Bugzilla. Um, product has been Udels, component is GProf and G. Just let us know. We're very keen on, on handling that. We try to respond very quickly. Not sure how long it will take to have the solution, but we definitely want to communicate with you. And this is a good way. So what's GProf and G? Um, it's, a, it's an application level um, performance tool. It will tell you where your program is spending its time. And we support C, C++, Java, and Scala. There is a little bit of Fortran support. I'm old enough to have started in Fortran. Um, but boy, Fortran has gotten so complex. I'm not sure where we can manage that. But uh, you can try it with the Fortran code. And uh, if you're interested, let us know. Then we may crank up our investments in that. So currently, we focus on C, C++, Java, and Scala. We, we support the GCC compilers. That's, that's our focus. We support various processors from Intel, AMD, and ARM. There are many of them, and um, it's, it's not that trivial to support a new processor, and I'll get back to that in a few minutes. But again, we, we're doing our best. One of the key things about this tool is, is that you don't have to recompile your code. And for those of you who have done performance analysis, I think you'll appreciate that, that you don't have to do anything special. Well, that sounds like a big marketing statement, and it, it is a little bit, because um, we can't give you source code information unless you have added dash G to your compile line, because we don't have the mapping to the, to the source file. But um, other than that, even with any, any sort of binary, you can get a lot of information. And, and actually, people have been using that. And I'll, I'll preempt the quest question, actually, right now, right here. Do you support Python? No, but um, you, you could try it on Python, and you, you'll get the call stack of, of the Python code, and maybe that will tell you something. So um, again, we have language support for those languages, but essentially you can pretty much profile any application. And it's surprising how often you get insight with that. So what we, what we say, we like to say, it works with production binaries, because when you have to recompile your code, you inherently are looking at something different. Okay. We have full support for multi-threading. Uh, we support POSIX threads, um, OpenMP, those of you who know me, no surprise, uh, and Java threads. So we try to, um, to, to cover that as well. Okay. So how does it work? It's a two-step approach. You have the collection phase, so you collect 
the performance data on the run or runs that you want to do. Before I forget to say that, although my examples are very simple, you can, have, you can load multiple experiments um, in, as part of your analysis. It's not restricted to one. And, and with those multiple experiments, you can choose either we aggregate the data or you can compare. And, and I'm going to show that. So you do that at performance experiments, and then you have different ways to start displaying the data and hopefully get some insight. One of the things we do with one run, you get information at the function source and disassembly level. And um, like I said, I've been on the user side for a long time. What I like is I don't have to do anything special. It's already there. We may not show it by default, but it's already there. Um, so we have multiple views. And when you start playing with that, you find out that you can already learn a lot from that single run. And you know, performance analysis is a highly iterative process. So then you start drilling deeper and maybe do another run. But the first one will, will give you some insight, hopefully. Another thing we have is scripting. I'm an absolutely bad typer, as you will witness in a few minutes. Um, so I put everything I do in a script. Um, so you can completely automate. We have like a little, I wouldn't call it a language, but you can kind of put commands into a file that we read. Not, not rocket science, but absolutely convenient. It also helps you to document how you generated your profile. Of course, never happens to me, but sometimes you may need some history, like how did I get there? Um, you can do a lot of customization. The defaults, I think, are chosen very well. But of course, those are defaults, and you can customize it pretty much any way you like. One of the powerful things is that we have filters. You can filter on time, you can filter on thread, and you can filter on call stacks. So you can really, really narrow it down. Like, I only want to see this in thread number five, for example. So, and I'll, I'll try to give you a glimpse of that as well. And I think the really coolest feature is the comparison of profiles. Profiling is about comparing when you think about it. You have a good run, and then you have some regression. And it could be in a multi-threaded code. Your code starts going slower as you add threads, which is not what you want. Or you uh, recompile your code, uh, and, and something blows up. And so we have that. We can do that. And to preempt another question, of course, we can't always do that, because it depends on the binary that was generated. If a function is inlined away, we won't crash. But we won't be able to tell you much either. It's one of those things that we hope to do better in the future. Um, but definitely, I find this really useful in many, many cases. All right, the name begs for this slide. But I'm going to be very brief, and I'm, I'm absolutely not competing with anything or anybody. But what we felt was GProv was, was falling a bit behind. And GProv also has, not always, but has a little bit of a different approach. You, probably want to recompile your code. We don't need that. Um, we use sampling, which I will explain in a minute. Uh, the biggest thing was when I started looking at GProv, what it's like today, I didn't find the support for shared libraries to be good. Uh, Multi-threading was fairly weak. And, and all codes use shared libraries and multi-threading these days. So, so I think that, that was an incentive for us to continue. Um, you can't do a lot of optimization. I don't think there are filters. Uh, no comparison feature, no support for event counters, and we have that. So, again, take it with a bit of grain of salt, but those are some of the things that help us drive the decision. So here's how it works. Here's how the magic works. It's called statistical call stack sampling. We let the program run, and at a certain point, we stop it, and we record whatever we like. Um, then we let go again, and by default, 10 milliseconds later, we stop it again. And that's one of the things you can play with, the sampling granularity. Uh, like in my, in, in my demo example, I found like a little glitch. Like, if the, OK, that could be sampling uh, accuracy kind of thing. Because with sampling, of course, the first thing you need to realize is you can miss something. So like a tiny function that's in between your samples, you won't even see it. So if you have like a three-second job, as I have for my demos, because we all want to go to lunch, then you can easily miss those things. So, that's one of the things to keep in mind. With sampling, you probably want to do some experiments with the sampling rate. And to make it easy, we have like a low and a high and, and some, some, but you can also give, give a number. OK. When you do that, talk with your local statistician, because there's statistical errors when you do sampling. But again, you get that flexibility. So we stop the program. Um, like, of course, we record the program counter, but also the thread and a whole, whole set of things. And at the end of the day, we can give you um, something like this. We can tell you, well, 
first of all, we, we calculate the total. The total is the total for all the metrics that you have specified. I will focus on CPU time, but you can do that for cache misses, instructions executed. Total will accumulate everything. So you have a reference. That's what we generate. That's 100%. And then you see your stuff underneath. Like in this case, apparently we found you out of a run of 18, let's say, seconds. We found you in 10 seconds. We found you in function two. And um, that translates to a certain percentage. That's essentially how it works. It's a bit of a simplification, but that's, that's the idea. With that comes a certain uncertainty. Because if you run the same thing, exactly the same thing, again, those numbers may and probably will be slightly different. But uh, as a performance person, I could always live with that. But it does mean that when you, when you profile a very short job, you could have these kind of artifacts. So, so that's sort of the limitation of the sampling. You, you put the sampling high, rate very high. Uh, and altogether, I find it very useful. But don't be, don't be disturbed when you rerun your script and the numbers are slightly different. Yep, question. In order to work around this, okay. So, in order to work around the, the issue of the, the the slight variations, can you say do ten thousand runs and accumulate all the data and then look at it? You can. You, you can. So we, we, you can aggregate the data, but we don't have any other tool to make your life easier with 10,000 experiments and, and maybe 10,000 stretches limits a little bit. But yeah, you can, you can. You can run the same thing. That may not be a bad idea to filter out like, like an anomaly. Yeah, yeah, you, you can, yeah. All right, okay. Syntax, I said I'm not a compiler person. I'm really bad at describing those things, but our idea was um, every command starts with gprof and g. That automatically makes everything else unique. That, that was the big reason. Uh, some people say it's too long. I, uh, I, don't, I don't know. You, yeah, that's why we have aliases. So, uh, Gprof and G, then you specify what you want to do, and most likely there's some additional qualifiers and, and then options. And just look at the examples. If you want to collect information on your application, Gprof and G, collect app, and then what follows is um, the name of the experiment directory, if you don't like the default, and then you're, you're executable in the way you run your program. That's what you will be seeing me doing in my demo. And then the next step will generate a directory. The next step is the analysis, so you, you call display text, and that will, with that directory name or names, and then you can start doing your analysis. So that's overall the thing. The big thing is it all starts with gprof and g. And again, in the demo, you'll see it. This is what we currently have or almost have. Collect app, that's, that's there. It's, it has quite some options, actually. Um, display text shows you the information on your screen in ASCII format or in a file. Display HTML is fairly new. Um, that generates an HTML structure. And as I'm going to show you, because um, yeah, a little, little kind of side thing. I had recorded all these videos, like, OK, I'll make my life easy. I'm not going to log in on a, on a cloud instance on the other side of the Atlantic. Well, we had sound problems, so I'll have to do it live. And um, for the display HTML, I'm actually going to display the data on my laptop. Okay. It was generated on a server far away. So um, that's the beauty of, I think, HTML, and it allows you to browse through the data a little easier. Then the GUI, which is going to be available soon. I'll say a lot more about that, but that's not yet available. Uh, you can archive an experiment directory. That's one of those little things that can be very useful. Uh, like we'll, we'll copy like, um, the shared libraries you've been using, like glibc, for example. So when things change on your system, you still have that all in your experiment directory. And that, that can be your benefit, because those things could change. And you can, you can choose, like some people get nervous that source code may be there, so you can not archive source code. So fairly flexible tool. Not used very often, but when you need it, it's, it's kind of convenient. We have display source, and this is a call to this community. Um, it's from the old days. When we had the studio compilers, we actually worked with the studio team to let the compiler tell in, not so innocent end users like me, tell what did you do to my code? What did you do? And after the initial emotional hurdle to actually expose that to me, 
it turned out to be very valuable. And that, that gave us a tool as part of the old, uh, old environment that would read the object file, read those messages, interleave it with the source code, and then I could say, oh, you did blocking, that's cool. Oh, how did you do your blocking? Maybe I should file an RFV because I think you should do a better job. So in that way, you could tell the user what was done. And one of the things is eventually we hope that with the GCC community, we can get something like that restored. So display source code is quite thin. It gives you the source and the disassembly. That, that's it. There's no other information. Again, if you're interested in, in working on that, please let me know. We're very, very keen on doing that. Um, before I go into the demos, there's some, one thing I need to explain. That's the difference between inclusive and exclusive metrics. A metric, for those of you not into this world, is anything you want to measure, like CPU time, cache misses, instructions executed. And again, my focus is for this demo is mostly on CPU time, but it could be basically anything that you've measured. With inclusive, we're a certain part of the call tree, and with inclusive, we include everything underneath. And that, that gives you the most expensive path in your code. But then you probably want to know within that path what is the most expensive one. And that's where the exclusive metric comes in, because the exclusive metric leaves out everything else you call. So in that way, you can look at the pure time. Like, OK, this one is not doing anything. It's just a driver for something else that's doing the real work. And here's a simple example. Let's say this is a part of your uh, call tree uh, with somewhere, could be anywhere. So the, the main function takes 10 seconds or whatever, and then you got calling four others, and those are the exclusive times in it. And that would give you the following table. A, A is doing everything. So for A, the, um, the inclusive time is the whole time. The exclusive time is only 10. So um, it's not insignificant, but it's not doing that much. B is a leave routine, not calling anybody else. So that's 20 seconds. And in that way, you go through your list, and we show both by default. And that's another thing I, I should be, um, not forget to say. You can completely customize what we show you. So we made some choices, but you can customize it. So that's the difference between inclusive and exclusive, and both have their value. Although I usually leave out the inclusive because I need space on my screen. OK, demo time. And uh, much to the joy of the audience, uh, we'll, we'll see where it fails. It's a given it will fail. The question is where. All uh, right, let me see. Again, this is our GProf and G headquarters, so if you, um, if you want to help us out and come and join us there, it's a good life. Um, I have um, prepared a little demo, uh, multiplying a matrix with a vector. It's written in C. It's using pthreads for the parallelization. It's a very uh, straightforward, simple program so that my profiles don't get too complicated. So how do you go about this? Well, let me see. Let's first just run the program as usual, and I didn't want to make everything a default, so I'm going to give it a 8,000 by 5,000 matrix to run on. This has been parallelized, so I'm going to use two threads to do it. The program will run for a few seconds, and if all goes well, it will give me an, a message that it, uh, it ex executed successfully. So that's it. So now my question to you would be, where does it spend its time? How do you find out? Well, OK. As I said, you run the program as usual. The network's a little slow, so combined with my typing speed, that's going to be very interesting. OK, so ah, I'm not going to display anything yet. Uh, OK. This is, um, OK, I was saying, this is really cool. Um, collect. OK, so yeah, let's do some overlap. Uh, as you see, I only typed in gprof and gcollect app. I'm completely relying on the defaults here. But it gets you started. And, and anybody ever went through a learning curve, that's so important. It gets you started. And then you, start, you want more and more. That's the next step. So um, uh, I didn't do anything. This is a multi-threaded code. You don't need to do anything. No special libraries, no environment variables. You just run it as usual. And now I have, and that's the, um, the first line, creating experiment directory. And the name is test.1.er and a process idea. I'm not sure why we get the process idea, because that's stored in the experiment. And I never care, but OK. So test.1.er is the default name. If you, we, by default, we don't override uh, experiment 
experiment directories because that could be your precious data. That, so if you would run this again, it will be test.2.er, test.3. And if you don't like it, you can give it a name. And we introduce two options for that because I'm lazy. We used to not overriding an experiment directory can be really annoying because when I know what I'm doing, I just want to blow the old one away because I have a better run. So we have a lowercase o and an uppercase o, and the uppercase o will blow away, and the lowercase o will not overwrite an existing experiment directory. So you can give it any name you like, and I have it in the demo. So now we have this directory. Oh, yeah, my program produces a little CSV file with, with out, output, but um, that doesn't matter here. So that's a, sort of a regular directory. And one of the things on our list that you will see is we, we don't document this directory yet. And we should. We should tell you what's in it, formats, and so forth. Um, it's a bit scary. It's in the head of one person. So um, we, we know that we need to do that. So that's the directory. But it's of interest to gprof and g. So we'll do gprof and g. You know that? And I already typed that in earlier. Display text. OK. And I'm going to, in interest of time, I'm going to uh, not show you what, well, yeah, I will. Who cares? Um, if you do it like this, you'll get into an interpreter. My suspicion is, is that from an idea that was a great idea 20 years ago. But uh, you get into an interactive environment. You can issue commands. Um, it actually starts to get annoying because you can't easily capture output unless you use screen and those kind of things. But you get into an interpreter, I never use it. So I'm going to get out of it as quickly as I can. Um, because what I do is, I, at the command line, I'm going to tell gprof and g what I want to see. Okay. And what I'm going to do, and of course that's the kind of information you need to know, with the functions, I can get the function overview where the time was being spent. And there we are. So when you think about it, I only needed two steps, the collect step and this display. And it already gives me quite a bit of information. First, so let me go through it. First of all, it's telling me what metric to sort. And that's by default the first one that we see, which is in this case exclusive CPU time. You can change that. You can sort by name or whatever. It's one of those things you can do. You can define and redefine the sort metric. Then we give you the exclusive and inclusive uh, times, CPU time, both as a number and as a percentage. And there's that total. total um, the total time here is 12, about 12 seconds. And what we immediately see is 95% out of that is taken by something called MXV underscore core. Now, again, admittedly a very simple example. But with just a few of those steps, it, it works for your application as well. And um, from there, you start drilling, drilling down. So let me, um, let, me, let me make this a little uh, richer. By, oh, another thing, uh, for display reasons, I'm going to use single commands, but you can concatenate them on the command line. You can put it all together. Just make sure you get the order right. So one thing that I want to show you, because that can be really uh, confusing, if you have like a real call, call, call tree structure, it could be very long. So what you're going to, what I always do is I'm going to limit the output to, let's say, like five lines. So give me the top five. One of those little things that just makes your life easier, especially because you've got all these things that don't contribute. Um, and um, that's the limit command. Another one that I, I want to show is now that we know that um, MXV core is important, well, show me the source. It's challenging. OK. Oh, uh, let me see. See if this works. Yep, OK. Doesn't really fit, but uh, what? Um, no, I'm not going to use that pointer. I'm just asking for trouble. Um, like here. What you see is we mark the most expensive statements. And you can define what is expensive with the double hash symbol. So you can search for it in, in a file. And so what this tells us, it echoes, it echoes the source and it interleaves the performance information. That's what it does. And uh, so that's the source and nothing else happening. It, it echoes the metrics that are, that are in effect. Um, for those of you that are very, very sharp, um, there's a bug here. Uh, 
the number, the number shown here. Now let me see if I can play with, play with this. Yeah. Oh, cool. Here, um, you see, it's it's telling me zero percent. That's a lie. I was in contact with Vladimir last night. We'll fix it. <laughs> Turns out that we, just for you, you're all diehard experts, we, we, we lose that information, the total along the way. So we'll have to put it back. And one question I have. Oh, yeah, but you have a question. Yep. So you mentioned earlier that you're sampling the instruction pointer whenever you take a sample. So is it just the IP or you do a stack walk? Uh, a whole walk, yeah. 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 So you, you, you do the, the stack walk? Yeah, yeah, you, you, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we do, do the think? stack and wind, if that's what you yes. mean. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, okay. And uh, so does it require that the application be compiled with frame pointers? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so you require that? Yeah, yes. Okay, very good. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah, we have to get it from somewhere. We can't make it up. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, can you show us how it displays per thread information? Since you yes, talked about multi Yes, that's going to happen. Yep, yep. You must have read my thoughts. That's going to be part of the demo. Yep. Uh, the last thing at this level that I want to show is that you can get to the disassembly. Okay. Um, all right. So now you get the same at the instruction level, including the same 0% bug. Um, I think it was exposed because by default we did not show percentages until very recently, and, and I thought that's, it's all about, most about percentages. We add them and then we see this, so, okay. So, uh, yeah, so you can go down to the instructions and, and find the most expensive instructions. As you all know, most of you being compiler people, it's not always easy to do the trace back of where things really happen. So what I would tell users is, Take this a little bit with a grain of salt. There's something expensive happening in that part, but I'm not sure whether it's exactly that instruction, because you've got out of order ex in in instruction, execution you have, instruction level parallelism, um, but that definitely gives you a good idea where the time is, uh, is spent. So um, let me do a little bit more. I still have time, although I'm not going to talk any second into the lunch break, I promise you. So here's a script, and script is a bit of a fancy word for just a bunch of commands. And, and you can have the hash symbol with, com, um, with the comment line. So you see at line number two, I limit it to five, then I ask for the function overview, and then I'm going to ask how many threads were there. And um, actually, as it turned out, in this case, it's three threads, it's not two. It's a typical POSIX threads uh, setup, there's a main thread. That's how I wrote it. You don't have to do it like that, but I wrote it like a typical, like a driver thread, and then it starts, it offloads the interesting work to two other threads. So uh, there are actually three threads, and that threads command will show that to you. It, the threads command, as simple as it is, is especially useful with multi-threading because it also tells you how many metrics are accumulated in that thread. And as I hope to show later on, there's a great way to find load imbalances, like, hey, wait a minute, why is that thread doing a lot more work than the other one? So very simple but effective command. Then I select, it's a simple example of the filters that we have. I select thread number one, I want to see the function overview, and then two and three, which could be a range. It doesn't have to be a single number. You can say I want to, this kind of set of threads, I want to know who's, where the time is being spent. So that's what this, um, this um, example is going to do. Okay. Okay. And, um, no. Oh. It's really stretching the limits. Yep, okay. Okay, so again, there we go. Dbrof and G, display text. And now I'm going to tell it script and the name of that script. All right. Well, sort of. The latency gods are definitely with me this morning. <laughs> so, 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 I did type it in. I know quite, quite sure. Um, but, yep, yeah. It just, it just needs a little nudging. Okay. So, I'm going to tell it take the commands from my script, which is over there, and take this directory as the input. One thing you can do, you can add 
commands here as well. It doesn't have to be the script only, but remember the order in which they are evaluated, like if you set the limit to a certain thing and then you override it, those kind of things. So there, there is, it's order sensitive, we pick the last one, uh, but in that way you can sort of mix and match. Although in practice I usually put it all in a script. Okay, there we go. Let me show you what we're, what we're looking at. So I, I limited the, the output to to five, so we see that top five again, just seen it before. Um, now here's the output of the threads commands. And that's telling me indeed that I have three threads and it tell, giving me the breakdown and what you see is uh, thread number two and three, they take uh, the bulk of the time and thread number one, it's doing something but not that much. But let's say you're interested in that thread and you wanna know what is it doing them in, those, in that half second. Well, that's, that's when you can start doing the filtering. We tell you that um, this was for experiment number one. We, you selected thread number one out of, out of the three. So it echoes what I was doing. And it's, it's, it's doing a function called init data and calling the random number generator. So it's, it's setting up the data. It's not doing much, but in that way you can, again, uh, zoom in. And uh, likewise for the other two threads, they do the computational work. And um, that's it. One thing that you may notice here and that we're going to fix that as well, you see collector underscore root. That's not your function, that's ours and we should remove it. Could be confusing for the, the use, like where does this come from? So. But overall, this, this will help you in your uh, multi-threaded analysis. Now, I'm going to do one more and with the minimum typing, because I put it all in a script. Okay, let me... Um, let me see if I can use my pointer here again. Yeah, so here um, I have my run script. I'm, I'm just setting up the parameters for my job, the 8,000 by 5,000 uh, matrix, two threads. Here I'm going to give the hardware, uh, the experiment a, a specific name, HWC, hardware counter. Uh, I usually include the number of threads that I was using and, uh, and the dot .er. But by the way, dot .er, for a long time I thought that stood for error, but it means experiment recording, so. Um, so we have the collect app here with, uh, I, here's where I set the uh, dash p high um, because I, I found I needed that. I needed to have the very fine grained sampling. Dash h auto, is, I should explain. Uh, we, dash h will give you access to hardware event counters like cycles, instructions, executed cache misses. Uh, we try to make a choice on a, any processor that we support. Again, just to make initial life easier, like okay. It's just a choice and I'm relying on that. Otherwise you can specify the individual names uh, in all gory detail as, as you want. If you uh, want to know those names, you just type in the command with dash H and it shows you the list of everything that we uh, support. The rest is like the same thing, just executing the code. And then immediately after that, I call display text with another script. And let me show you that script as well. Okay, yep, I typed in two, I know I did, yes. So um, that's the kind of thing where I'm just going to, let me see, I probably should use this a little bit. Here, something different. Here you see the example of the sort command. Sort E dot total CPU. E means I want to look at the exclusive time. Dot means I want to see the value. Um, you can also do like dot percentage, you get the value and the, and the percentage, so you have some choice. So I only want to look at the raw numbers here of the total CPU time. Then I'm going to redefine the metrics, and just for the fun of it, I, I thought, you know what, I'll just start with the name. Uh, some people like that, you first see the name and then you, you see the metrics. So I'll start with the name, then I want to see, and has, here's the... Um, E dot percentage total CPU, so I do want to see the percentage here. Uh, I want, to, another thing we, we, we do, whoever has been using event counters, you know they can, as beautiful as they are, can drive you crazy, because they're different on every platform and that makes your script non-portable. So you would have to script for every single platform to do those counters. We have a symbolic uh, uh, metric HWC, so that will just grab all the events that you have monitored, whatever it was. So that's what I'm using here. And uh, I know that instructions and cycles are included. When instructions and cycles are included, we can calculate the IPC and CPI. 
So they're calculated by default for you, and then here I'm going to ask for them. And then I'm doing the same thread selection because I want to see how these different threads behave. So that's, the, um, that's going to be the, um, the command, and that is all included in this run script. Okay. And that's going to end the typing for me. So again, creating experiment directory. Note that it just takes a little bit longer because I have the sampling too high. There, there is a price to pay. Yeah, it, it will take a little bit longer. So now we get similar tables, but now with, with all these hardware counters included. So you can see, uh, you can see it at the top. The, uh, the, the, we still measure the program. We still do the program counter sampling as well, which you can disable if you, if you want to. Um, and you see instructions executed, uh, last level cache misses, LLM. So you can look at the cache behavior and you see that, um, actually, uh, no surprise, but um, in, that, in that first thread in a day, that takes 84% of the cache misses. And the IPC value is not that bad. This machine has a value of four. So um, overall, not so bad. But, and same for the threads. And you can see that they pretty much behave the same as they should. This is a sanity check. So that's, I think, about for the demo part. I'm not done yet. <laughs> I still have a little bit of time. Any questions about that? Yeah. Yep. Hello. Uh, so, as someone else already said, it's, the application doesn't need to be recompiled. Uh, if you compile it with the right options from the beginning, this is my understanding, mm -hmm. which is also true for other profilers. Uh, my question is, what's, how is this different from uh, other profilers that we have on market? Solaris, Intel one, I don't know, Perf. What's, this one does what this one does special, or how is this one better than? I don't think Why should I use this, it? I don't think at this level it's better. I mean, there's no notion of better. We collect the information. I don't know all the details of that. And we do need to have information. We need to have mapping information because we need to map it back to like your source instructions. I don't think you can really say better uh, at that level. But um, yeah, we, we definitely talk in the break about it more, and I can get you in touch with Vladimir, who, who knows all that stuff in his dream. So yeah. OK, thank yeah. you. Yeah. Um, in your little scripting language, can you iterate? If you don't know how many threads there are, can you say for thread 1 to thread n, do this? Yeah, you caught, you caught me with my marketing hat on. Um, how do I know there are three threads? Because I use the threads command first. Yes, it's one of those things. Yes, I would like to see that a little bit more flexible, like a symbolic value. So, but we don't have any loop structure or something like that. But yeah, ideally, you would, you would want to do that. Or, or write some preprocessor to get it out. But yeah, you don't know. You don't know. Yeah, yeah. OK, I'll, I'll go back to the, back to the slides. Oh, one, what's one quick question. Uh, you mentioned that you need to compile with a hard frame pointer. Uh -huh. Would it actually be possible to collect the same information using Dwarf Unwind Do if you compile with frame tables I'm and then use I the Dwarf to figure out the frames? I, I, I can't answer that. I'm sorry. But we will get you an answer if we get in touch with me. Yeah. That's too, too close to the, um, to the implementation for me to, to know. I think there's a. I, uh, you said that you don't need to recompile, but I understand that if you want to see the source code and I, for example, forgot to compile with minus g, I do need to recompile, right? Okay, uh, that's not a big deal, but you also said that it only supports C, C, Scala, and Java. Uh, for C and C, should I assume that actually anything that natively compiles, let's say, D, I can still use your tool if I don't care about the source, do I? Yes, you can. You can. Okay. I've, 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 like one day, this is a little anecdote, we should stop the recording. I was at a bank 
and the manager there insisted we use our tool to analyze their application and they had no source code, no nothing, but we could already say something about it. And basically it was talk to your software vendor, you've got an issue there. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, about scalability, uh, do you use uh, global per process data structures to do your counter aggregation or is it per, pro uh, per processor or per thread? It's per thread, it's per thread. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's multi threading happening here, yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Okay. Well, if there's other questions about anything, usually my latency is measured more in in hours than in minutes. Days later, I realize what I should have asked. So, I'll be around this afternoon. So, feel free to uh, to grab me. Let me see if I can. Yeah. Okay. So that's where. Um, let me see. This is where we. Um, this was the demo time again. Um, I'll, I'll have something else to, uh, actually I was, no, I, I have something else to demo in, in a short one. Um, scripting, you've seen it. Uh, comparison of profiles. Um, we do that at different levels. Um, you can go down to the disassembly and we show you the basic blocks and how they, how they compare. So there's no real limit on how many experiments you compare, but for us to comprehend it, you probably want to do just a few, but if you want to write a tool, you can do that. You can write a tool around it and do your automated analysis. So there's no real limitation on that. Uh, we have that in text mode and uh, in the GUI. The GUI I have, will show at the end, and um, that will give you a color-coded view of the runtime behavior. But again, that'll be, um, that'll be for, the, for, the, for the last part. I want to elaborate a little bit on the comparison of profiles because that's really, I think that's really valuable. Uh, here I do two almost identical performance experiments. Uh, I use the dash H LLM, that means I am asking just for last level cache misses. But I want to compare a single threaded run and a two threaded run. I see some issue and, and I want to see what's happening at the cache level. So I generate the, um, the information as shown here. And I'm going to show you two ways how to do the comparison. I wrote a script. In that script, we have the limit five, so it fits on the screen. Uh, I'm only interested at this point, I'm only interested in the cache misses, so I restrict the metrics to the name of the function and the exclusive last level cache misses. And I enable the comparison and I ask for the functions. If you don't enable the comparison, we aggregate the data. Okay, oops. Oops, that was too quick. And there you are. So now you have the side-by-side -side comparison. And um, you're very kind. Or maybe you've lost. Um, it's hard to see anything in those numbers because they're so big with, with event counters. Like I'm always kind of counting how many digits do you have. So what we have, we have a different way same, same, uh, same data, but now I say compare, but I want to show the ratios. And that gives you a lot more insight very quickly, because what we do, we, we divide the current value by the reference. The reference is the first column. So you can immediately see whether you have more or less cache misses. We also have a delta. Uh, so by just looking at the sign, you can see, hey, this one is higher or lower. For, for CPU time, that can be very useful. If you're looking for a regression and you see a big minus somewhere or plus, you know, you know where to start looking. So with that, you can, you can use the comparison feature. And, and again, I, I can't stress how, how useful this is, I think. Okay. Well, last uh, live demo, display HTML. And let me go back to the, yeah, let me get rid of this one. Let me go back to my um, screen here. And let me see, is this visible? Yeah. So it's a very, on the outside, it's a very simple tool. It has some options, but okay. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take an experiment directory or multiple directories as the input. So I have my, uh, still have, should have my test.1.er. Okay. And there it goes. It'll do the work. And um, uh, it will print a one line so your, your screen is not cluttered. Uh, and it will tell you that index file, that's the one to start your browsing from. And if you don't like this, I, I really try to please every, everyone. You can even get rid of this message if you want. So it's totally silent. If you're more like uh, curious, just for the fun of it, 
there's a verbose option. Not sure what it does other than just me entertaining. Um, verbose on. It will show you exactly what's sort of what's happening. And, um, and there's a directory um, generated, again, a default name. Um, see, oh yeah, of course I executed it twice, but. So it has all the files generated. They're all ASCII files if you want to look at it. They're a little bit more than strictly necessary. That's still part of the cleanup that we're doing, but it's all there. And um, to show you what happens next, and this is where I, I try to defeat Murphy. I loaded, I did an experiment a little earlier this morning and loaded it on my laptop. So now we're looking at the experiment in my, uh, on my laptop because uh, doing this over this line interactively on the other side of the Atlantic is really challenging the limit. So now you can start browsing and it should be meant to be reasonably self-explanatory. Um, we, we give you some basic statistics just as a sanity check, including the date, it wouldn't be the first time that I was looking at stale data, like, oh, that was an old experiment directory. So all help to help you to hopefully uh, avoid making mistakes. So it gives you some first uh, global statistics. Um, you can go into the experiment details, give you some more information. If you have multiple experiments, you'll see it for each experiment here, uh, give, give you some statistics. Uh, I put in a return to main view so you can quickly go back to the main view. Uh, warnings, if you see warnings and zero, means there were no warnings. Um, if you see a non-zero number, you probably want to look at them because there may have been something found that is not okay. Like uh, the other day I was running a test case and I could not find the mapping. Not sure where that happened, but it can also happen that um, there, there are multiple paths to the same function. So there, there could be some things that we feel like, oh, maybe we should warn you. You can ignore them, they're just warnings. Um, but um, yeah, they're, they're there. Warning zero is good. So we go to the function view, and this is a really simple example, but you see similar function view, but now you have the hyperlinks to start clicking on, on whatever you see. So we know that MXV core, you click on the source, and you get the source code, and again, we do the highlighting. Another, this, this tool has another feature because you can also define what's close to this. Because maybe I'm not interested in, um, in not only in 90%, but maybe 85% is interesting too. So you can define that, otherwise you get some default. Here it's also simple that you, you can't really uh, demonstrate that. But, so that's, and we have the same for the disassembly. You go through the disassembly, uh, we're trying to give some structure in the disassembly to identify basic blocks. You can, you can jump to a branch, um, so the branch targets. Um, so you can navigate through, uh, through a more complex uh, code. Here it's, here it's quite, quite simple. Another feature that I didn't mention, this is in, in the, in the um, display text as well, the caller collie. Caller collie is, is like some sort of flavor of a call tree. We have a call tree function. But this will break down the paths you have. So you can see the path to a certain function and how much time it took. Idea is again, if you have a large application and you have one path you want to zoom in, this is a little easier. But uh, there will, hopefully in the future, there will be a call tree function here as well. I just didn't have time yet. So uh, that's the, what I wanted to show about the display HTML because I'm, I'm running short now on time. And uh, unless the Questions about that? Yep. Okay, so uh, when it comes to profiling, I'm the only user of, of Perf tool. And the obvious question is why did you um, introduce a new tool? Because the Perf is I don't know, well established, known by community, and provides most of the features which you, which you showed. So the question is, why do we need um, yet another tool which is probably not major enough or needs more investment right. when it comes to time? Right. So, so the question is, why? Why? That's the most common, commonly asked question. Um, and as a, uh, as, a, as a user, my answer would be, I don't care. The more tools I have to help me with my performance analysis, the better. And I do think Perf is a wonderful tool. We have a slightly different angle with the way we present data and the way we approach it, but both can completely coexist. I don't see anything, anything wrong. I think, for example, 
perf is much stronger currently in hardware event counters. That's our area where we think, ah, well, we could do better. I think uh, perf has, has wonderful features for that. So again, as a performance analysis person, I would like to use both. And of course, then the next question probably, well, should you merge it? We'll see, you know, you, you don't want to have a big monolithic thing and you just, as you zoom in on what you think is of interest. So yeah, I don't, I don't see any, any sort of risk there, yeah. Um, and also that it, it is related to this, it is not by chance that we got Gprof and G in Binutils because um, it is similar to Perf, I mean it does similar things, it works in a very similar way, it is sample based, sampling based and was not, but um, since we are in the tool chain, we are integrated, sort of integrated in the tool chain, that means that we are always <coughs> open to work very closely with the rest of the tool chain, like for example, even including someday maybe instrumentalization, right, whatever, and uh, we think that could be useful, rather than with a separated tool, a separate project that may have different goals and so on, like Perf. I think there's another question. Yes, uh, could you explain the operating system dependency? Let's say I want to run that on the RTEMS, for instance, the lightweight RTOS uh -huh. on one hand, and, and then what are the steps to port that to another IZ? Yeah, we, it, that's actually on my future directions. We, we really need to make it easier for people to port to other platforms. Yeah, yeah, the, that's, that's currently, I got too much is in the head and not enough is on paper, yeah. So uh, we're definitely interested in working with people but we should make it easier, easier accessible and not just have to ping us, but yeah, yeah. Okay, um, unless, oh. Wait, wait, okay. Yeah. Yeah, this is not a question to a root. This is a, yeah, answer to your question. Yeah, so I think this tool, yeah, actually I'm, a, I'm using this tool for a long time. I'm used to the, in the studio compiler team. So use this tool uh, to debug a lot of performance regression because it's um, it's uh, cooperate with the compiler with very well. So you first you can <laughs> you can find the, the which routine yeah uh, has issue with this tool, and then uh, the hardware counter can tell you uh, what kind of potential. Uh, promo, uh, performance issue might be, then you can look at the uh, optimization information. So the compiler, uh, the use, use to the studio compiler can report the uh, optimization uh, information, what kind of op optimization applied on which function, then you can connect all those information together and locate the uh, root cause of the performance issue. I think it's very useful. Uh, yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Let me move on. Uh, I'll be around in the in the lunch break. I just want to make sure that we do have a lunch, uh, <laughs> not be at the end of a very long line. Um, let me quickly wrap it up uh, about future directions. Some ideas that we have. We really want to get people started. We really want to make people use it. Um, and and if if possible, help them analyze performance because that will help us what to do. Regarding development, the user guide is, is, has already fallen behind. That really needs to be updated. We want to set up a website with downloads, more information, FAQ. So really to get people started, get the information in the hands of people. Uh, we also want to make RPMs available. There's already one for, for, for Fedora, for x86 and, uh, and ARM, so really great. And um, as, as was asked, we, we need to get our act together to help people port this to other platforms. And the GUI, the GUI is going to be a Savannah project. Well, a GNU package, actually. Yeah, yeah. yes, it's yes. Now because we did not feel that a Java GUI as good as this is, you know, it would fit very well in the room, so we are making it a separated GNU uh, uh, package. Yeah, yeah. So, but, process now evaluation. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Jose. Yeah. 
Um, again, um, well, the, the wish list, I actually, there's so, so many things. Um, more recent support, we have fallen behind and we don't support all the latest processors, even on our list. I'd like to see more metrics with the call stack sampling. Uh, we want to have a client server approach so that you can do your remote analysis. Uh, one big thing is we want to attach to a running process. We can do that today, but not in a meaningful way because we can only capture the main thread. So um, that's probably where the G GDB people may be able to help us out because I think they have something similar. Um, we want to expand on the display HTML, the porting guide, uh, maybe you can do something with auto FDO. There's so many things uh, that we want to do. Um, I want to quickly in the last minus one minute that I have show you the GUI. Just it's on the way to you. It's, this is, I'm using our current uh, code base. Uh, I'll show you the only, pretty much only the timeline. The timeline shows the color-coded behavior. So this works even if you didn't compile dash G. We just need the function overview. Just need to have the functions. And what you see, the top line is the operating system state. And uh, when you click on that, you'll see the different states. There are green is good news. Uh, any other color usually means the operating system is doing something uh, like a page fault or some other service. Um, and that could be a reason for concern if you see big other color there. Then you see the application views and every color-coded call stack. So every, every function get a, uh, gets a, a different color and we just line them up and we plot them. Uh, so in that way you can see the dynamic behavior on a per thread basis. This is also where you can start zooming in and uh, do the filtering. If you select a point in time, then it'll give you the call stack there and some information. So that's what we call the timeline, and you get the information for whatever thread you, uh, you happen to select. Um, I have a little example, just very quick. It's a graph analysis code written in C, goldmine for people into OpenMP because it's about as bad as it can get in terms of writing OpenMP. So great tuning opportunity. Um, there are three phases in the program. You will see generate the graph, and then it's a breadth-first search. So you do the search and then verify it's three, and you do that for 64 different uh, randomly selected keys, and that makes the benchmark. Um, so that's, that's what I'm saying that because what you see here is the run on one thread, two, and four, because this program doesn't scale almost at all. So what you do, you run your experiments, you, look, you just visually look at it, and you see that on four threads, I hardly have any gain anymore. Time is from left to right. The four threaded run is about the same time as the two threaded run. And you see that, for example, the initial phase doesn't, doesn't scale anymore. So it's a really bad example of scaling. And um, okay, let's zoom in on the profile for four threads. The main window will give you the big statistics. The idea is that we, we mark some red, like uh, this looks high. Maybe you should, should look into that. That's the idea. So you see the, the overall metrics. So your first sort of dashboard, oops, sorry. You look at the functions, and this is even, even I can't read it from here, but it, it's saying, telling me two functions spend all of the time. 80% of the CPU time is spent on those, and 94% in the last level cache misses. You're actually lucky when that's your profile instead of flat profile. So we look at that, and one thing that I always do is I do the color coding with this tool. Remember, the call stacks are color coded, but I don't want that. I grade them all out with the color chooser, I grade them all out, and then I give certain functions, the one taking most of the time, a specific color, so I immediately see they don't matter in the initial phase. They don't, they don't appear in the beginning, so they're actually part of that process of the, of the, of the BFS search and the verification. So, and um, in that way, I can just eliminate a whole part of my timeline, like I don't care, there's nothing happening that I care about. I, I use that thread overview, and what you see here is that there's a difference between the fastest thread and the slowest thread. And it may seem small, but in parallel computing, because we have this thing called Amdahl's law, it's not a good thing. So even a small difference is not good. So we see a load, literally see a load balance. One thread takes 80 seconds, the other one 73. Uh, that's not a good situation. You zoom in, and now, now it starts to get interesting, because what you see is, is that there are gaps in the execution. Threads are not doing something for whatever reason, and that's really bad news in parallel computing. The other thing you immediately learn, it's always in that red function. That's where my bottleneck is. And that's also where my last slide is. I'll skip this one, it's just saying the same thing. 
We've had a lot of Q and some A. If there's anything else you want to do before we go to lunch, go ahead. Otherwise, catch me in the hallway. And thank you for your time and patience. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I have just a very short uh, organizational announcement. Uh, we are going to, can you, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, we are going to have a dinner on the boat. Uh, the address which was sent in the original email was wrong. There is a new address, so go to the new place. And I
Hi, everyone. Is that working? Great. Hello? A what, sorry? Yep. Would you like to start? Yeah, uh, can they hear me okay? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah, let's go. <laughs> Is everything streaming? Yeah, they can see us on YouTube. Oh, can they? Yeah. Now, yeah, now we are starting. I've started the recording, so we can start. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's really nice to be here. <laughs> it's surprising to see so many people here to see our talk. Uh, we've been traveling all over the world is what it feels like recently because we were in Kangrios for Spain. Um, so that was pretty fun. And then we're in Dublin and now we're here all together, which is pretty nice. And it's actually really nice to meet most of our contributors have actually come here as well. So it's the first time meeting in person like a lot of our contributors. So we're here to talk to you about what we've been working on for the last couple of years, or adding Rust to GCC as a proper front end. So my name's Philip. So my name's Arthur. And I'm David, and I somehow managed to convince my employer to let me work a little bit on this project. So that's <laughs> yeah. <why I'm> <laughs> yeah, so um, we want to just sort of talk to you in general a little bit about the compiler. Um, we want to talk to you a little bit about some of the technical parts of it, just because it's been a, it's been a tough challenge. Um, there's, our front end is a little bit different to other front ends. Um, we have multiple IRs. Um, you know, there's a lot of different things going on in there. Um, so we want to talk to you a little bit about some of the technical things going on there, some of the challenges, and some of the stuff that we need to do over time. Um, so hopefully it's will be of interest to you guys. Um, I think there's, uh, is there going to be a really good audience to really get into the guts of this. So yeah, what is um, Rust GCC? Um, well, it's a full implementation of Rust on the GNU tool chain. It's, um, I started this in 2014, um, and I was, I, it was a tough project because Rust wasn't fully released yet. Uh, it was changing almost every day. So that was around not, Rust 0.7. They, it was mostly, uh, from my perspective, it looked a lot like uh, a copy and paste of Go with different syntax at the time. And then they decided to get rid of the garbage collector a month later. And then that changed. And then they added new things a month after that. And I tried to keep up, and I just couldn't. Um, so I decided, right, I just have to leave this. This is changing far too much for me. Uh, and so eventually, over time, people kept asking me about this on GitHub, like, are you going to restart the project? Or is, uh, people are interested in this. And so in 2019, I started the project again. And so since then, Rust has got fairly stable. Since uh, the 2015 edition of Rust, it's mostly stable. There uh, depends on your perspective there. We'll maybe talk about that later. But um, it's a lot more stable for what using for everyday projects. Um, so at the moment, you know, we've got two full-time engineers at the moment. So that's me and Arthur. So thanks to Brad and Jeremy for supporting us for this long time. Um, and so we've actually made quite a lot of progress this last two years. Um, so like motivations. Um, so we would like to eventually be upstream in GC, which would be pretty fun. Um, we are also reusing the full GNU tool chain. We're not like um, reinventing the wheel here. You know, this is going to work just like how you would invoke any other GC compiler. Um, you know, we want to get the full shared features that you would expect out of this. So that means getting um, like we also get the analyzer support, which was actually pretty cool recently. We got to see that working. <laughs> we get you know LTO and hopefully all these other fancy things for free. I really really like how. The abstractions work in GCC. You know, the front end is properly abstracted. You get things um, as you would expect um, without having to reinvent the wheel. And so there's a lot of different things you can do there. Um, I kind of think an interesting use case of this project would be the front end has been designed that hopefully, in theory, it should be fairly easy to backport it to older versions of GCC for those who would be interested in that, which I think is a pretty cool use case. Um, and so, yeah, we've got a, a full list of generally pretty frequently asked questions about us. So uh, that link there is pretty useful. And hopefully, we can share the slides after this. Uh, and hopefully, that will be useful. <laughs> so current status. Um, when I started this project, um, basically, there was a parser. And there was bits and pieces that sort of strewn like a really basic type inferencing together. But um, as this has been my best attempt to try and pull together like how do we actually track progress in this? How do we actually get to something that works? Uh, and so starting out, like we had a parser, but then we had to like think, well, what do we do next? Uh, well, data structures, like can we actually type some variables? Can we do some type checking in that? Can we define a function? That's what that was all about, really, really basic stuff. But obviously, that's the core thing. 
Control flow one was always like, oh, can we call a function? Can we have some if statements, you know, and driving all that together? Um, but the two really awkward ones are generics and traits. Generics and traits are very, very complex in Rust, and there'll be a, I'll touch a little bit on that and, and to show you why it is complicated. Um, but basically, you can't do anything in Rust without traits and generics. It's, it's just so intrinsic to the actual language. Um, Pattern matching is something David's been working on um, quite a lot, which is also really tough. So match expression in Rust is, you could argue it's synonymous with a switch expression, but really not. It's, it, can, it can match anything. You can do a match on an algebraic data type and then specify all the cases that you would expect, which means a lot of destructuring. It's pretty complicated. Um, Arthur completed all our macro expansion and config expansion, so that was pretty impressive. It's really cool. That's one of the coolest features, I think, in Rust is pattern matching on macros. Um, const generics is what we're working through at the moment. It's maybe not the best title for this milestone, but const generics I don't think is fully supported in Rust yet, um, but there's basic cases there, and the idea behind const generics is always like, oh, if I define a structure and I give it a const a generic parameter and I could specify the capacity of an array type in there, which is pretty powerful actually in a lot of cases, um, so what we're doing there is we don't necessarily need it yet, but we're trying to get ahead, so we'll talk more about that later as well. <clears throat> One of the things we're focused on is intrinsics and built-in, so there's an awful lot of built-in macros. Uh, I can't remember the number off the top of my head. I counted the other day. There's, there's an awful lot of built-ins in, in 240 general. 240 yeah. total. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> and they're not just like a simple, oh, I'm calling built-in sign. You know, it, a lot of these require extra work and stuff around it to get it right. Um, and obviously, pattern, uh, borrow checking is something that's at the very end. We don't really have a uh, date on that, but you don't actually need borrow checker to generate valid Rust code. It doesn't actually require that. So. It's something we're not totally worried about right yet, but we're trying to get on top of that, and Arthur will be talking about that later. Um, so yeah, current status, as I said, working through constant generics to try and get ahead. We're working through bugs, working through intrinsics. You're working on borrow checking. And uh, we're also working quite a lot on the test suite. Uh, we've got a quite an interesting automation setup for trying to get good testing done, um, and we'll talk about that later as well. But the, the absolute major thing is libcore. I don't think people fully understand libcore very well in Rust because you actually can't, you can't add numbers without libcore. You can't do for loops without libcore. You can't do anything without it. Most compilers would generally implement these things as built-ins, like into the compiler. But in Rust, they've actually decided to make all of that sort of stuff part of a library that you compile with lots of little fancy markers to say, oh, this is a language item. This is something the compiler has to find and do something special with. Um, so there's quite a lot of that stuff. And until you can compile libcore, you can't do anything. <laughs> and so, yeah, that's what we're so focused on. But in theory, once libcore works, everything opens up. And we're in a really, 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 really good spot. So that's what we're, our whole goal is. So yeah, we want to talk a little bit about how the compiler works. Um, I thought it might be interesting, given we're going through like a uh, patch review process for upstream GCC, and, and people might find it interesting. So in our compiler, you know, there's quite a lot of different stages we go through. Um, so the first thing, obviously, oh, we have our lecture and our parser. That's pretty familiar to most people. So then we have like a full C++ hierarchy of an AST, which is kind of cool. You know, uh, generally in other GC front ends, they'll reuse the trees and add their own tree codes. But we have a nice like AST structure, which is pretty powerful. Um, and then the thing that happens after that is um, expansion. So unlike C++ or C, you would have a preprocessor stage, which will do the whole macro expansion. In Rust, it doesn't work like that. You actually need to do a little bit of name resolution, and then you do macro expansion um, as part of that pipeline. Um, because I can't remember the full re reasons why I've top of my head right now, but there's reasons for it. <laughs> um, and once that's done, it's, we go into name resolution, and Rust C calls it name resolution late, which uh, it doesn't matter why, but it's, that's what it's called. And that means, all right, we're trying to find, oh, this variable references this variable declared here, and stuff like that, you know, sort of usual stuff you would see. But the interesting thing in our front end is that we actually have two uh, intermediate representations before we get to GCC tree. So we have AST and something called HIR which is high-level IR, <laughs> imaginatively. Um, and so we lower the AST down to this, and that gives us a chance to like, de-sugar 
So that means we have like a distinction in the AST. Oh, we have methods, we have functions. Well, they're just functions. We get rid of that. We get rid of macros. They don't exist at this point in time because we've already expanded. And a whole list of other things that we do. So there's also if let expressions is something we need to do. And if let expressions can just be desugared into a, like an if statement and a match expression, if you know what I mean. So they don't necessarily need to have like an AST version of that. So we get a lot of helpful things about having another IR. Um, type checking is the awkward one. There's an awful lot goes into type checking, as we'll sort of talk about later. It's so obviously a lot of linting and different verifications there, like, oh, unused variables, all the usual sort of stuff, privacy, unsafe, all that sort of stuff. And then eventually, at the end of that, then we hand off to the GC middle end and actually make the full trees at that point on. So that's high level overview. Um, and yeah, as I said, oh, yeah, <laughs> front end representations, as I said, um, yeah. We don't actually use any custom trees in GC at the moment, but uh, we are toying with implementing uh, two of them, which might be the, um, implementing a match expression. Uh, at the moment, we're lowering everything to a switch expression, which, as I said earlier, is sort of synonymous. But um, hopefully, I'm tempted to potentially steal more of the C++ front end code and steal their Lambda expression, because it's, it's pretty close to how a lot of the Rust um, Lambda's work as well. There's some slight changes there, but I'm hoping I could reuse some of that, which would help a lot at the moment. Um, and so, yeah, I'm going to hand over to Arthur. Just let him talk about how cool macros are. Yep. Thank you. So, yeah, I thought we'd talk a bit about macros <coughs> in Rust because you have them, as Philip said, and there are also macros in C and C++, but they differ quite a lot. And I thought I'd let you know a little bit about how they're cool, how they're complex, and how we have to shed tears and blood to implement them in GCRS. <laughs> so the first thing that you'll notice when you look at the Rust macro is that the arguments are typed. So we have to validate that at the compiler level to make sure that, oh, well, the macro expected an expression. We gave it an expression. The macro expected a statement. The macro expected a literal. The macro expected a visibility modifier. And that's a lot of rules that we have to check to make sure that the macro actually expands to what the user expected. Secondly, uh, macros, unlike C or C++ macros, are allowed to have repetitions and recursion. So for anyone who's tried to write like a recursive macro in C or something like a max macro that would take any number of arguments, you're going to see why this is useful in a minute. And this is very cool, but this is also very mathematical and very abstract. And it requires, it requires a lot of stuff that's way above our pay grade, but that we managed to make work. <laughs> For example, they look a bit like regular expression. So you find the clean operators, like the clean star, the, the question mark, the plus sign, which means you can get uh, any number of argument, zero or one amount of that, one or many amount of whatever. And because these macros are so complex and that the rest people are trying to make them backward compatible and forward compatible, there is actually a set of restrictions based on the type of the arguments that I mentioned before. And so that's called the follow set ambiguity restriction. And it is very scary, as scary as it sounds, and it's hard to implement in GCC. And we did need to do that. So we're going to see a little bit about that. So for example, this is just a recursive add macro, which takes any number of <laughs> arguments and does the addition of that. If you try and do that, do that in C, you're going to know that you have to do your add underscore 9, <laughs> add underscore 8, <laughs> add underscore 7, and it gets annoying really fast. Here, we have a terminal condition, which is the first branch. Basically, when you give it one expression, it just returns that expression. When you give it one or more expression, which is the second branch, and you can see the, the repetition being marked highlighted in green because it's hard to see otherwise. It's simply going to create an addition between the first expression and the addition of the remaining expressions. And that looks like garbage. I completely agree. It's really hard to understand. <laughs> it's even harder to parse. Uh, it's harder to validate. But that makes it really, really powerful. And if you look at the last line, you can see that we can pass it a literal, like a row number. We can pass it another macro invocation. We can pass it a function call, a variable, another addition. And all of that works beautifully. This is a macro that creates like any number of tuples. And what happens is that the first repetition group uh, is called E. The second one is called F. It's going to create 
many tuples of the various little bits given to the invocation. And what I'd like to highlight in that slide is that we have to perform a validation for the repetition level. So for example, in that second invocation, uh, we call the tuple matron macro with a different number of arguments. So for E, you would get three literals, and for F, you only get two literals. And that's actually a problem because then one tuple would be missing an argument. So we have to perform these sorts of checking that the, the meta variables are actually repeating the same amount. We have to perform a lot of validation to make sure that even in recursive macro calls, this is valid and this doesn't incur sec faults or you know, weird behaviors that we've had to deal with. Uh, finally, this is just to show the uh, follow set ambiguity restriction. So because we want to make sure that a macro is going to stay forward compatible even if the, languages, even if the language changes, uh, some tokens are forbidden after specific types of certain arguments. So for example, after an expression uh, argument, you basically can't put anything other than a comma or a semicolon. And the interesting part here is that if you look at the second match uh, with all the repetitions, because these repetitions are zeroable, so for example, the, the one with written two under it, uh, it's got the question mark, which means zero or one, so it can be zero. The, the third one, uh, it's got the clean star, which means zero or many, so it can be zero. The final one, clean star again, so it can be zero. And because all of those matches can be zero, we have to make sure that the tokens afterwards are also allowed after the expression fragment, which is the first one. That gets really annoying really fast, <laughs> and we have to do a whole bunch of stuff in the compiler to make sure that this works and that we actually are as restrictive as Rust in that regard. This is um, just a, <laughs> a final slide to show you how cool Rust macros are. So because they're that powerful and because they have that many stuff allowed in them, you can make really cool DSLs in Rust macros. <laughs> <laughs> For example, the first one is to just declare your C function inside Rust code, but using C syntax. And we can match on that and expand that to proper Rust types and mark them as extra functions. The second one, for example, would be a nice way to interact with libpoke.so. <laughs> and because we, have, like, because we can make DSLs, very complex DSLs, we can actually do that in Rust, and we have to support that in GCC as well. So. <laughs> yeah. That's how cool Rust macros are. <laughs> yep. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. That's me. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, thanks, Rush, for showing us all that. It's, it's actually really cool to get macros working because all of a sudden we are able to expand the version of libcore, uh, which is actually a really big milestone for us very recently, which is really cool. Um, and definitely macros is one of the coolest um, parts of Rust for me. I don't think it gets enough attention uh, in general. It definitely shows that Rust is just a multitude of languages in one language, and that we have to implement all of them, which is <laughs> a little bit annoying. <laughs> yeah, um, so I wanted to just sort of give a brief overview of some of the bits and pieces that are interesting in the type system, um, and why I think actually having these multiple layers of IR are actually interesting, and some of the rules I don't think a lot of people are that aware of in Rust. Um, coercion sites and auto deref, I think, are, in my opinion, pretty poorly documented from the Rust side. Um, the only way to actually figure this stuff out is actually to go in the Rust C compiler at this point in time, which is which isn't great. But it's we put I put an awful lot of time into this this year, especially to get these rules, what I think are as close as I can right now. Until I'm hoping um, more specification work will help here. Um, so I think. Uh, I want to give a brief overview of like how some of the type referencing works and as well as uh, has the start there, um, just to give you an idea. But the, the type system has to handle an awful lot of things. Not only is it doing type referencing, there's also a Rust allows shadowing of names, which I don't know, I'm not a huge fan of name shadowing. Um, but I think it makes code look cleaner for Rust specifically. So I think it works for Rust, but not for any other language. Um, so there's an awful lot of little things they mentioned there. Um, it has to handle lang items and also there's all, all the sort of things happening here. The type system also has to do method resolution, which is one of the biggest parts of it, as well as trait resolving. But yeah. 
In Rust, there's a bunch of built-in um, types. Oh. oh, sorry. It's on. OK, so <coughs> you call that here in uh, the high-level instruction. High-level IR. IR, yeah. And I know I got a bit confused when trying to hack on this, because you uh, seem to model this like the the Rust uh, way, but it isn't because that uh, that part of Rust isn't specified. That's yeah. So, like, so how, how close do you try to keep to the representation that Rust mm. uses for its high level? Um, well, I'm using it as a guideline is about the best answer I'm going to give you there. So um, it's, it's helped me figure out there's different cases where I could desugar more. So the way this started out was I had, I, when I first implemented this compiler back in 2014, I tried to do it the very GCC way. I tried to just make an AST out of the trees and stuff like that. Um, and, but then actually what I realized was having this uh, HIR, I was able to look at the Rust-C reference and find the cases where, oh wait, they no longer give a care about functions and methods, all right, I'm gonna copy that. Then I think it sort of followed from there. We're not quite the same, like we still call it an extern block, but they call it foreign language items at that level. So I think the names aren't quite right. Um, I don't know how close we wanna get it exactly. Yeah, um, I don't have a good answer there, but I think it's, I'm using it as a guideline is the best answer I'm giving you there. Yeah. So, because it helps us figure out, well, we might be doing something wrong, we might be missing something. So, yeah, hopefully that answers it. Yes. <coughs> so, in Rust, um, there's a bunch of different, like, built-in types. Um, these, these, are all, these are the list of them. So, you can have inference variables. Um, inference variables can be general inference variables, or they can be integer inference variables, or floating in point inference variables. Also, there's this special one underneath, which is called the never type which I'm going to show you an interesting example of that in a little bit. There's obviously errors, got a cough. <clears throat> yeah, algebraic data types, and so on. Um, some of the ones towards the bottom are pretty complicated. I don't think I'm going to talk on them here today, but a lot of work goes into them. <coughs> um, so yeah, inference variables. So. Usually in languages, um, you have like in C and C++, you know, people will be familiar with the auto keyword. And so you always, with auto keyword, you have to have the right-hand side initializer. That's not the case in Rust. Um, hang on. <laughs> you actually can um, define a variable and ask for the compiler to infer what this should be later on. So. The first example here is obviously, we'll just say let A, we don't know what A is. Then we say, well, A, we want it to be an integer, but we don't know what type of integer it is. But then we might use, we might do something else. So let's see at the bottom, we're doing A plus B, but like B is a U32. So what we're saying here is we're trying to add some kind of integer with a U32. And so we have to gather all of these obligations and ideas together to eventually figure out, oh, this is U32. It doesn't default to an I32. It doesn't, you know, we have to build up sort of this idea of what the type could be. So that's why we use this idea of IDs. And that's why actually I think a separate IR works quite well because if we wanted to do this on the GCC trees, <clears throat> we'd actually have to then um, have lots of pointers and tables and maybe recursively go through the trees again and update the tree types, which would be quite painful for us. What we were able to do is just keep a side table with an ID and a type information, which is quite helpful for us. It makes certain things a little bit more awkward later on, but it also helps other things too, so it's a bit of a trade-off. But I just, that's a little high level, just interesting case where it's not, this is not the auto keyword is what I'm trying to put across here. It's not like uh, other languages that way. <clears throat> this is the weird one. I really, really, really don't like this in Rust at all. Um, so this is actually a valid test case in Rust. Um, this is actually valid code. And so how do you infer what the type of A is? And so what actually happens in this test case here is you're saying A is equal to return, which actually means that's never type. That's a control flow change is what that's called. Then what we're saying is, well, we've got A. B is like A plus one, so we're trying to add never type to an integer, 
which is weird. So what Rusty does is say, well, actually, I can't actually know what this type is. I'm going to not error yet. I'm going to return you a new inference variable with some extra obligations to say that this has to be able to be added with another integer. And so at the very end, then you can say, well, a equals a number, and that that is actually able to be added. And so at that point, the idea is the never type is coercible to any other type. And so that's actually valid Rust C code. This is like really poorly documented, but it's something we also have to handle. And it's just to put across the idea that the type system has to keep track of obligations of what you're asking it to do, not necessarily I'm specifying it that it should have this type, which is pretty interesting and has some, I don't know, interesting ideas really, which is more like, I don't know, like Haskell or something? Yeah, it's a bit closer <coughs> to what you'd find in very high level functional programming languages. Mm -hmm. And so, no one writes Rust code like that, but the fact that this is possible allows you to do a lot of cool stuff, like you do in higher level functional programming, but with still the speed of a compiled native language. Yeah. So then the other things that get interesting is um, <laughs> auto deref. This is one of the cases which is really not documented well enough. So the classic example is probably either this or the box keyword, but I'll show you this one for the first point. So I don't know, I see up here. Um, so yeah, we've got like a structure bar, we've got a method foo, and we've got some magic here. But what we want to do is we want to try and call foo.bar. So the compiler is actually able to do this, but what actually happens under the hood here is that it, the compiler actually has to inject, oh, we're actually going to do a dereference and call this function and then eventually call foobar. So that's like a basic example, but what that's useful for is a lot of the time in Rust you'll have like, we want to allocate memory, you, you do it inside this box type, and so instead of having to always dereference your box yourself, the compiler is able to magically turn that into like, oh, we're going to call that specific method. So it is useful. But as you can imagine, this type of stuff can get out of hand really, really quick. Um, so what actually happens is um, you have what's, what's called, it's, it's part of an equation site and you can have adjustments, but you can have any number of adjustments required to get to you or to an end result. There's obviously rules there, but it can go on quite a while. It is quite powerful, but yeah, it can go on. Um, coercion sites are the same, so like this is another example where we're saying let bar equal to a reference of an integer equals an, <laughs> to taking the borrow of foo, which is weird. So this this really is a strange one. So you would think in C and C++ taking the ampersand operator here would call like you know load effective address or something like that. It's not like this in Rust. It's the ampersand. You don't think of it like that. It's not an address operator. It's a borrow operator. And that means what actually happens here is you generate a deref operation, which is completely the opposite of what you're saying in the language. But that's what happens, <laughs> and that's valid Rust. You know, so it's taken a long time for us to figure this stuff out because this is also not documented. But it is this would be used in some code. So yeah. Um, I'm probably not going to have time to show you this other example I've got, but. There's, there's other interesting cases which we've also found where uh, you can have a reference or a pointer to a slice, which is signified by the little two square brackets, the little, um, yeah, that's a reference or a pointer to a slice of some type. And so you would expect that to be some kind of pointer or slice, but it's actually not in Rust. It's a special case where you're actually creating a struct that you pass around under the hood, so it's not actually a pointer. You actually take a, point, a struct which contains uh, a pointer to the thing that you want to have a slice to and a capacity. And so they call this a dynamically sized type. It just means there's a bit of weird handling because obviously in GCC we're creating, you would think, oh, we would do create reference type or create pointer type, but no, we have to have a special predicate to try and handle this case. <laughs> yeah. And there's an there's there's interesting reason they do that, but uh, I'll have to show people offline why that's the case. And so, yeah. <clears throat> and yeah, because as we said before, Rust is a very strict language, there are actually a lot of checks that we have to perform and that would cause hard errors about Rust programs. So for example, uh, Rust is an object-oriented language, a bit like C++, but only a tiny part of what you'd consider object-oriented programming languages. And it has encapsulation or privacy, visibility, whatever you want to call it. 
In C++, uh, you have public items, protected items, and private items. In Rust, however, uh, you can do a lot more uh, fine-grained stuff on your items. So for example, you can have just a public item, which is public for everyone uh, in your binary, in people linking against your binary. But you can have also pub create, which means that this item will only be, only be public to the present binary, but anyone linking against that uh, will not see these items. You can also do pub, pub super, which means that it's public only in the parent module. Furthermore, uh, because you can do pub in path, you're allowed to specify that an item is public in a very specific module, and that module has to be an ancestor of the current module, and then that item is visible in the children of the ancestor module that you're specifying. And the, it gets really, really hard. And <laughs> uh, this is very powerful, but it also means that we need to do a lot of these extraneous checks and as Philip mentioned before, we're using HIR IDs for that because it's easy to refer to something through its ID, which is just a number. If we had to do that using trees, uh, we'd probably need to do a lot of extra attribute of checking and it, would get, it could get quite mess messy quite fast. Another check that we have to perform is the unsafe checks. So in Rust, you're allowed to use the unsafe keyword for a block or a function and then your true potential is unlocked. You, you can do a lot more stuff in the language that's completely not safe. For example, uh, dereferencing row pointers, which is completely illegal in Rust, but allowed in unsafe contexts. Uh, there's also, for example, calling unsafe function, calling extern functions, so that's C functions, for example, through FFI, using just mutable, so globals that you can change, or globals that are defined in C programs or doing like inline assembly, for example, all of that is completely forbidden in regular safe Rust, but as soon as you're in an unsafe context, you're allowed to do that. And again, we have to perform these checks and to emit hard errors saying, well, no, you can't do that because you're not in an unsafe block or an unsafe function. And we're using the C++ type system actually through our, well, through our HIR nodes, uh, through polymorphism, through static dispatch to make sure and make it easy to visit every item of a module, for example, every expression of a function. And uh, this would just be much harder if we were using trees, I think. And one big advantage of that is that because it's a, because it's a much more classical compiler structure where you have different passes and they're just simple visitors, this makes it very easy for someone new to compilers to actually contribute to GCCRS. And with a little bit of compiler theory, you can just understand what we're doing and understand that the unsafe check visitor is performing the unsafe checks. <laughs> and to check in a function, well, you just go to the visitor of that function and make your thing happen. So, yeah. Okay, uh, this is where I come in. Um, the last step of the front end, obviously, is figuring out how do you pass everything off to the rest of GCC to actually get code generated. Um, and so what we do is we just translate our high intermediate representation that we've used until now into GCC's trees. Um, and a lot of things are really straightforward, like an if expression or a loop expression, they pretty much translate directly to the corresponding tree nodes. Uh, but some of them are, are not very easy. So we're gonna look a little bit at the sort of back end, which I dislike being a also working on GCC back ends. I, there's a little bit of ter terminology overlap there, uh, but the back end of the front end. Um, so what we do is we do this. I mean, this is the entry point to uh, the rest of our code generation. I, I literally copied and pasted this out of the source code, the compile crate go. It's just for every item in the crate, a crate is basically a module or a translation unit, whatever you're doing. Um, you just compile it. And what that looks like is we just do some dispatch according to what the item is. Um, so this top level item thing is basically anything that can exist outside of a function in Rust. So you have top level like global variables, function definitions, uh, structure and union definitions, all of those things are items. Um, and then depending on what we have, we go and figure out what to do with it and how do we actually generate the trees. So for some things, uh, it's really straightforward. If you have a variable declaration, well, you just make a var decal tree node um, and move on with your life. Uh, there's also, you know, a lot of other things that can exist at that level. So 
you see expressions or things like functions, then you have to go a little deeper and figure out uh, what to actually do with them. So this is just a little bit of a diagram of how we do the dispatching and what gets done where. Um, but you can see, importantly, if I can, oh yeah, over here, so we're starting out and we're coming in with a compile item, and one of the things that compile item might call is compile item, because items can be made out of other items, and so you've got this big sort of recursive structure that eventually, hopefully, you get to one of these tree nodes and actually can move on. Um, but the more interesting things to look at are things like expressions, and so this is sort of how you diagram what does the compilation process look like for an expression, and it's all trees all the way down. Um, so basically, if you have a very simple expression, like something like an if, like I mentioned earlier, maps pretty directly into the corresponding tree node, well, you can just make it at the top level very easily. Um, but most of the time, you're gonna have types in your expressions, and you're gonna have to figure out where do I get this type? Have I already compiled it? Do I need to compile it? And then, oh, is it a structure? Maybe it contains a whole bunch of other types that I need to go figure out what to do. Um, and so eventually, the, this tie tie resolve compile thingy is the thing that uh, you use to look up what sort of type is this, that's the resolution part, have I already compiled it, if I haven't already compiled it into a, a GCC tree definition of a type, then I need to go and do that and you get your tree nodes. Um, so like was mentioned a little bit earlier, um, one of the more interesting aspects of Rust is these match expressions. Um, for me personally, it's what got me into the language. I studied OCaml a little bit in university, and I thought, wow, these functional languages are really cool. Imagine if we could do something like that in C or C++. Uh, and so when I saw Rust with its match expressions, I was like, this is cool. This is what I want to work with. Um, at, at the basic level, they're pretty much like switch statements on uh, a lot of steroids, probably illegal ones. <laughs> so if you have something simple like an integer, you can say, well, match I and you know, if it's one, it's one. Uh, then you can do simple range things. And there's this underscore, which is basically the, the default case, whatever. Um, they're also cool because they let you use patterns to destructure data. So you can match on something like uh, Rust's algebraic enums. We have this definition of foo over here, and A, which holds a character, and B, which is sort of holding a struct. Um, so a match is really easy to, or it's really natural to work with enumerations in Rust through match statements to say, okay, I've got some data, what kind of thing is it? And then in the patterns of the cases, you can destructure the data that you've got, and now you can, within the context here, you can do stuff with X and Y because you've sort of pulled them out of the data that you had encapsulated in the enum. Um, so initially, well, you can say, okay, I have a simple match statement here that just is checking an integer. Let's try compiling it to a switch. Oh, hey, that works really well because at this level, they're pretty much the same thing. And so you can just build the switch expression with the cases and the default. And everything in, inside, uh, you go back and you compile all those expressions to the corresponding tree nodes and stuff them in, and you're good to go. Um, and similarly, for the cases where you're destructuring data, uh, inside the, this is sort of the, the minus F dump tree original representation. So you've got access to the elements of the data through here because a Rust enum has some sort of discriminant thing that tells you, okay, which variant is it, and then you can access the data accordingly. Um, but where it starts to get really complicated is that you can pretty much match on anything. And in this, this case, you know, the scrutiny here is just a function call, okay, that doesn't look too bad. Um, but you can match on things like uh, a tuple, and suddenly you can't translate that simply into just a switch anymore because you're matching on several different elements at the same time and you have to go through and look at all the patterns to see which thing does this look like. Um, and what I show on this slide is you start to do things like variable bindings and arm guards in the cases of the match. So here you've got uh, something like a socket read, right? And if you got some data, if you were able to read from your socket, okay, now you have some amount of bytes and some address and you can go do stuff, send a packet back. Uh, but maybe you don't want to block, so you say, okay, if, if I got an error because I couldn't actually read any data from this socket, well, now, I, now in, the, in the match arm directly, I can check the error kind and say, if it's a, a wood block, well, I'm just gonna return. I'm gonna say, no, I'm not doing anything because I don't want to block. Or if it's other kinds of errors, then, well, I, I'm not gonna handle them because I'm lazy. It's just gonna panic and crash. <laughs> um, so tuples. Uh, the approach that I originally 
picked up looking at the tuples uh, is that, well, hey, we have all these elements. Why don't we just look at one at a time and make a bunch of nested switch statements? <laughs> and well, it, it sort of works. Um, if we have a bunch of switch statements, then in, sorry, in the HIR here, we can just rearrange the expression that we've got into matches. And what this does is we say, hey, we've got some code that's really good at lowering simple match expressions directly into a switch. So let's just break it up in the HIR and then lower it. And we can switch on one thing at a time. And it seems to work. But looking at this, there's something a little bit subtle going on because back here, we've got this tuple, which is you know, some, some element for A and some element for B. And in this case, a, these two patterns share the same first thing. So what we've got to do is, if we're rearranging, how do we know to put, like, to group these patterns together? Well, we have to go through and check all the patterns and see which ones we can merge. And that gets, uh, sorry, what is this? OK. <laughs> that gets complicated very quickly because suddenly you've got to peel apart your all the structures that you've got in your high intermediate representation, start pulling out all the pieces of the patterns, figuring out which ones are actually the same pattern, and so it can be merged into the same match arm of, this, uh, of the match, uh, and then re reconstruct the HIR nodes. And that turns out to be kind of annoying with the HIR because it wasn't designed to do that. Um, so the next thing that I have been looking at is, well, maybe we can lower it to a switch statement as as we go, sort of, and then, hey, it's really nice to rearrange the GCC trees. Why don't we just do it that way? Um, so that's, that's the second implementation that I've got going. Um, but there's a, sort of an open question that I'm looking at is, would it be better to just start adding custom tree nodes and using them? And until now, we haven't added any custom tree types. Like, for example, the C++ front end, they parse directly into trees, but there's a huge amount of custom nodes there. Um, and until now, we haven't done that because, hey, the nodes that we've got are really good, and GCC is really good about knowing what to do with them. Let's not make our lives more complicated. So that's kind of the next thing that I'm looking at. Um, oh, yeah, I guess th these two things up here is just a little bit about, um, like I mentioned, you can match on pretty much anything. So a tuple is what I showed. But for a structure, for example, you're going to want to do basically the same thing because you can match on every single element of the structure. And as you do that, you're going to have uh, wildcards inside of your expressions somewhere. And so like in this case, it looks pretty innocuous that you've just got a tuple. And the two cases you want to check are, is it this variant of an enum and x is 2 and go and do stuff? And otherwise, I don't really care. But if you're lowering into a bunch of nested switches, you need to figure out what to do with the, what's the appropriate thing to do with the wildcard at every step so that you don't end up building a switch statement that has two default cases and then crashing. Um, and there's more, because matches are fun. Uh, so this is something that I was actually hacking in on the airport on the way here, because I didn't realize that we hadn't done this yet. But <laughs> you'll recall the socket example where you can use the thing that you've bound and add this little extra check to the match arm. And what that does is it, it sort of gives you a, a redundant check on your case to say, OK, I want to pull this, pull this data out of the thing that I'm matching on. And then I want to look at it and only actually execute the right-hand side of this match arm if it meets some condition. And that means that, well, you have to have access to that variable that you bound here, E. This creates the binding that pulls the data out. Uh, and right now, we just don't do that because we haven't bound the variable before we go into the, sorry, we, we only bind the variables when we go into the right-hand side of the statement, which means that this if doesn't know what the hell he is. Um, so I, that means going back up and to the name resolver and fixing the problem there to actually make sure that we know what, what the variables are. Um, yeah, that's a lot of work in progress. And I guess that's the end of my slides. Yep. Um, uh, yeah, so one of the interesting things that's, oh, sorry. Is there someone on the question? Oh, yeah. So about the, uh, the match lowering, um, I wonder 
I wonder why you're trying to lower to switch rather than just to if. Um, the other thing is that with regard to the C++ specific tree nodes, um, those, those are just our HIR equivalent, which are lowered to generic uh, tree nodes. So I don't, I don't see what benefit you would get from adding a match expert. We don't have enough microphones. Um, <laughs> I, think, I think that's a really, I mean, that's a good point. That's something that is why I haven't, why we hadn't created the tree node originally, just to say like, mm -hmm. okay, let's make a custom match expression tree node, because it's not clear what benefit we get. Um, yeah. yeah, you have to lower it at I, some point. I think probably part of the problem is our mappings code. Yeah. So, well, exactly. one of the things that's uh, all about, as I mentioned, about typing, there's an awful lot of IDs and stuff that we have to keep track of. And we use those IDs to then look up maps and stuff and side tables. And so if he wants to like reuse and build different trees, he has to make sure we get those mappings quite right. Whereas if we then just generate the actual GC trees, they're much more reusable than what we have for this specific, for this specific case, if you know what I mean. It's, it's kind of hard to explain until you actually start to work with it. Um, but yeah, it's to do with these IDs that we use. Yeah, and I think there was an earlier part of your question, which is why not just lower to if. Um, basically, the way that I looked at it was that we already have a large amount of code that can lower simple match expressions to switch statements. So, and we know that works very well because GCC is really good at figuring out if you've got switch statements that have a bunch of redundant stuff in them to eliminate that and optimize it to something really nice. So I figured just use that and not make my life complicated, but that is a good idea for the ifs and I'm gonna look into it. So thank you for the suggestion. And well, in passing, I think it does the same turning ifs into switches um, if it needs to. But my question is, can you talk about why you're lying to trees as opposed to going straight to generic? Well, I guess probably the main reason for that is that, well, we, uh, when I started this project, it was a uh, copy and then find or place of go to Rust. <laughs> and so that's how it started. So we used that as a way to bootstrap the project. And one of the things from there was, uh, one of the best things about the Go front end was actually it has this whole back end abstraction thing, because I think it was actually used to be ported to LLVM at one point. And so one of the, I think, hardest things for newcomers to GC is actually knowing how to set up um, the GCIR in general, um, because it is, from what I can tell, pretty much a type def to union. Um, whereas people coming from other languages are used to constructors and lots of helper methods and things like that. Um, that back end abstraction was really, really valuable to us at the start. But what's happened now is we're actually trying to get rid of it because now we know what we're doing. <laughs> so yeah, we're kind of in the middle of, I guess, cleaning a lot of that up now because we know what we're doing, obviously. Yeah. Um, Does that answer your question okay? <laughs> yeah. Well, one of the other things I wanted to mention today is actually constant evaluation. Um, one of the things that we um, need to do in Rust is obviously constants and uh, static items are basically const expert from C++, so you can actually give them an expression and it will obviously go off and then evaluate this for us. And this has to be done regardless of optimization level. It has to be done in the front end itself. So this was, this was gonna be just like way too difficult for us to like write ourselves. So the best solution was to steal this from the C++ front end. So we had a Google Summer Code student actually do that for this this year. And it's like 20 or 30,000 lines of code or something like that we had to do uh, to take that over. There's still some stuff from C++ we need to get rid of out of that because a lot of that doesn't apply. So some of the, the, one of the best bits about the C++ constant evaluator is it's got really powerful error handling. But obviously that means then we end up hitting errors of like this reference is C++ standard blah, which obviously does not apply. Um, and so this is a toy example I have here. It's, it's pretty simple what's gonna happen here. We're just saying we have a constant, we call this function, we expect that to evaluate. The most interesting thing that happened today, actually just for our talk was actually the, um, we went onto Reddit and uh, the Rust blog actually put out a, a statement saying that they had to put out a new point release because their constant evaluator was doing something wrong for this particular case with transmute and a unit type and things like this. 
And so I was like, well, what does ours do? And ours does the correct behavior already, which is actually really nice to see. <laughs> and so I think um, there's so much to benefit in sharing code, and that was actually a really nice affirmation that we are on the right track of trying to find something that's a little bit more stable and reusing as much as possible. Um, we didn't have time to put the link of the, of the blog post here, but it's on their, on their website at the moment. Um, yeah, so that, that was really, really nice to find. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so now we want to talk a bit about, um, oh, I also should mention them. That was our Google Summer Code student that done all of this work for us this year called Faisal. Um, so thanks to him for all of his hard work this year. <laughs> um, so yeah, status and future work and questions and things like that. I don't know how much time we have left. 10 minutes. 10 minutes. Um, feel free to stop us or whatever. Um, so when is it ready? Um, yeah, this is a difficult one. So. As I mentioned, uh, we are really trying our best to try and get libcore working. This is our absolute top priority. This is what we care about the most. Um, we're targeting like our libcore 1.49, which is right before Constanerics came in, like I mentioned earlier. We're doing a bit of that now to try and get ahead in the future. Libcore, as I mentioned earlier, it's just so necessary for everything. Like I mentioned, your closures, for loops, additions, you can't do any of it without it, technically. Um, I can, if you want to talk to me offline, I can show you why that's the case. Um, it requires, uh, it has a lot of special attributes that do a lot of special things. Um, as I mentioned, lying items, that's how all these things hook up together, how these things fit together. Um, it's how operator overloading works is through lying items. So if you want to implement like an add operator overload, you have to implement the core ops add, but the trait for that is actually marked as a lying item and things like this. So once libcore is working, um, at that point, in theory, uh, the thing to get the other libraries working, like liballoc, lib, lib standard, and so on after that, should in theory be quite easy. Um, but they don't necessarily define, I think there's very, very minimal extra compiler magic that they define. Um, and so it should be a matter of like, oh, we've got libcore working, we can compile it. Uh, where it gets awkward is um, libproc, which is yeah. hand over to Arthur to talk about libproc. Yeah, so <laughs> there's two kinds of macros in Rust. The one I showed you was uh, nice and complicated. The other one is nice and complicated. It's uh, procedural macros that are basically, they look like attributes that you would put on your functions or structs or uh, items or however. And the way this works is that the compiler acts uh, as a remote, like as a server for a client, which is libproc, uh, a Rust library. And so the Rust compiler will send tokens uh, to that libproc. That libproc will be able to manipulate these tokens and send a new uh, array of tokens, basically, for example, making a new structure or adding a function or whatever. And we have to implement that sort of client-server thingy to make sure that we can interact with libproc. Where it gets difficult, is that we have C++ types, obviously, and libproc expects Rust types for the tokens. So we're going to have to do some magic to try and convert mm -hmm. our C++ tokens, I mean, our GCCRS tokens, because they're just a yeah. random, random struct, uh, to what libproc expects. And we're going to need to do that at some yeah. point. I think in theory it sends text over and then get text back is what we're hoping is the case. Yeah, I think it's <laughs> a bit more difficult. <laughs> And the, the one other big thing that we have to think about is borrow checking. So I'm not going to get uh, too much into what borrow checking is. Basically, it's uh, the, the thing that makes sure that you cannot do a lot of things wrong in Rust. So making sure that you don't get double freeze, that you don't get use after freeze, that you can't use the same mutable variable uh, twice in the same function. It prevents a lot of race conditions. It prevents a lot of stuff, and it's it's really uh, an inherent part of the Rust language in that if we didn't have one, we wouldn't be a Rust compiler. And the fact is, we don't have one for now. And uh, that's where the Polonius project comes in. So we're trying to integrate with this formalization effort known as Polonius, which is a library uh, built on a logic engine trying to specify logical rules uh, for what is borrow checking and so what is a borrow, what is a mutable borrow, what would cause a, dub, would cause, cause a double free or a use after free and stuff like that. And this is something that we're going to have to think about really, really hard and to implement if we want to actually make a compiler that people are happy to use and to report bugs for. Yeah. 
then I think that always turns into like versioning. So I think we had an interesting discussion about versioning um, when we were at Cauldron. Um, so if we were going to have multiple compilers, there is no Rust language standard, or there's no Rust language version. The version of the Rust language is tied directly to the Rust C compiler at the moment. Um, there is the Rust addition system, which is what we're hoping would be the best solution for both compilers to live with. Um, yeah, do you want to say what we remember from LPC? Yeah, so one of the things that um, at LPC we talked with the Rust for Linux people, and it's great to hear that they're very interested in this project. Um, but some of the feedback that we got in from some of the Rust language people who are also there is additions are not the right thing to rely on. You should not rely on that. Um, so there's not really, additions are basically, there's a Rust 2015, a Rust 2018, and 2022. 2022, no? Yeah. 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 Um, and oh, so those, are, those are sort of their way of saying, we're not going to make any backwards. Um, if, we, if you have code that works for Rust 2018, then it will continue to work for Rust 2018 forever. We might make some breaking changes after that, but you can say targeting that addition and have your code still compile. So we were thinking, well, that would be a great thing to have a sort of standard, and we can say we compile Rust 2018, and the Linux kernel, the Rust for Linux people, can say, okay, we're only going to depend on Rust 2018. Um, but that seems to be not an option, and so instead, it's sort of a, eventually there will be a minimum version of Rust required for the Rust for Linux kernel building. <laughs> once the features that they have relied upon that are currently unstable are stabilized. But the problem with that is that yeah. some of those features currently have no path to stabilization and there's no ETA for when that will be. So eventually there will be some minimum uh, required version that we can implement and that Rust C obviously will implement and then we can rely on that to be able to compile Rust for Linux with either compiler. Yeah. Um, but if some of those unstable features have no path to stabilization currently, it could be, you know, it could be six months from now, it could be six years from now. So okay. it's a little bit, it's a little bit hard to work with yeah. when there isn't a formal language standard, you know, something like a C11 standard that you can say, okay, we implement this, we have a C11 compiler, Rust doesn't have something yeah. stable like that that you can rely upon, and they release a new version every six weeks. Yeah, so I think people don't necessarily realize, but like it does release every six weeks, which is, oh, sorry. <laughs> is this a Rust for Linux uh, specific thing, or do other projects also secretly use and stuff? Yeah, it's. <laughs> no, but, but, but you can say that out loud. So yeah. everybody uses unstable, which is, which is a problem. Yeah, I think it's a mixture of problems because I think there is a really growing part of the community which is trying to stop this. But one of the problems is a lot of the very popular libraries are built off nightly, which then in turn makes everyone else do this. And I, think, I don't think they really understand the ramifications of this over the long term. You know, because when you get a new version of Rust compiler, you can get all or, of, or, or some of, but you can get new LVM updates for, so your code generation can change. Like, for instance, the going between version 149 and 150, it's not marked, but the code generation for slices just changes. You know, you get completely different code gen, which is, I don't know, it's, uh, that's not a minor change in my book. Um, you know, you can get security fixes, un, like unsafe has changed over time. Um, and so tracking versioning and things like this based on compiler version is difficult. Especially, we have a, we've a change we've proposed to the Rusty compiler to do with unsafe that you've been working on as well, which is relevant. Yeah, but that's just to make sure that to encourage like cross-pollination with the two mm. compilers and make sure that we work together towards having mm. uh, some sort of way that we can pass a Rust test suite. And for example, one way that uh, that's also the testing yeah. project, which we've been spending a lot of time on the past few months, uh, is that, yeah, we're trying to run through the Rusty test suite for various versions of the Rust language every night and uh, noting regressions, uh, improvements, and stuff like that. And, yeah, various other real-world projects, such as the Blake 3 cryptography library, and there was, eventually... There was a libcore SIP basher, which actually works yeah, now, the, which yeah, is cool. Uh, yeah, one of the hashing algorithm from libcore yeah. that we can no compile. Uh, what? 
Oh, well, <laughs> ah. <laughs> and um, yeah, the, we're spending a lot of time and having nice people like David Malcolm uh, making <laughs> sure that we get error codes, which will help us uh, target the Rusty test suite and matching against the Rusty compiler to ensure that, for example, if we pass the Rusty 149 test suite, well, we are able to compile any project built using Rusty 49, 149. Yeah. So, yeah, it's just there's a lot of work going into this, and this is what we're working on at the moment. Yeah. We have mugs. <laughs> <laughs> and we have mugs. So I've been giving out contributors different mugs and stuff as a way to say thank you. But If you do three pull requests, you get a mug. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think we have to transfer upstairs to the boff now. Yep. Thank well, thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs>
Yeah. Uh, can I change the slides? Uh, would we not read properly, right? Sorry? It will not be read properly. I will start start recording and uh -huh. and you can start. Okay. Hello. <laughs> Hello everybody. In this session we will talk about of the analysis of the ABI. Let's see how can we can extract, uh, analyze and uh, build a full representation of the ABIs. Please if you have you have Questions interrupting me, but uh, can you please speak slow because my English is not really best, the best. <coughs> okay, let's start. Uh -huh. The agenda for this session, I briefly talk about of the ABI concepts, uh, what is LIFABIGAIL, what implementation for the CTF, the book format was done in LIFABIGAIL that it's an alternative for the dwarf format. Dwarf format is the currently default format used for the LIFABIGAIL to extract the ABIs. Let's see how to compare libraries and the kernel LBIs following uh, similar steps, configure, uh, sorry, uh, generating, extracting the representation of the ABI, building the internal representation, and after that we use the external command to enumerate the difference of the, of the ABIs. Mm -hmm. Let's see some prerequisites for the kernel. The kernel should be a special support to uh, put the CTF information inside of the binary how we can, uh, after that we, uh, I will mention some metrics, uh, performance metrics done just to extract the information of the CTF and using the CTF reader compared with the dwarf reader. How to detect an ABI breakage I using the new support and I provide an, an example to build an a uh, kernel within one add a specific version of an ABI, but this module should be tried to be loaded in another different version of the kernel. Uh, after that, uh, let's see how CTF can help us to um, check the compatibility across the different version of the kernel or libraries. <coughs> and the, in the point six, we will see an using user's cage that are some uh, average 
some GCC attributes that update the ABH, but the Leaf Abigail are unable to detect those, those changes. And the final point, I will show you the working pro progress that we have. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, the ABI defined a set of rules and conventions to specify how two binaries should be changed the information across them. <coughs> this, uh, this is a level of specification because it is related with the stretch set architectures, the <coughs> registers, and is dependent for the target architecture and the uh, family of processors. One of the most important things that it's defined in uh, uh, in an ABI is the calling convention. <clears throat> it also defines as well the size, the layout, and the alignment of the basic types. Mm -hmm. In an ABI, we have specified the binary format of the object files. It also dictates the mangling and exception propagation in this specification, in an MBA specification. Okay. What is Leaf Abigail? Leaf Abigail is a library specialized to analyze ABIs. Actually, uh, sorry, uh, uh, before to start implementation with the CTFs, just, is, just was able to understand the dwarf information. Mm -hmm. It has mm, tools specialized to extract an ABI and, and serialize this information in, XM, in, in, X, in XML files. And vice versa, we can read an XML files and build the internal representation, which in turn can be used to compare ABIs with an specific library, sorry, with an specific application that is ABI diff. Mm -hmm. It also has support to understand the RPMs and Debian packages, but internally it's just, uh, a it implements a functionality just to uncompress those files, read, extract the information, and compare it between two different uh, packages. <coughs> uh, it's useful to detect ABI breakage. And in this way, uh, keeps the backward compatibility or in the uh, warranty, in, in some way, uh, the backward compatibility across the different version of the packages. Mm -hmm. oh. mm -hmm. right. uh -huh. okay. um, um, the support now it supports CTF, but what is CTF? CTF is a recent debug format. It associates symbols with its types, basically. It was thinking to be a lightweight uh, debug format, and uh, it's embedded on the ELF. The strip uh, application, by default, keeps the CTF section, that is the section that contains the debug information. In the CTF, we have two major entities that are the archive and, and dictionary. Basically, an archive contains one or more dictionary. Uh, CTF in the dictionary, uh, in the dictionary, we have a relationship that is um, parent and child. A parent dictionary contains the common uh, type of definition for child dictionary in order to avoid duplicating information in the dictionaries. Mm -hmm. The Leaf Abigail relies to access and extract the CTF information in the Leaf CTF, which is part of the bin utils. The current uh, specification is the version three. Mm -hmm. Here is an example of how we can use the tools provided for bin utils to dump the CTF information, in that case for the VM Linux. The most important thing is the, line, is the last line that represents a 
symbol type definition in the CTF. It is encoded by the CTF, sorry, by the C, yeah, for the CTF ID. The kind, in this case, five that represent that print K is a function, and then symbol type definition. That is the signature and the return type in this case. This picture shows how uh, CTF support was implemented in Leaf Abigail. <laughs> the uh, yellow, the yellow uh, figures represent common functionality that shares between two, two readers. Basically implements a new reader that is the CTF reader, but the algorithm that we are follow is open a dictionary, sorry, open an archive, get the, uh, the dictionary and iterates over the symbol table. The symbol table just for library, but in the kernel, in the special kernel, <coughs> just extract the symbol information for the kernel symbol table. That is the exported symbols. After that, uh, type, type base, the type base was created. Type base can be a function, enumerations, a structure. It can be integrated or can be added to the corpus which in turn can build a, a, a corpus group. This is the case of the kernel, because every corpus represents a module, a kernel, kernel, kernel module, and the VM Linux as well. After that, we can serialize that information in the writer to save that information and, and later be used for a different application that it's ABI diff and generate the report of the difference of, of the ABIs that it shows in the figure, in the left figure. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, the tools are all as, as well benefit for the CTF support. This is the IB data writer that represents an, an ABI as XML input. The ABI diff that is used to compare to binary representation, to ABI representation, sorry. And the ABI package diff that it iterates or, or, or handle package instead of binary applications. And the last point is the KIM diff. These tools uh, can, is able to extract the information but two different kernel build directories. Uh, this is the basic flow that we follow to uh, compare binary application. We need as input uh, binary files that has dwarf information, CTF information, or just the symbol table information. These tools, the ABA data writer extract the ABI and can uh, build an internal representation that could be used for the ABI diff, or we can save this representation as XML files. After that, we can use ABI diff to compare those binary representation and emit the different report. Uh -huh. And this is an example of the first source code when we have uh, some data types definitions, uh -huh. we compile with minus GCTF to generate the CTF sections. And uh, what it mentioned here that both binary, both uh, the book formats can live in the same, in the same uh, binary. Uh -huh. This is an example with the, uh, with the, the XABI representation, sorry but now with the CTF support. I don't give mm, full details about this. <coughs> Just I want to mention that in the, in the, test, in the test suite, there are a common, common L, L files, common, L, common binary files that shares the same, the share, that shares the both, both, both um, the book formats. And the report is very similar, it's quite similar. This is the second program. As you can see, uh, I remove the size of the array, 
I remove the qualifier. We ask the remove the function to, and, and it will show in the report. To get the ABI report with the changes, we use the ABI data writer to generate the ABI representation. And after that, we use the ABI diff with taking as input those ABI representation. But with ABI, we can generate an ABI representation. Sorry, we can it, it can receive an ABI representation in XML file or, or with, uh, along with the, the binary files, but we need to specify the CTF modifier. As well, you can receive two binary files that are, the, are the, in this case, the both share objects. <laughs> we can replace the the foul tools used to to compare that the, to compare and extract the CTF, the emit the reports of the changes, and we can provide like Google People does this, the an application that implements a proprietary or a different algorithm that is used for ABI diff. <coughs> and of course, it will emit and customize output report for the difference between two ABI representations. Uh, Guillermo, one question. Mm. I think that Doji was actually okay with not having to specify minus minus CTF to use CTF if DORF is not present, right, in mm -hmm. the object files. Yeah. So uh, DORF will get preference? Yeah. Uh, this, this, I send the proposal, but it will be discussed after the new release 2.1. Mm -hmm. So in that case, when DORF is not found in the binary, it immediately will be jumped to look if CTF is present of them. Of the, of in, in the binary file. This is the, a simple layout of the reports, the upper report listing the ABA changes. As you can see, there are the function that was removed. The F3 was changes in the, an argument in return type. And there is listing all the changes. It's very similar to the, the report that works those. But it's not just limited to compare uh, libraries. We can compare kernel ABIs. And this is the workflow that we need to use. <coughs> we need some prerequisites, that is the CTF uh, supporting the kernel. It's not uh, in the main, it's not it's the upstream yet. <laughs> but we need to, uh, we have to config the kernel to be able to get the CTF support, and we need to execute the CTF. After that, <coughs> it creates the VM Linux CTF A. This is the archive, um, the archive file for the VM Linux, and it contains all the symbol types for VM Linux binary for the VM Linux image, and all all the symbols for the drivers that are in the kernel build directory. <coughs> uh, uh -huh. oh, sorry. And we usually follow the that we use to compare uh, libraries. That is, uh, pass that information, uh, the different tools, and it emits the report. Or we can use the KMI diff tools that summarize all the block gray, gray, gray box. <coughs> it just understand or receive two parameters that are the, the both kernel build directories. Uh -huh. This is the common lines. It's very similar to when we compare libraries and when we compare kernels. And as far as I said, we can change the default differ program, but a custom program. Uh -huh. The performance, <coughs> just to extract the information using the CTF reader compared one dwarf, we can <coughs> see that it's a good, good, good improvement because we are taking one minute and 70 seconds to extract all the ABI in an XML file, and with dwarf we are taking four, 47 minutes, sorry, four minutes, 47 seconds. 
It generates, uh, to generate the CTF representation, we need the VM Linux CTFA that occupies in size almost the same, the same size that VM Linux. But I said before, it contains not just the information for the symbols in the VM Linux image, it also contains the CTF description types for all the modules in the kernel build directory. Mm -hmm. And the performance is also be represented in when we uh, extract the information, the CTF description, sorry, the ABI description for all other packages. <coughs> in that case, in the, fir in the first and last uh, row, I use ABI diff that just extract the information and save that information in an XML file. In the other three tools, we can see uh, the improvement as well, but we are u I used the ABL, the CTF reader to extract the information, but the uh, algorithm predefined in the ABA data writer that is L LCS. Uh -huh. So the Google people change the way to compare its ABI because the extraction in the, in the comparison process is, is slow. So <clears throat> would be nice to have <clears throat> like an AB, ABI data writer that we could provide as plugin or any way to change the whole algorithm to reuse the work that was done for ABI data, ABI data writer to build, extract, and, and build a representation of the XML, of the ABI. And as well in this, uh, and as well we can customize the output for the ABI changes because uh, as, as now, just have the text a text file listing the difference. So it would be nice to have the change. Okay, uh, in the kernel, mm -hmm. we can detect uh, kernel ABI breakage. <coughs> and in this example, I uh, provide I provide a functionality for a service in the kernel version one. This is the source code. And the next one, I built a module by using the, 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 the service provided by the kernel in the version one. As I already know, um, all the undefined symbols will be resolved when the module will be inserted. And yeah, uh -huh. in my example, I simulate that we change the definition of the the symbol the the this service sorry that it's that I just add the read only attribute for the end reference okay <clears throat> so I want to validate that those uh, that the module is compatible with the kernel version one and the kernel version two I, ooh. Yeah, at uh, the first, I list the, the uh, assembly code to see if there is any difference between two uh, versions of the symbols. In that case, are the same. We use the CTF with the AB data writer to compare if there are uh, difference in the ABI for version one and version two of the routine that we provide in the kernel. In that case, it's zero or return zero means no difference. We use POG in order to compare uh, section by section if it is able to find any difference in, in, the two, in, in the two version of the service. And it don't detect anything. Mm -hmm. So that means that the, the, that I can install the first module built with the version one and the version two of the kernel. And as we expecting, the version one was installed successful. But in the version two, in the ring buffer, it shows a disagree about the version of, of the undefined symbol, but it's not right because 
All the tests uh, prove that those symbols, the, both symbols are compatible. So they insert, when we insert the, mo the module, we should uh, success. But why the module is not installed? Because there are a tool that is JNK sim that computes the CRC based on the token of the symbol definition. And this CRC, in the version two, we add the attribute read only. This attribute changed the CRC, and the kernel is expecting to find the CRC when we install the module, which is not right. <clears throat> we can install the module by forcing the mode symbols, but we don't have any reference of we are if this module is really compatible. Why? Because there is no way to uh, extract the information online. And, and online, I mean that uh, we can, it would be nice to have a command that give, that give us the, the definition of the type symbol. In, that, in this uh, case, we are really um, sure that the those symbols are the same. Those symbol type definition are, are the same. Uh -huh. But with CTF, we can warranty that there is no change in the symbol definition. Actually, <coughs> there are the same, the same symbol type definition. How can we do that? Well, we can compile our module with minus GCTF. This creates the symbol type definition for the module. And we can tell the uh, ints mode, these tools, ints mode and mode proof to uh, match if that symbol is the same for the version one or version two in the case. If the version, if the match is, if there is a match, then we can safely use mode version. This is a verification all done in user space. And in this way, we guarantee that the kernel receive a modules in, in health state. Mm -hmm. Okay, alternative we can use, we can uh, uh, prove the CRC in the kernel, but I, in, this, in this case, we need to change the kernel implementation for module.c, that is the source code that verifies the CRC. It requires changes inside of the kernel. Uh -huh. Okay, there is another. Uh -huh. Go with. What, Jose? The one with Viva Pigail only in user space or the one with Viva Pigail and also in the kernel space? Ah, because the Viva Pigail is C and, <coughs> and the module, the, 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 just we need to understand, you need to save in a, some way the symbol type definition for undefined symbols. So we need to provide in the kernel side the ability to read this information and compare with the, with the module. Yeah, it's question. Okay. Okay. This is another use case <coughs> uh, when we have uh, on the on kernel. Uh, sorry, um, ABI breakage but they're not detected by the current library, by the tools that we have in Leaf Abigail. So this is emulate a f uh, library that implements a service, uh -huh. and explicitly I change the ABI, because by default it is system five, I change to ABI, sorry, to a Microsoft ABI. Uh -huh. I compile, compile the code, but in that case, I will use the I will use the version one to do the link, and the program runs success. But when I do the link with the version two, a segmentation falls because it's clear that the ABI was changed. Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh-huh. OK. 
Okay. This is a GDB session that shows how the arguments are passed to both uh, functions and segmentation file occurs because an invalid access of this address is done. Mm -hmm. Vogue is able to detect the, the ABI, sorry, is able to detect that there, is, there are changes, but this not detect that it's an ABI changes in, in, in that section. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, uh, sorry. Uh -huh. And it would be nice to have that information stored in some place because <coughs> uh, with that, well, that information we can uh, teach to leave Abigail how to extract that information. For instance, a section where, where of what attributes are changing the ABI. Uh -huh. Yeah, and this is the status work of the patches that I sent to leave Abigail. I uh, I uh, uh, I'm writing a patch to to extract the symbol type definitions just by using the kernel symbol uh, the proc case sim all file because we have that information of global of exported symbols in CTF. Dictionary CTF ICAR is installed in the lib directory like when we do make module install. <coughs> Sorry, make header header in, header header install. Instead of have as input the VM Linux and all the binary files, because it's a prerequisite for uh, the two readers have the VM Linux and all the symbol types for the kernel object that were, was built in the kernel build directory. So with this approach, we don't need the VM Linux uh, symbol table because we can find in the proc case symbols and we have the information of the type definition and VM Linux CTFA. <coughs> with this approach, we can use a command like to you name to on fly knows the symbol type definition for a specific symbol version. And in this way compare with a simple object DOM to the symbol on the file symbol in the kernel object. <coughs> mm -hmm. The another uh, patch that are you talking about, Jose, was the fallback that is <coughs> and mm, yeah, and the last patch is an improvement that can we, uh, we can do when we are looking internally in the dictionaries of the CTF, because at least it's used recursively, looks for all the symbol type definition that depends of any specific type. But it can be stored in a cache in the one minute we can, in the kernel, we can uh, execute in less time. I don't know if you have a question. <laughs> That's it. So my impression is that the reason you're getting the speed up using CTF over Dwarf is because you've done a lot of work uh, eliminating duplicates in building the CTF archive. Um, and why don't you do that work on, on the dwarf instead? Uh, the question was, when can I use dwarf, sorry, CTF reader instead of dwarf? That the CTF archive, mm -hmm. you've gone through the, the object files and, and removed all the duplicates in, in, in forming your, your CTF archive. And we could do the same, the same process on the dwarf information to get deduplicated dwarf. And you should get the, you ought to be able to get the same speed up on the dwarf reader uh, by doing that same work ahead of time that you're doing on the CTF. Mm, yes? But, sorry. Uh, um, 
can I maybe translate? Maybe it's easier. Pregunta que porque, bueno, asume que la diferencia en performance cuando se utiliza CPF cuando se utiliza DOS es porque CPF está duplicado. Pero entonces pregunta por si nos hemos planteado de duplicar el DOS y ver si es igual de eficiente. No, no nos hemos preguntado eso. Ah, no, I didn't ask them, but it's not just the duplication because Dwarf saves a lot of information of the L5, not just the simple type definition. And the, if, if we can look at the, the implementation of Dwarf, the comparison that a DOS requires, uh, needs too many fields. For instance, the location of the file that is not stored in CTF, <coughs> the, the attributes on, of C++, that is, the, if it has a base class or a base type definition. So it is the, 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 the work that the difference we con between uh, the CTF generation does compare with, with CTF generation does have comparing with Dwarf. So there is a lot of overhead in Dwarf that is not really needed for the API. It would be interesting to see if we could use options to reduce the amount of Dwarf to the minimum necessary and then compare again. I was looking at the slide that uh, you talked about the improvements, and most of them were like on the order of like 30, 40 percent. But then the kernel had like a like a 300 percent improvement. Did you kind of take a look and see why there's such a big difference in improvement for the kernel versus the other packages? Uh, again, please. So uh, slide, uh, I think it's 21. Uh. Uh -huh. No, uh, actually, sorry. Um, maybe it's slide 22. This one. Oh. The improvements. Yeah. You, know, you see typically like 30%, 45% in that last column, and the kernel is 300%. So why is the kernel such an outlier in terms of the improvement versus the other ones? Ah, uh, okay. <laughs> the improvements was done because in Dwarf, we don't store uh, we don't store enough information. CTF has the ability to look uh, a special format to store the symbol type definition in looks for this uh, just given the name, so it doesn't have to iterate and looks uh, sequentially Dwarf information. It uses hash match internally and other stuff that uh, are focusing just in looks. Given a name, return the type recursively, of course. But wouldn't that same thing be applicable to like the core utils and fine utils and, and the other things there? So, so the, the question is why is the, the kernel one so much bigger improvement than the other ones? Ah, uh, okay. Maybe it's the duplication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Maybe so, so ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. I test with glibc. Okay. And the glibc, as far as I remember, was twenty, thirty percent. Okay. Much of time. Yeah. So, so maybe the the, the issue is the size of the the the, the binary. The, the binary that's being an, analyzed. So maybe looking at some other large binary uh, would also. Give another another check for that. Okay. Here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so if they start accepting Rust into the kernel, will CTF be able to express enough information to be used here? Because sure. CTF is specifically designed for C, right? It's, yeah. It matches the C language. Mm -hmm. If we start using Rust in the kernel, what are you going to do? Uh, fall. Give up? <laughs> <laughs> Anything else? No Rust people here? For what? Which one? For YouTube. Core YouTube's? Correct. Yeah. Mm. Which one? Um, call utils, the second. The, uh huh. The, the percentage at the end yeah. doesn't look to be a difference between 1.1 uh, and okay. 1.187. Oh. A 45 percent improvement. 45, yeah. Is that right? Yes, yes, but I don't know if the the, the time are correct, but I don't know if it's, I compute well the 45 percent. But the time, I'm pretty sure. So yeah, yeah, I, I'm pretty sure of the times. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there is no more question. Okay. Uh, really, there is no other question. We have still time. You can ask. Well, first, first talk to so thank, thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Bye. And I have one small organizational announcement. Uh, in, in 30 minutes, there will be group photo, as you can see here. So stay close. And I think here. So if you want to be on photo, come here and
Dann? Hey, okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session. Uh, there's a separate session. If you don't know, of course you know. Uh, it's the in process, in process tracing above. This one is the GDB, GDB session. Um, so I'm going to be talking to you about GDB's internal control C implementation, and by this, by this I mean uh, how GDB handles when the user types control C, and what does it do? It normally stops the program. That's the area of control C that I'm talking about. Uh, stop working. All right, I have to show this briefly. Yeah, all right, 10 minutes for you to all read that. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, we did not cut that. <laughs> <laughs> Is this because I'm moving? Again? Yeah, I think it was when I was moving. Okay, it's good. So, yeah, uh, maybe just stay here. <laughs> so, what's this all about? Um, so basically, this is a, a year-long or maybe decade-long problem that uh, so in some cases, in some programs, that you're debugging, it, your program is running and you try to interrupt it by pressing Control C and it just doesn't work, nothing happens. Um, and that, ha that happens when the program itself blocks SIGINT. Um, and uh, in some situations it could do something else to stop the program, like send a signal from the, the shell, some other signal, uh, but if the program blocks all signals then you're stuck. Uh, and there's no way to get back the prompt. The only thing you can do is pray the program traps on a breakpoint or something, or just do you have to kill GDB. Um, so I'm going to explain why does that happen, uh, why that turned out to be important for the AMD GPU target, because this is something that I've known for many years that this was a problem, and I prototyped a fix for this, which it's basically the same solution, but it was just a, a prototype. Uh, and now that I'm working with AMD, well, good thing, because now I can actually fix it. Um, so, and to explain things, a uh, quick primer on the Unix process model. And I call this the, the rainbow slide, because I've put some color in, just because it's a wall of text. And so the, the main things that I want to point out is sessions. Sessions are a way of grouping processes that they, sh they all share a terminal, uh, TDY terminal, basically call it the same thing. Um, and then a session contain, contains process groups. Which, uh, and then a process group, of, co of course, contains processes. So you have sessions, sessions contain process groups, and then process groups contain processes. Um, and then, um, this is all about job control. Uh, it's important for shells. Uh, but the important thing to realize here is that sessions can have foreground and background process groups. Uh, and when the way that interrupting or uh, a program that's running on a shell have, uh, works uh, it, on Unix is that you type some character on your terminal and the terminal driver thing in the kernel uh, understands that, okay, this character means it's an interrupt. So the kernel sends a SIGINT signal to your program. Actually, it sends it to all processes that, processes that belong to the foreground process group inside the session that has that terminal, all right? Um, and everyone knows the control C character to do this, but you can actually change this. This is a, uh, something you can uh, configure uh, in your uh, terminal. Uh, in, on, on shells, typically, you'll do something like this, and this changes the interrupt character to be control G. 
All right. Um, so this is an, a, a contrived example of a program that just blocks SIG block with SIG proc masks, uh, blocks uh, SIGINT here. So it builds a, a mask with SIGINTs and then uses this system call to tell the kernel, I don't want to see those signals. And it's falling. And you run this on the GDV, and this is what happens. Uh, basically, control C, and then nothing. This is what I was describing before. Um, another variant of this is if your program uses the SIGWAIT call. Uh, SIGWAIT is, uh, sorry about this. Oh, if it's quicker. Still broken. Um, all right, uh, moving on. Uh, so I was talking about SIGWAIT. It's all on camera. <laughs> Is this candid camera? No? <laughs> Thank you. Um, all right, so SIGWAIT is a special function that um, when you use this, you, you supposedly you block SIGINT, and then when the signal is sent to the process, instead of doing the normal, um, <clears throat> excuse me, the normal action of calling the signal handler or just doing nothing or aborting the, program, the process, uh, it picks up one of the pending signals and retrieves it from the pending list directly out of the kernel side. Uh, so technically, the signal is never considered delivered. Um, and this is like one of those old bugs. It was first reported to the GDB tracker in, in 2007. Uh, and I think there are older ones. Um, so the symptom is the same. Uh, we, we blocked SIGINTs, and, or not the same, similar. Well, in this one, nothing happens. You get stuck. Here, uh, the signal reaches the program as this returns uh, success and the signal is stored in this variable, but it didn't manage to interrupt the program. It just continues running anyhow. Uh, but you know, uh, under the hood, the, the, the problem is the same. Um, the program blocked sick and, and funny things, ha things happen. Um, so what is Control-C supposed to be under GDB? Um, I put this slide up because there was a little bit of a disagreement on this on the mailing list. Uh, this is my view, and um, so my view is that Control C has kind of a supervisor role in GDB, um, and the user thinks of Control C as meaning stop or pro pause the program. I mean, the user doesn't really think about in, um, send a SIGINT to the to the process, and the way I can prove this is that different uh, targets do different things to stop the process. Like on Windows, uh, you can see a sick, sick trap. Uh, if you attach to a process running elsewhere and then do, uh, you know, attach, uh, control C on some Unixes, you'll see just stopped. Doesn't say anything about SIGINT at all. Uh, it just happens that on Linux, the way it's implemented, uh, you get a SIGINT. Um, and another thing is that know that the default is not to pass SIGINT to the, to, the, to the process, so that it's already consistent with the view that you type control C, but you're not really intending the SIGINT to reach the, the target process. So GDB normally hides it from the, the process. You can change it with a handle command, but by default it's not, the, the setting is to not pass it. Um, of course, if you want to actually send a SIGINT to the process, you can. You can use the kill command on the shell or signal in GDB. This is a, this is a GDB command. That it's like continue, but passes a signal. Um, all right. So why is it that sometimes if the program, well, all the time, if the program blocks SIGINT, 
uh, what, why does it not work? It's a consequence of how GDB imp implements this. Um, this is a wall of text, and I can explain this with pictures. Um, I'll try to go back to see if I forget something. But uh, basically, GDB, when, it, when you type run, it forks execs, and the exec ends up spawning the shell, and then the shell execs again, and you end up with the inferior process running as a child of GDB. And this process is sharing the same terminal as GDB, the same terminal device. And remember, I mentioned before the, that sessions would be a way to group processes in Unix, processes that all share the same terminal. And so we have a session here. Uh, and then you can have foreground and, pro and background process groups. If we only have two processes, we can think of you know, a group with one process and a group with one process here. So let's skip process groups and think in terms of processes. We can say that either this process is in the foreground or this process is in the foreground. And when the process is in, is in the foreground, they receive input and the second signal. That's where the, the signal goes. So when GDB does this, it needs to juggle the terminal settings be between both these programs. So when the inferior stop or you don't have one at all, input is going to GDB, it's processing CLI commands. When you type control C, there's nothing running, you either interrupt the current running command, like help, it's a lot of text, and you, you board the type control C that aborts that command. Uh, or if you're running no command, it will, you'll see quit being written there uh, on the CLI. Um, and then when GDB, when you do continue, then GDB makes this guy be the foreground process, group foreground process, and then everything you type goes to that guy. When it stops for a breakpoint, juggle back. And when you do this, you need to um, change the terminal settings. Say, say this, this guy is a curses program, so it changed the, you know, the, the terminal flags to you know, raw mode or cooked mode or disabled echo, that some of those settings that you can do in terminals. And GDB uses readline, which has its own required settings. So when GDB uh, flips, whoever's in the foreground needs to save and restore those settings. Um, all right, so when the process is running, input is going, uh, sorry, <laughs> that's GDB. Uh, I guess this is repeating what I said before. Um, yeah, so basically when this guy is in the foreground, things go there. The second goes there. So there's a second handler inside GDB's code, and yeah, you know, does what you expect, sets a global flag, and then the GDB's event loop ends up doing something. Um, and uh, for those who've stared at GDB's code base a bit, you may have stumbled on this quit macro. So the SIG handler sets a flag, because you can't do much in the signal handler. You have to be a sync signal safe. Um, and then you expect that the event loop will eventually react to that. But you, it may take a little bit to get to the event loop. You may be stuck in some command doing things in the loop, like reading symbols. And you want to interrupt that. So you, you've typed Control C. That has set that flag. And then in spots in GDB that are running type loops, you'll have calls to this quit macro, which checks the flag. And if the flag is on, throws an exception. And that reaches out to the event loop again. Right. Uh, and so this was pretty much simple. Uh, this has newer levels. When this guy is in the foreground, you type Control-C here in the terminal, and now the signal is going to the foreground. Well, it always goes to the foreground, but this guy is now the, in the foreground. So this guy gets a second. Um, but because it's being debugged, it's running under ptrace. Um, ptrace intercepts every signal that happens in the process, giving the debugger, the ptracer, a chance to do things with the process. Uh, so the second, is, the kernel sends a signal, or the terminal driver sends a signal uh, to this process, and ptrace interrupts it and immediately pauses that thread, the thread that was going to receive the signal. And 
P-Trace then sends a sick child, a different signal to the P-Tracer, GDB, which reacts to this by calling this function call wait PID to fetch events out of the kernel. This then ret returns that this guy got a SIGINT. Um, and that's how GDB knows that this guy got a SIGINT. And then if you're in all stop mode, which is a default mode, GDB goes and stops all threads and eventually prints in the screen that program received SIGINT and does that juggling thing that I mentioned before. It saves the terminal settings of this guy, restores GDB settings, puts this guy in the foreground, and gives you the prompt. Right, so this is how it normally happens. And if you have SIGINT blocked in this program, the first two steps are the same, of course. The kernel sends the SIGINT into the process, but it remains pending because it's blocked. It's never going to be reaching the, the process. No signal handler is going to be called. Thus, Ptrace never intercepts the signal because Ptrace intercepts signals that are delivered. And this signal was never delivered. It was left pending. So you're stuck. And SIGWAIT is the same. Um, the signal remains pending. Uh, the difference is that the SIGWAIT function actually returns and the program can continue processing the, the SIGINT, the, the program you're debugging, sees that someone typed the SIGINT and processes it. But you, know, you were debugging, you would expect that that would stop the process, but it didn't because the signal goes from pending directly to user space. It doesn't go via the delivery code path in the kernel. So the signal was never delivered. So how do we fix this? Oh, before that, new slide. <laughs> so why is this important for AMD GPUs? I mentioned this before. Um, this is all that I'll be boring you with GPU stuff. Um, and it's just that we debug host threads at the same time as GPU threads. And imagine you have scheduler locking on. So when you type this command, everything is stopped. And now you're telling GDB, when I continue, I only want to resume the current thread, nothing else. I'm going to be focusing on that thread. So I select one GPU thread, thread five, and then continue. So everything that's running is just a GPU thread. All the host threads are paused. They are in ptrace stop mode, or state, I should say. So when you type control C, remember uh, the terminal driver sends the SIGINT signal to the process that's in the foreground, which is that guy. It is in the foreground. The signal is in pending state, and then if something can dequeue it, then it becomes delivered. But all of the threads on the host side, they're all p -trace stopped. they're stopped. So they're never going to see the signal until you resume one of them. So what happens? You're stuck <laughs> because they're all stopped. You don't have the prompt. The prompt, it's as if you're, you're, you're stuck. You don't have the, you know, this parenthesis GDP thing. It's, you know, the, it's assuming the program is running. Type control C. This, the terminal drive is, has queued the SIGINT already, so it doesn't add more. But unless the GPU thread hits a breakpoint, you have to kill GDP because there's even no other way to send a signal to the GPU side because signals don't exist there. All right, so we need to fix this somehow um, because for the CPU side, it's, it's annoying, but people kind of work around it with sending signals from the shell because most of the times the program doesn't really block every signal. Maybe you can find one signal that's unblocked, but for this case, you're basically stuck. So how do we fix this? We fix this how we fix every problem in computer science with, there's a question. Of course. It, uh, is there any other mic or is it just this one? I'll repeat it. It's like you've seen my other slides. Yes, it would. That would be a workaround. You'd start your program in, in a different terminal, and then you press Control-C in GDB's terminal. 
So in that situation, you have two terminals, not just one being shared by two processes. So that control C you type in GDB terminal will reach GDB, and it will check, oh, I I'm debugging something, and that something is in the foreground, so let me stop it. And it stops it in a different way for some targets. Was it? Oh, okay. Yes, you you can also try that. Uh, that's a good one. Yeah, maybe that will fix this one. I don't know why I didn't think about it. Yeah, I give up. I'm not going to be publishing this anymore. Uh, no, you, you can send signals directly to a process instead of a process group. So it might, might work. It might be a way to unblock this one. I don't remember why I tried, didn't try this or something. Anyhow, <laughs> no one will rem remember to do that. <laughs> so yeah, indirection. Um, so this is what we have. It's basically the same as I've showed before with more color. Um, and then the idea is to turn it in, into this. Uh, the difference is green is GDB's terminal, all in the same session. And the idea is to add indirection with a new terminal. So you would get what I was suggesting would be a workaround of starting process in a separate terminal. That's the, the main idea, is GDB would fork and exact this process anyhow, but instead of making it share the same terminal as GDB, it would give it a, a new terminal. And the way to do that in Unix is use, using something called a pseudo terminal. And a pseudo terminal gives you two ends, and this is the nomenclature used by uh, open, open group. Um, so you have the slave end, which is for all purposes and intentions is a terminal to this guy. He sees a normal terminal. And then you have this end that this guy can use to control that terminal. Um, and because this guy has a separate terminal from GDB, that means that this guy can continue to be the foreground process group in its own terminal. So when I type control C, it will reach this guy first, always. And then GDB can decide what to do with that. Uh, so it, it's basically decoupling. And this, of course, introduces complication to the code base, hence this talk. Um, and you know, this means that whenever this guy uses printf, it goes to output in the terminal, goes to this terminal, but this guy is not connected directly to an actual output device, it's connected to this one. So whatever's written here appears here. So GDB reads it and prints it to its own terminal. So it's like forwarding I.O. And when your program is running and it uses scanf, read input, whatever you type is typed in this terminal, so it reaches GDB, but it's meant to be sent to that guy. So GDB reads it, knows I'm debugging something, so I should forward whatever was read from the terminal and put it here, like marshalling. Right? Hmm? Doesn't this mean that you have Yes, that's what you have to do. Yes, yes. This is how SSH works. And when you ask it to create a terminal, this is how GNU screen works. Um, a, a what? Ah, you've seen my slides. <laughs> the, the question was if, if we could use this to put the output in a TUI window or box. Yeah.
so well you could but that's not friendly because the user does you might not even know that the program blocks again at some point all right so the idea is to make it work just just work you know with uppercase yep Yes, because in that situation, the process is going to be running on a separate terminal already, right? And yeah, and we don't do this forwarding. Whatever you type in GDB's terminal doesn't, isn't forwarded to the attached process, but we could. The code that's added for this solution makes it possible to do that. And we could even do that for, say, remote debugging. We don't forward input Typed in GDB terminal to the remote end, but we could. There's an, even a, a very old comment, in, comment inside GDB suggesting that, but no one ever did it. There was more questions. Yeah. You mean? No, because you don't want to mess with whatever the process does. You, you mean redirecting output? So this guy's control terminal would be this one, but the output would be redirected here. I guess. Uh, I guess it could work, but. Exactly. So there are there are advantages to having it this way, and to me, it's more the couple, like without mixing two different terminals. I don't know whether the process being debugged is going to be confused because the control terminal yeah. is one thing and then STD out is something else. I, you know, I, I, don't, I want to be the least invasive pro possible. Um, I want them to debug their own problems, not ours. <laughs> <laughs> um, right, so I basically already explained this. So when you type control C, it goes here always and then GDB just simply stops the process using some other, some way. I'll talk about that in a second. Uh, yeah, IO forwarding, this is just text to explain what I've explained before, just the names of the, the POSIX functions that let you create a, a pseudo terminal. There's a dance you have to do, it's just not just one function. I mean, wh why would you do that? <laughs> you have to do a bunch of things, like create a pseudo terminal and grant it and unlock it. Uh, doesn't matter for this talk. Um, and then GDB starts the process as if you had done TTY and then the name of the terminal. So, but internally, that's what GDB does. Um, and then GDB registers the, uh, the master end of the, of the PDY in its own event loop, so it can do this forwarding of, of IO. So here, these file descriptors, you can put them in event loop, which has a select call which wakes up whenever something is uh, sent to this guy, or, or yeah. Um, and then this is, this is output, right? Uh, that's easy, like if, whenever something is written there, we, you wake up and select, fetch whatever is written on the master end of the pseudo terminal, print it to the GDB's own terminal, done. Uh, I input is a little bit more complicated because uh, you still have to consider the two different modes of um, M is the user typing a GDB command or is the program running and I don't have the prompt. Um, so when, the, when you don't have the prompt, the program is running, you're going to be uh, copying whatever was written in GDB's terminal input, whatever you typed, you're supposed to go to the uh, inferior terminal, forward that, whatever keys you press, it goes to, G to the inferior terminal. When you do that, you need to copy those bytes pristine, 
with no terminal driver changes to you know, there, there's there's settings in the terminal that can convert automatically between you know slash slash r slash slash n to just slash n things like that and you don't want that you want every byte that goes to GDBs terminal to go raw to the other end other other end so you need to put GDB in that raw mode uh, and when the program is not running, you put it in the mode that Readline wants. Thankfully, we already do this inside GDB. There's, uh, I mean, we don't do that, but we have all the spots that need to do that. They already call this, this function, give the terminal to the inferior or make it ours. So we just need to do other things inside these functions when we, when we have this uh, mode working. Um, So yeah, um, funny thing is that running the test suite with this uh, runs into a funny use case that I noticed that um, there are some test cases that use run to run the program under GDB and then detach, assuming that the program continues running uh, in the background, which is kind of, you know, if you think about it, why would you do that? Um, if you run, you expect you just kill and then restart. Um, and uh, I was surprised to see that, but I only know this because the test started failing. Um, and so I thought it might be a good idea, you never know what people do out there, uh, to have a, an escape hatch to uh, go back to the old mode uh, because the old mode will still be there even if just for other Unix systems. Um, but I thought an, uh, an easy escape hatch would be to, if you set your terminal, when, when you do the, the TTY command in GDB, that's, the argument is the name of the terminal where the inferior is going to be running on. And in POSIX, POSIX has a number of files that they claim that always exist in all compliant systems. And one of them is slash dev slash, slash TTY. And this always means it's my terminal, my current terminal. Um, and so if the user does TTY or this thing or this longer version, uh, then this means that you really want that the inferior runs on my terminal, on the same one, which means go back to how it was before. The downside is that SIGINT is blocked. There's no way to get, you know, unless you do the magic kill from the shell, you're stuck. Um, and, you know, having a special name in the setting instead of just making it like, if it's empty, then do the old thing is better, in my opinion, because it means that the empty thing means do whatever is the default thing uh, for, for, for your system. Um, right. Um, so if we, if we do have this, then note that we have to forward input and input, output and input in both directions, but it also means that we can control when we do that. Um, it's GDB that has the, you know, the handle on when to do this. So one immediate thing that I realized was, oh, cool. So if, if you run your process in the background, that's what this means, and it starts printing stuff, and your terminal is set up such that it won't generate C, T, T, U, T, T, U, O, U, you know. Doesn't matter. <laughs> By default, that won't happen. Um, the output will be forwarded and will be mixed with whatever you're, you're typing in GDB, which can be confusing. Um, and if we control it, then it's always separate. Uh, GDB output and then inferior output. Small thing, small detail. Not very important, but just something to, to remember. Um, but the good thing that we could do is that TUI thing, that since we can control when output is flushed, we could make the TUI forward the inferior output to uh, one of the TUI windows instead of how it's today, which is messy and breaks the TUI screen because TUI is curses and the inferior just outputs stuff to the screen and you, the end result is that the whole curses window just scrolls up or worse. 
and then you have to type control L to refresh if you know it. Uh, so if, if we hooked into this routine, which is the central routine that GTP uses whenever it wants to put things on the console window, uh, we could hook it, hook the output, forward it, instead of raw bytes to the screen, use TUI put S to print it uh, on that box, or even create a separate window just for inferior output. Um, the downside of doing that, well, first thing, this is something that occasionally uh, pops up on IRC, like, my TUI screen is messed up, how do I, why does this happen? And we explain it and teach people about control L and say, well, I'm sorry, that's just how it is. Uh, so we could fix that. The downside is that if you're debugging curses programs, something, some program that does something special to the terminal, then it will no, no longer do special things because the output will be printed in the window inside TUI, which doesn't understand uh, ANSI escape codes uh, and will just print those raw escape codes. Have you seen, I'm, I'm sure most of you have seen escape codes being printed on the screen, like uh, you know the, the carrot sign and then a bunch of random numbers. Those are magic escape sequences that have meaning to the terminal. And if you don't have, uh, um, if you don't have uh, a, a terminal emulator running, consuming those magic escape sequences, then it's just garbage. Uh, you know. And then the funny thing would be if we did implement a terminal emulator inside the toy, that window, and then you could have toy inside the toy, inside the toy, inside the toy, turtles all the way down. Yeah. <laughs> And then that's, we wouldn't do this, I think. Just funny to think about it. Um, so, uh, so we have this, if we did this to fix the um, naive users, and I'm using naive, maybe wrong word, but I didn't mean to uh, be uh, downputting, just someone who doesn't understand what's going on, uh, we would fix that with the downside that if you want to debug a curses program, then and enable the TUI to debug it. You know, imagine, I do that all the time. It's debugging GDB using the TUI to debug, G, you know, my superior GDBs using the TUI mode, and I'm debugging an inferior GDB, and I enable the TUI mode. So I have two TUIs running at the same time, and this works perfectly today. So this would break it. And I think it's okay, because only GDB hackers do this. Um, so if you want to do that, either spawn your curses program in a separate terminal, which is what sane people do, or you use the, the escape hatch. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Whew. All right. We're done, right? <laughs> Except for one last problem. Um, so session leaders, remember sessions contain process groups and processes. Session, session leaders have magic properties. When the session leader exits, the kernel sends a sig hub to all the processes in the foreground process group. Remember, uh, you know, this hierarchy, I've mentioned this before, this is new. The first process in the process group when you create the process group, becomes the process group leader. That's how it becomes a leader. The first process in the session becomes a session leader. There's nothing magical about creating the leader. It's just the first one becomes a leader. Um, right. So what this means is if you are debugging a program that forks, this guy is given a separate terminal from GDB. So GDB has terminal one. GDB created a separate terminal, and it's the slave end of terminal two. And this is guy you're debugging, and then this guy becomes a session leader of this terminal because it was the first one. And we put it in the foreground so he can, you know, we put it in the foreground. And then this guy forks. You can do, you can follow it, continue debugging it using set follow fork. Uh, no, set, detach, and fork off, for example. So you keep debugging both. 
and then the parent decides to exit. But this guy was the session leader. And I just explained to you, when the session leader exits, a CGUP is sent to everyone else. So this guy gets a CGUP, right? And processes normally aren't prepared for that, and the default action for CGUP is die. Not good. Um, so how do we fix this? Like in every, <laughs> within direction. <laughs> So we apply the double fork technique. It's something that, you know, standard in Unix to, to handle uh, sessions and terminal things. When you think about daemons, they, well, in the old days, they would do them, this themselves to get rid of the control terminal. Nowadays, you have um, systemd doing this for them. Uh, but basically, the idea is, well, my problem is that the first guy becomes a session leader, and it can exit. So the solution is just to put someone in the middle that never exits, and that guy becomes a session leader. So my debugs program doesn't have to see that problem anymore. So this is how normally GDB starts the process. It forks, so there are two, uh, and one and two are the terminals. Uh, no, sorry, are the processes. So process one, process two, fork, and then the child execs the shell, and we do this because we, you can pass arguments to the inferior, and you want shell globbing and variable expansion to happen, and you de delegate that to the shell. And then the shell execs your program, your inferior program, whatever you want to debug. So there's this dance going on behind the scenes. Um, and the problem was now that this guy became the session leader, so we add in direction, so we fork twice. So fork once as before, fork twice. This guy becomes a session leader. And now the shell, the same thing as here. Shell execs, this guy execs the shell, the shell execs the inferior. And this guy becomes a session leader. So you end up with three processes instead of two. So it's an implementation detail that will be visible in PS, if you care. Um, so there are, Question? Uh, yes, and then it puts GDB in the foreground, creates a process group for GDB, puts it in the foreground. Yes, exactly. Right. So, yeah, this session leader stuff is all about shells. Um, so, uh, yeah, I thought I'd, I'd mention this because this might be surprising to people that will see this now. We have three processes. Um, so, what happens now is we have a new session leader. This guy exits, and it's not special. This guy continues running, so there's no sig hub anymore, and things work as before, solved. Uh, of course, now we have to handle this guy. We have to keep it around. It's just a fork child of GDB. It has a really small loop that, that just waits until GDB wants to destroy the terminal. Um, and that's it. it could, the limitation of making it just a fork child is that this won't work with um, non-MMU systems because they only support v fork. We could, I didn't solve that. Uh, so for those systems, they will still use the old way. We could solve that by, by making this guy exec itself, like add a new command line switch to GDB, meaning GDB dash session, you know, go into session leader mode, just wait there forever, uh, and we'd solve that. And then we will be fork. Hmm? No. No, we can't. We can't. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, but uh, you know, uh, I would have no control at all what it's doing. 
right? That's a good point. I could I should investigate if I can do it. So basically, what I'm doing now is waiting for it, the child to exit, which is what the shell does. But I, that doesn't get a good point. I could try to investigate that. Um, of course, then it wouldn't work if if you do set startup with session off, with sorry, startup with shell off. Then there's no shell. So we need this. Right. Um, right. So I mentioned the run plus detach problem before, and this is what if we didn't have this double fork thing, what would happen is. Um, you detach, and you're basically telling GDB, I don't care about the inferior anymore, so I'm going to destroy the shell that I created, you know, to the, the terminal. You've told me that you don't care about debugging this process anymore, so I'm going to destroy the, ter the terminal. And this guy is a session leader, and it loses the terminal and gets a sick up and dies after you've detached it. Not good. So with the session leader in, GDB still destroys the terminal, but the session leader um, is a different guy, so there's no sig up here. The downside is that you did run plus detach, you've detached the process, and the process that you detach no longer has a terminal. So whatever it prints goes nowhere. Uh, you're not debugging it anymore, so nothing is forwarding input and output. The, the terminal was destroyed. Uh, what happens is that the process continues running anyhow, and output goes nowhere. But I claim that this is okay. This run plus detach scenario is uncommon. And to me, to me, if you run and de detach and expect output, that means you expect output to appear in GDB's terminal. So you should tell GDB that. And so we can do that workaround. And then the control C problem will not be important to you because you're probably attaching to the, uh, running the program tweaking some variable in memory and then detaching. Like some good global setting, you're hacking the you process and then detaching. So you're just going to detach, so it doesn't matter what, how Control-C uh, works. So that's one downside, which I claim is okay. All right, we went all this way, and all such that we can get the SIG into GDB first, right? But we still need to stop that process somehow, right? And we can't just send a SIGIN to stop it because it's blocked. So we need to stop it in a different way, um, right? Uh, maybe it's clearer. Here, we have to implement this. So the SIGIN goes here, and then GDB decides, stop this guy. How? How can we stop a process that blocks all the signals? No, much simpler. We have six stop. Six stop is special. There's no way to block six, six stop. You can block all the signals, but six stop always works. There's no way to set up a handler for six stop. Your process never sees it, ever. Um, the, so this is how GDB already stops processes internally. When you're saying in non-stop mode, and you use the interrupt command, and then goes through each and every thread and sends a six stop to each of them. So we already have this code inside GDB. We were just not making use of this, use of it in this situation. Um, so now we can reuse it. There's even a target hook method called target stop. Well, it's written there. No. Um, so uh, you will see a small difference. Uh, is that you type control C, GDB saw it, saw, got the SIGINT, decided to stop the process, and is no longer going to be stopping it with SIGINT, just going to do a pause, stop for no reason, just suspend the, the thread. So instead of getting this, you get this, which is already what you see with non-stop mode. Um, right, so if you really, really want to get the signal to your process, uh, sorry, the SIGINT to your process. You can still do it with the signal SIGINT or pass the SIGINT in the shell. Like, remember, I claim that control C is the supervisor thing, not really, when you type control C, you're not really thinking of 
I want my program to see a SIG and, and run the SIG and handler normally. Um, right, so these are details how it's handled internally. Um, the interesting thing is we can do new things if we have this. So in all stop mode, all stop mode is the default when something happens in your process, hits a breakpoint, receives a signal, everything stops, all, all of it stops. Um, currently, without all this magic, the thread that GDB selects and presents to you as the thread that got the signal is whatever the whatever was the thread that uh, where the signal was delivered to. Uh, and if 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 you don't have signals blocked in your main thread, typically it's a main thread. Um, but with this, because we control the stopping process, we can stop everything and then pick which of the threads should be the selected one. And so we can uh, pick whatever was previously selected when before the user you know, did like step or next, say next over sleep call and do control C. Now with this, we can present the stop in the same thread. So you, your focus will still, still be in the same spot. Small detail, but it's now possible. Uh, same thing in unstop mode, except well, we preserve the previous behavior of control C in unstop mode stops just one thread, that's what happens today, uh, just because the kernel sends a SIGINT to one of the threads and GDB presents that stop as a SIGINT stop and leaves everything else running because it's non-stop mode. But which thread gets a signal is up to the kernel. But with this, we can control which one of the threads gets stopped. Uh, we can select the, the one that was already selected. Uh, it's a little bit more user-friendly. But we could go beyond and do other things. So you're in non-stop mode and you type control C and because GDB has control of sees the second first, can decide to do whatever, it could decide to not stop anything at all, just give you the prompt again and everything continues running. That's one thing you could do. Uh, or we could do, second, or we could also stop everything in all stop mode if we wanted or maybe we can make it a setting and the user decides. The point is just that we now have this flexibility. Nathan. Um, yeah. But in non-stop mode, you can also, also do forward, process, forward commands. Right, so if you do, uh, in the CLI, if you do like C ampersand, then you're right. The second will, will reach GDB first. Uh, but if, if you do control, uh, sorry, C enter, then GDB still does that, put the inferior terminal settings how it wants and all of that. Uh, so the control C will still reach it first. Thank you. And that's basically it. Now, status. Uh, it's been a long process, actually. I think I prototyped this back in 2019, and then it got frozen. Never happened. And then last year, I revamped it and posted it to the list. Version 1 had some problems. It didn't, it didn't handle that session leader problem. Uh, and during discussions, I realized, you know, eh, I can actually fix it. So I don't have to explain it in a manual or you know, there's one downside left, uh, less or fewer. Uh, so I, I posted a V2. That's the latest version that I posted. So it's been over a year. Um, and I want to post it again soon. Uh, I'm trying to keep this at least once per year. <laughs> no, no, uh, all seriousness. Uh, I want to put, repost this again pretty soon. It's blocked because there's a little bit of work that I need to do. Uh, there, there, was, there was review comments in this version that I never had a chance to go back to. Um, some details around when you're debugging Emacs, but Emacs uses Control C for something else. So Emacs does that thing that I mentioned in, in the beginning of changing the interrupt key to something else. It changes it to Control G. Uh, and I'm to, so 
uh, person debugging Emacs expects that when they type control C, it will be a normal Emacs control C, control X, control C, control Q, whatever. It's just an action in Emacs. It doesn't expect a suspension. Um, but because now we always over override control C, what will happen is even though Emacs in its own terminal said, I want my interrupt key to be G, control C will still stop it. Um, and that's not very convenient, I was told. So I thought I'm going to be adding a new command, a new knob to GB to be able, so that the user can specify what is the supervisor key. So that uh, in um, Emacs's .gdb file, they, they can do set interrupt character G, and then Control C will start working normally again. And again, 10 minutes, and done. Thank you. Questions? I'm not sure we have time. Uh, yeah. No, because it's invasive, and we want to go stream first and then fetch it down. Uh, yeah. Thank you very much. Seems to be working. Je to mute. Teda není, ale je to... Okay. And now it's unmuted. 
and yeah. you can. So does it go, if I don't talk for too long, does it go mute by itself? No. no. Unless you press it again. Yeah. So Hi everyone, so we'll talk about CDF frame format now. Um, my name is Indu. Uh, this is a joint um, work contribution by two people, myself and Vayman Pan. Both of us are uh, in the Linux toolchain team at Oracle. Um, for much of the last year, we have been working on the CDF frame format and its implementation in binutils. Um, and we have gotten feedback from people inside and outside of Oracle. It's been really helpful, so thank you. Um, so today, let's talk a little bit. Let's start off by just um, talking about what are the use cases of backtracing out in the wild, and what are the requirements. So as you look at different use cases, you see that the requirements really are very different. And, um, and I talk about all that so that I can put CTF frame in perspective and hopefully give you an idea about the value proposition of CTF frame format. And then I'll talk about the implementation aspects in bin utils. And you can ask questions throughout the presentation, but maybe we take them at each of these you know, different snapshots or checkpoints. Um, and towards the end, we can, we'll talk about next steps. So any feedback, good, bad, ugly, it's all good. So um, yeah. So in general, you see that there are a lot of um, the different use cases of backtracing. You see profilers, crash reporters, or say debuggers. And um, so I categorize them into these two different categories just to set a perspective. Um, so the use cases of online backtracers are where the application is in a production-like environment. And any cost that you incur for unwinding, is um, it affects the application. So cost in terms of CPU, of course, and any memory. So you might have to load some extra debug sections. Um, if at all, you need to go to you know, maybe like debug information for call sites and stuff. So all those costs of CPU and memory add up and affect the running application. In the case of offline, this doesn't seem to be the case. Um, 
offline is more like off, you know, um, after the fact sort of analysis, um, and debuggers fall in this category. So then let's talk about what are the common requirements for um, online backtracers. So in all these cases, asynchronousity is important. You do want to backtrace from any given PC all the time. Well, okay, let's define it like that. And then uh, the unwinder itself needs to be very fast and precise. And in some cases, precision is very important. For example, for live patching, um, you do want the backtraces to be really reliable. If not, maybe have a method to you know mark it or so. And uh, so this row of this, this requirement of fast, precise, asynchronous basically translates to saying that um, the requirement really is to have a small unwinder, and preferably small debug info. And, and now contrasted to the use cases of offline um, backtracers. So here I put all of these in a um, I I, def I uh, categorize them as good to have. Now this is also, well, maybe arguable because, I don't know, asynchronous, you, 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 lose the, you lose the usefulness of backtraces pretty quickly as soon as you lose some asynchronicity. But irrespective of that, I think the point that I want to convey in this slide is that there are really a variety of backtracers out there, that, a variety of use cases where you want to backtrace. And if you look at the use cases of online backtracers, the requirements are much more stringent. And this is where CDF frame would like to help out. And the last row that I put here is the requirement of original value of backtracers. Oh, sorry, original value of arguments. Um, some backtracers, uh, some applications that we know of have, re have requested this feature. So we want to target it as well. And uh, so that's why I also put it in online, because that use case that we know of is an online backtracer. And it will be good to support that requirement. So having said that, um, there are current solutions, right? We know of current solutions. Frame pointers used to be the one. And then now we have mostly EH frame-based uh, backtracers. But the usual complaint against uh, EH frame-based um, backtracers is that they are slow and they are large. So usually when you want to unwind using the debug information contained in these EH frame sections, you need to have a small stack machine implementation that can uh, interpret these dwarf opcodes, figure out the stack offsets, and then unwind. So this whole activity becomes a little bit more CPU intensive than desirable. And um, now let's look at the requirement where you want to figure out the original value of the arguments. So in those, whenever you do want to then figure out the original value of the arguments, it gets difficult. Because now for the, the state of the art here for original value of the arguments is um, going to debug info section, for example, and getting call site um, data. So it gets difficult combined with all of this. It gets difficult to um, backtrace using EH frame. And this is leading to a pattern that can be seen across applications, which where uh, many of these applications are coming up with their own unwind format. And uh, adopting a solution where the generation of these unwind formats is out of the tool chain, right? And this is, uh, this is so so far I've come across three different, but I'm, I bet there are more, um, three different, you know, different um, unwind formats, um, ad hoc unwind formats, which are not supported in tool chain. But the use case is plain vanilla backtracing, plain vanilla stack unwinding. Do not recover the state, but just give me, you know, uh, the return, just walk the stack and just tell me where the execution stack was at different points in time. So the issues with these ad hoc formats, as I said, are not very hard to you know, uh, guess. Um, so most of these solutions that have adopted their own unwind formats have uh, a mechanism where they actually use their own um, tool sets to reverse engineer the binaries. and. Yes, so there are, there are going to be problems with that. So the way to do it, the way they would do it is go to the binary, figure, decode the instructions, figure out the stack usages, and so on. So at some point, yeah, you go from one architecture to the next, you have a problem. And at some point, you'll say, oh, I need to figure out the control flow. Well, you have a second problem. And then, yeah, in some solutions, we have seen that there are these um, code patterns that they will try to um, 
it's almost like pattern matching. So you figure out a few specific sequences of instructions, and then you take some action based on that, and basically learn that if this is the pattern, I bet I have to unwind it like this. So this, all of this makes it very, a big ordeal to, un, to simply unwind, right? And um, it is clear when you look at all of these different the different, you know, unwind formats and the solutions that these applications are adopting. That the unwind format, the unwind metadata has to be generated in the tool chain, right? It is the best suited entity to generate um, the unwind metadata. So this is where CDF frame format fits in. So thinking here is that if you can tap these requirements and come up with a format supported in tool chain it ought to help these um, applications for just backtracing. So the requirements that CTF frame aims to target is um, the allow for, have a, C, have a format which allows you to um, unwind from, well, backtrace from any instruction. Uh, keep the format simple and compact. So do not have any complex expression encodings and no stack machine so that the unwinding business itself is simple and easy. And with original value of the arguments at the point of function call. Now, as I talk about CTF frame format today, please note that this, um, this support for original value of the arguments is not included in the specification at this time. But I do plan to get to this soon. And the thinking, so I do realize that um, adding support for this can go either way, but as, as in it can get complicated pretty quickly on the format. So the thinking here that I have is maybe we first try with something like an additional offset. And uh, the, the, so the original value of the arguments are saved onto the stack. If the application so desires to recover the original value of the arguments, have the application save them to the stack and somehow just convey in the unwind format that this is where your um, Original, val original value of the arguments are. So that's my uh, take at this time, but I will of course discuss as this evolves. And um, so that's it. So hopefully at this point I have conveyed um, the problem space and where is it that CTF frame can help. And now we discuss how is it that it can help. So I'll discuss the unwind format. So a CTF frame, um, it's a simple unwind format for virtual stack unwinding, only backtracing. So it only allows you to recover the minimal necessary state. So CFA, FP, the frame pointer, and the RA. So by frame pointer, I mean it could be either RBP, you know, on x86 or LR on AR64 and so on. So, uh, and the important thing to keep in mind here is that if you just want to do the plain vanilla unwinding, you do not need to go to the CTF type um, debug section. These two are going to be um, independent of each other. When we do provide the information to recover the original value of the arguments, maybe the unwinders and the users might want to figure out, okay, what are the types of the things that I've just read from memory? In those cases, yeah, you may want to go to CTF, but for plain vanilla unwinding and maybe even recovering the original value, CDF frame unwind section should be enough. And at this time, the support is only for x86-64 and um, AR-64. This one? Um, if, if CTF frame is meant to be separate from CTF, why do you have such similar names? Why don't have a completely different name? Yes, I've, I have done mental exercises on this, why, and so the, the, argument, the thinking here is that at some point you'll go to the CTF section for figuring out the types. That's when the association makes sense, that one of the thing. And the second is that in principle, we do want to follow the similar things that CTF tries to do, as in just encode the minimal necessary information that is needed for those use cases, right? So, First is just, yeah, it's, it's in principle similar. And second is that you will go tie up with CTF in cases. But I'm not tied to it. Yeah, it makes sense if, if we want to rename it to something more meaningful. I think it's, it still works. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. Yeah. 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 No, it's not. No. Yeah, we could just name it to something as simple as yeah, just unwind or backtrace or something minimal. True. So. Yeah, so let's get into further details about what the format looks like. So um, there is a new section that has been added. This is the dot uh, .ctf frame section. Uh, this is an allocated section, and it appears in a segment of its own, so the unwinder can start quickly. The CTF frame section, if you look at it, and if you had previously seen CTF sections, you will see some similarities between the way information is laid out. Uh, so there are three main subsections in a CDF frame, the CDF frame header, the CDF frame, um, the function descriptor entry subsection, and there is a CDF frame row entry subsection. I will get into the details maybe, yeah, yeah, so okay, so let's look at the, so uh, maybe diagrammatically it's, uh, yeah, this is a better slide, so CDF frame header, and then the function descriptor entries, and then the frame row entries. Um, let's just, uh, yeah, so let's just say that in, from this slide, the main takeaway is that the way to go around getting information from CTF frame is that you follow offsets, right? So, give, so you first land at the header if you want to go figure out where is the unwind information for a function. So you figure out the, uh, the offset of the FDE where all the function information is stored, and inside this FDE you have the offset for the, you know, the back, the, the, the unwind information exactly here. So, yeah, I think the only takeaway from this slide for now is information is organized in these three different subsections, and the way to recover information is usually, no, it's always using uh, offsets. So CTF frame header contains very, um, yeah, basic information, which is that first it identifies what is the ABI or the architecture that you're working with. So it, at this time, it identifies three of these flavors. Um, there is a flag, the flag, um, eight bits for the flag. At this time, there are two flags. One of them says, the first one is CDF frame uh, F, FDE sorted, which basically says that the, uh, the function descriptor entries in this section are sorted on the start PC. And the second is F frame pointer. Now I added this and my thinking was, um, isn't it useful for the unwinders to know that the application had been compiled with frame pointer. So I thought it was, and I added it, but my trouble here right now is that I have no way of generating it in the assembler because the assembler doesn't know. Um, uh, so if you have some solutions there, or if you think this is not so useful, then we can take a second you know, opinion on this. <laughs> so moving on. There is the CTF function descriptor entry. So think of this, uh, so this is, I think Dwarf also calls the frame descriptor and uh, the FDEs, so this is very similar. In principle, it wants to convey the same, similar information that at a function level, what do you need to know to unwind, right? So in this case, what you convey in the function descriptor entry is um, what is the function size and bytes, what is the start PC, and what is the FRE type? We will talk about this FRE type, so basically think of different encodings that are allowed in the format for an FRE, and at this level you identify, okay, what is it that I'm going to see in the memory, and the number of FREs. Again, let's wait for a bit, we'll figure out what FRE is. This is a fixed length encoding, and this allows the unwinder to quickly do a binary search if you want to figure out, you know, if the, if, when the unwinder wants to know where is the unwind information. Um, yes, so CDF frame row entry, um, it's a variable length entry, and uh, what it tells you is the following. So for a range of addresses, for a range of addresses starting at a specific offset, how is it that I should unwind? And the only thing that it gives you is uh, the offset. So it tells you these are the stack offsets from where you can recover the CFA or FP or the return address, right? So it is a self-sufficient record. It is a self-sufficient record that contains this unwind information, and it is for a range of contiguous addresses. Now, you may note that I do say RA offset, but for some architectures, you don't need that offset because, say, for x86, you know that this is uh, going to be saved on the uh, stack always, so 
you know, so once you recover the CFA, then it's known where the RA is going to be. So, yes, yeah, so this, now I'm getting into more, you know, precision around how we have encoded the CTF frame row entry data structure. So basically there are two of these knobs using which you try to make it as compact as possible. So think of a function where, you know, so you know how large is this function is going to be. So if it is small, then you can also, so you can use the number of bits uh, needed to encode the addresses um, based on the size of the function. So that's the first knob. So you figure out what, how many bits do I need to encode this uh, address offset. So you have a choice between one byte, two byte, and four byte. And the second sort of knob is the stack frame offsets. So also a function may not go into you know, large areas of the stack offset. And once it is known how much is that range, you can pick a accordingly sized offset. So uh, OK, so tying it all together, we know that there are these three knobs you can play around, So, which is why there are three of these uh, different data structures. They are very similar looking. But the way they vary is um, in the number of bits that you use to encode the address. So I'm using a GNU pickle poke pickle here. It has been lifesaver throughout, so <laughs> it's also lifesaver here. It conveys clearly what is it that the CTF FRE looks like. So, the, so this is the uh, CTF FRE address one, which basically says that the, for start addresses, I'm going to use just eight bits. And after, and the, after that, there is a fixed length structure, which is FRE info. So think of this, again, as some sort of metadata that you need to know as you go on to read these um, offsets. So these are the three stack offsets. And basically, what will appear is either all 8-bit offsets or all 16-bit or all 32. So these are the stack offsets using which you recover the CFA, FB, and RA. Right? So this is address 1. And again, the second data structure is for 16-bit addresses um, in the function. And address 4 is 32 bits. So um, yeah. So with this, I hope I have given you some understanding of the format. So we tie it up all together. So we saw that there were three of these subsections. Um, the header, we talked about what is, the F, what is the FDE, the function descriptor entry, what does it look like? And then we saw what, are, what is the data structures that you could use for, how is the FRE representation? So um, now what we add in this uh, slide here is how is it that the information lookup is done, and how do you make it fast? So first is this, that the CTF FDEs are in ascending order of start PC. So this essentially serves the same purpose as each frame header, right? So it allows you, it's an index. It allows you to uh, quickly find out where the information, where the unwind information is going to lie. And the second thing that you note here is that the FREs of a function are always contiguous. Well, yeah. And so the way to land to an FRE is when you have an FTE, it gives you the offset of where the FREs are going to lie for that function. Now, a function may have variable number of FREs, of course, right, depending on how it changes the stack as the control flow in it changes. And there is no necessity for, so if the FDEs are in a specific order, there is no necessity that the FREs be also in the same order. The, the only, limit, the only um, constraint here is that, sure, the FREs of a function have to be together. So it's not really a limitation per se, but it's just I'm saying it out loud so that you know, some of these things are clearer as we go. So with that said, there, we talked right now about the CTF frame format. This is being uh, specified in the CDF frame header, the definition you can see in the CDF frame header at this, po at this point. And there is also GNU poke pickles. It could use some more documentation, but it is up to date. Definition wise, it's up to date. It could use some more comments, which I will add. Uh, so we talked about CDF frame format, why, it's, why it can solve some of these problems and how it can solve some of these problems, right? Uh, it's, a sm it's a simple unwind format that allows you to just simply, you know, it's fast and simple to backtrace. Um, before I wrap up this part of the section, I do want to share this slide. And with this, I do not want to convey any, anything like this is way smaller than EHFrame or not. Uh, EHFrame is great at what it does. It's very compact. So the, when I started working on the CDF frame stuff, I was a bit worried that because this 
for Matt encoding looks like interpreted dwarf, is it going to be too large or where is it going to land? So if it is large, then we still have to think twice about it. Um, so it is in a reasonable ballpark. So these numbers are basically I compiled bin utils with CTF frame support and the linker is merging these uh, the linker is merging the CTF frame sections, and what I see is an average of point a, so 0 0.80, and for AR64, it's 0 0.7. There is a gotcha in case of AR64 in the sense that I haven't dealt with PLT or the veneer. So the unwind information for PLT and veneer in case of AR64 is not being generated, but I will get to that. But on x86, though, it is being done. So it seems that it is generating CTF frame section information for most of the code out there. So it looks promising, it looks reasonable range, so uh, it's good. So tying it up all together, we see that there are some of these application specific proposals that are out there. There is CTF frame that we talked about today and we know of dwarf based solution which is based on EH frame. So I just want to put it all together and just give you a perspective of where do all of these uh, lie. So asynchronousity, um, dwarf is great, it just does it perfectly. Um, for CTF frame, I do want to point out that it is almost asynchronous. I do have a slide, we'll talk about it, but it is close. I do skip some CFI directives, but I think it's very close. Um, for application specific proposals, I said a yes with a star because often, so from what I have seen for these application specific proposals is that uh, by de specification wise, these formats are asynchronous, but because these um, applications are generating these, this format in, in an offline scenario where uh, as in you do, you, you use you do some reverse engineering on the boundary, you do skip some constructs and you don't un generate unwind information for the complete application, which is why they start falling into the, you know, almost asynchronous range again. So, uh, and then fast, um, CTF frame does provide you fast unwinder, unwinding mechanism. Um, it's, the unwind info itself is small. Um, and application specific CDF is not application specific, but the other application specific proposals, well, two of them that I know of are application specific. There is always some construct which ties them to the application. And it's not a, well, it's not a bad idea. If you know of your application, you have some quirks, sure, exploit it. But it doesn't translate well as in, yeah, you have all these problems of this bifurcating space of so many unwind formats and then, you know, at some point your generation logic just, you hit a, you hit a bottleneck as in scaling your um, generation logic and so on. Um, yeah, so which is why I, which is what I want to get at mainly is that the, mo the value proposition here is that the CDF frame format is being generated in the tool chain. So all of those problems are actually taken care of provided you still are interested in only these two architectures, of course, yeah. <laughs> so it's, um, uh, yeah, uh, but we could we could talk about it. Like we could see what other architectures may need, and we can extend this. But at least at least it's a first right step of doing it in the tool chain. I think. Um, so with that, I'm going to move to the implementation status. If there are any questions around the format in general. Um, So my, my assumption is that the reason you can have uh, the, the size savings of 20% in, in the CTF format is because you're not representing any other registers. And so it seems like you're proposing to increase the, the size of the loaded uh, unwind information by 80%. By 80%, no, but, um, but yes, if you look at it from that perspective, it is increased on metadata, but because the two formats are so different, this is bound to happen, right? So unless you do it in an interpreted, unless you store the stack offsets directly, it's going to be costly, and that's the whole reasoning why, why it ends up being CPU intensive as you unwind using EH frame. So... 
have you looked at y using only the parts of the EA frame that define uh, the CFA PC? And uh, I wonder how far you get with that. So. So your question is, if you just use the unwind, if you just use the CFA, FP, and RA stuff from the EH frame, right? So yes, so you, you do need to write an unwinder. So whatever feedback we have had, and the reason why we got into designing all this is the main argument there was, can we do something without the stack machine? Now, I haven't done any measurements. Um, well, uh, Why, what, what the specific objection to a stack machine is. I mean, that's I, it's a particular representation. Uh, the, the specific dwarf unwind information mostly doesn't, doesn't mess with uh, the dwarf location uh, stack machine at all, only in, only in uh, corner cases. Mostly you say, uh, at this point, the CFA is in this register. That's that's looking through the table at the so you do need to execute these dwarf opcodes right to figure out these stack offsets so that's one of the argument that this is a cpu intensive activity and maybe if there is a simpler way to do it just give me the offset somehow so then this is taken care of right so as an so this reduces your overall cost that you will incur to unwind, that's one. And I was about to say something more to it, and I, I forget. So we were, uh, yeah, I, I had to add something more there, but I, it, it will come back to me, and then I'll <laughs> come back to you. Hmm. Um, if, if a function gets split over multiple address ranges, say a hot section and a cold section, does the format capture that? Yes. Yes. So, so, so for whatever start proc, end proc tuples that you have, it will generate an FDE. So, it will, and so in that sense, it is oblivious to saying this is the function boundary. It just says these are the contiguous ranges that I think are you know, blocks of contiguous, it's, it's piece of a function so to speak, and this is the unwind information for it. Um, yeah. Yes, so coming to, I, I know what came to my mind. So I, I uh, there is a use case, um, which is system-wide profiling via BPF. Now for that, um, BPF has a lot of restrictions in terms of what you can run. The verifier doesn't accept much of it, and I think Jose can also add on to that. So in that, I think it is very unlikely that we can run an EH frame-based unwinder. Why? Because I think there it'll, be, it'll get difficult to estimate what is it that the memory size, what is it, what is the stack size that I should assign for this activity, right? So, and I have run into a couple of entities which are interested in just doing that. So how would you do that if you do not have something like a simple unwind format that just lets you agree that if you want to do something like system-wide profiling via BPF, you, are, you do have to go to your customers asking to compile all your applications with CTF frame if, if this is what solves their problem. So that exists, yes. Um, but. I know it sounds like weird, and actually it is. Uh, but that's how the real world is. It's scary and weird. Um, the kernel used to have a Dorf unwinder, Dorf based unwinder. They removed it for whatever reasons. I'm not getting into that because I don't know the details, and I don't know. I was not there at the time. So currently, what they do is that they um, to unwind uh, kernel code, they have a, a tool called Object Tool, that, which is one of those other specific application specific proposals to say that um, reverse engineer the unwind information from the object files. And it puts, it encodes that the backing, that unwind information into 
a new format that the kernel hackers designed called ORC. Now, this is reverse engineered from the object, from the instructions. They look at the functions, they reconstruct the control flow graph, they do all that. Why don't they do that from the world? Yeah, well, um, nah, nah. The thing is that this ORC format, which is not that unsimilar from City of Frame, is actually kernel specific because it relies on things like, oh, in the kernel we don't have functions bigger than this, for example. So now they have an ORC and winder in the kernel, which is trusted and it is simple because it's a very simple format to unwind. Now, the problem they have now, as far as we know, is what happens if you want to unwind the user land stacks in the kernel. Right? And this is the use case that we have been, we have been talked about recently of people who want to unwind the user land stacks from the kernel. Now you will say, okay, let's use the edge frame. How? You will not get an edge frame based on winder in the kernel because they removed it for whatever reasons they had. I don't think they have changed their mind. The, you cannot use ORC because ORC is kernel specific. It has size limitations. So, sorry? Yeah, they also, yeah, they, uh, they also try to support ARM. I think they are having problems with that. Have to make some changes to get to ARC support, but yes. At this time, it's, it's, it is um, at so, Yeah, so now, well, just to finish. So they were thinking, okay, let's do, for, I, with, I don't know why, but they mentioned to do, this, to do this using BPF programs, right? So um, we, actually, we are not 100% sure that it is actually possible to write a BPF program that can unwind CTF frame and pass the verifier in the kernel. But uh, each frame, no way. No way. It is too complicated for, for something like this, for the verifier. Yeah. Also, there is memory allocation. I think we can unwind the CTF frame with, with, without allocating memory, which is also something that can, in some situations, yeah. Yes, that's true, yeah. So is the big advantage of this format then that once you find the correct um, FRE, that pretty much that has all the information that you need to figure out where the CFA is and the, uh, the return address, as opposed to um, EH frame where you have to start at the beginning of the list and go through until you find the appropriate instruction? So pretty much it's doing that, I guess, that decode, so it's just a, a single lookup rather than stepping through. So memory traversal-wise, um, you will go to the FREs one after the other, but you won't read all the contents of the FRE, but because it's a variable length FRE, you have to land at the first place, read something, and then skip some bytes and so on. So there are memory accesses, but you're not executing any opcodes. In case of EH frame, you will execute, so because that's the... Uh, so uh, one question is uh, for the producers, you have a uh, compiler now producing CTF. Do you have also assembler directives because for for dwarf frame info, uh, we have a lot of uh, handwritten assembly assembly with, with uh, unwind information in it, for instance, in glibc. So yes, uh, I will talk about the implementation aspects next, but this is a, there is a new command line argument that's passed to assembler, and which will, basically what it will do is process all the CFI directives and generate CTF frame. So it's not a, so does that answer it? It's an additional um, command line argument and a directive. So if you have handwritten assembly with um, CFI directives, it should still flow fine, and you should have CTF frame information for it, just like you had EH frame information for it. The assembler generated it and linker did the necessary. Similar flow should work, does work for. Um, 
I don't know, do I have to go back to answer? <laughs> Sorry. Uh, well, uh, I, I wanted to get whether you have um, something that creates CTF from, from dwarf unwind information, because at that point it would be interesting to see how big coverage of what dwarf actually, uh, what uh, dwarf unwind information we actually have in libraries like glibc can actually this format handle because uh, dwarf unwind information is, is pretty simple for the most cases, even trivial. Uh, but uh, it's it's complex because it can handle the very complex cases like uh, swap context and stuff like that in glibc, or for instance AVX dynamic stack reallocation uh, or alignment. Where, where you need to use extra registers and dynamically uh, adjust the yeah, align the stack stack pointer. So can can CTF handle those cases? So representation wise, um, representation wise. So I, I, I do not know the specifics of the cases you just mentioned, but representation-wise, I think it can. Is that a true statement, do you think? So, so the question, so if you just, so the, I'll put the question differently. If you just, if you have means to, to clearly indicate that this is how to recover CFA, FP, and RA, is that sufficient, or do you need some other, like, so there are some things that are implicit here, which is that for x86, once you figure out the CFA, the RA has to be on the stack. So this, these assumptions, so if these are not violated, CTF frame can represent it. That will not work, no. No, no, no. Hi, so, can, you, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, great. Uh, at least on PowerPC, uh, the, the return address can be in any general purpose register. Yes. Always. Yes. So at this time, we are only supporting x86-64 and AR-64. So... Right, but you want to support everything, right? If there is need for it, we can work it out. But if, yeah. So if that is the case, then you will have to extend and represent um, the different registers, then it's just similar to, to Dwarf, and then yeah. I think it'll lose its, um, it'll lose the whole um, advantage, uh, okay. because it is broken. Right, exactly. Yeah. Well, it, we can try, but the, the, the size of this information will just go way high up, yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, maybe I go on quickly to just discuss the implementation. I have 15 minutes, and um, uh, we added, we have patches that we posted for support in the assembler linker, OBJ dump, and readelf. Um, V6 patches were posted and reviewed. I have to work on them. I will um, as soon as I get back. And uh, most of the review comments have been taken care of, but I have a few things to do there. So the GCC side of it, it hasn't been done yet, but the thing that I have to do now is there was the CTF info level one, and which, which can be tied to, which will be tied to CTF frame information, and all that the compiler will need to do there is generate something like CFI sections uh, CTF frame. And I'm assuming even for other debug, and even for other unwind information, you do enable the F uh, asynchronous unwind and so on, so that's something similar here. But this patch is not yet done, and I haven't posted it. What is done is, some, is all that the binutils needs to do, which is that in assembler, we added a new um, command line argument, which is minus minus gctf frame, um, which generates a ctf frame section. The linker merges as necessary, and obj dump read of support. Um, so there, there do remain two ways to create the CTF frame section. One is minus minus GCTF frame, and the other is to give the directive, which the compiler will do once the support is in. Um, internally, in the assembler, the CTF frame generation logic feeds off the internal dwarf structure. So once the assembler has done processing the CFI directives, it generates the internal dwarf representation, like these data structures, and then CTF frame generator kicks in, and it translates the information and dumps out the CTF frame unwind information. There is, a, there is an optimization that's put in place, which basically is 
the selection logic for FREs. So you saw how the different FREs vary in size, and it's only done using uh, you know fragment fix-up because at the point that you generated these fragments, you didn't know how long these have to be, so you fix it up. So yeah, short summary being um, there is a small there is an optimization at this time which is enabled for both AR64 and XCD664 targets, and uh, what it does is it fixes up the length of bits that you need to encode a couple of uh, bits of data in the CTF frame section. Uh, now, this is the asynchronicity part. I think it's important I talk it out and get some feedback from you folks. Um, there are some of these CFI directors which are just skipped for CTF frame generation. Um, some of it is harmless, right? Because CTF frame says that I'm going to only give you enough information for plain vanilla backtracing. So some of it, some of the information you skip, and that's okay. But the information that you should not skip, and which is what is making it asynchronous at this time, is this CFI escape. Now the cases when the compiler does generate CFI escape, um, I did not have an easy way to, you know, parse it and process it in the assembler. At this time, I have skipped it, but I think there can be a middle ground where I can go process some simple CFI escape uh, you know, directives. But for the complex ones, I still have no solution in mind. And for the negate RA state, this affects AR64 only, right? Um, and um, basically, this says that if what you stored on the stack, if the return address on the stack is encrypt, is, is, has some sign bits on the higher side, then there are CFI directives that tell the unwinder that as you go about, read something from the stack, uh, just take care that the upper bits are, are not addressed exactly. So this is again not supported, which means that if your program has uh, these pack, the pack use pack in star instructions, then there will be a CFI RA escape and CTF frame will not be generated at all for that function block. And this is, this, these are the two cases where it's making it asynchronous. Um, again, I, that's why I just said almost, because it seems close, but uh, it won't be fair if I say it's fully asynchronous. So if you know of something that can help us out here, again, much appreciated. And so, so implementation, again, what the patches do provide is a library. Um, this library interface is given and includes CTF frame API, and it helps you encode and decode and dump it in textual format. Um, the usual stuff, so it gives you these access APIs. So given a PC, you can quickly find the FRE, well, you can find the FRE, and then given an FRE, you have APIs to say what is the, what are all of these offsets. Um, this library is used by the linker and also the CTF frame unwinder, so we have written a small Vimin has written a small uh, unwinder which sits in the, uh, which, is, which is provided via libctf backtrace. It allows you to unwind using um, CTF frame section. I will talk about libctf backtrace. I do have some questions there, as in where does it sit exactly? Where should it sit? Um, linker implementation, I think we can skip. It's straightforward. It just says that, you know, as a linker merges these input sections, it also makes sure that these FDEs are in sorted order, so the unwinder can, you know, work about it quickly. Uh, it sets the city FFRE F FDE sorted flag, and um, that's it. On x86, we do generate unwind information for PLT. This there remains a to do for AR64. I will get to it and veneers as well on x86 on AR64. Redux support and OBJDM support and small output. It's just, um, yeah, usual stuff. Uh, for CDF backtrace, there is this. So there is this library, which, uh, which. So the code sits in Benutil's libctf frame, sure, and the test suite is in libctf frame test suite libctf frame unwind. So there has been, a, there is some unease um, in just say, in just saying that there is an unwind library which is, you know. Which is uh, which sits in the code like this, which is still fine. But the trouble here is that we generate this SO only when the um, assembler supports this GCTF frame because the unwinding because some these APIs in the unwind library themselves need CTF frame information. So which makes the whole testing and deployment quite a bit difficult. And um, okay, the slides are not in the same order I was as I wanted, but. Um, 
So, yeah, this is one of the questions that I had. So what is the ideal place for something like an unwinder which is based on CTF frame? Uh, LibCTF backtrace doesn't seem to be a very ideal place. Maybe libunwind or maybe libbacktrace. So between these two, I, we, what is it that there is a you know, general feeling on what one should we try? So the trouble with libbacktrace is that it seems to be for symbolic backtraces, and it seems to serve the case where you want a little more informative backtrace. And for libunwind, well, this isn't really unwind. This is just you know simple vanilla backtracing. So either way, there is some dil dilu dilution to to the purpose of these libraries, but it needs to sit somewhere else. It's at least my opinion. So if you have any ideas on that, um, it'll be welcome. But so going back to what libctf frame libctf backtrace library gives you is this API called CTF backtrace. So you provide it a buffer of a specific size, and it returns, it fills up this buffer uh, and returns you what size, what is the number of records that it has filled up with, basically just PCs. And it sets an error point error code if there is any error. And um, Um, yeah, so if there are any questions, I can take them, but otherwise I'll go talk about what I see as my next steps, immediate ones. If you find the format useful or not, just give us any feedback there. And um, so, okay, sure, I'll continue with the next steps. So I do have to get to these patches and, you know, fix up some things and address the review comments. Um, the specification document will come. I do want to get to writing something like what we did for CTF, so it's clear and you know, uh, helps anyone who is reading or working on this format. Uh, for AR64, I do want to get to these two items because there seem to be some interest even in the, uh, uh, the Linux kernel guys. So I'll try it out. And at some point, I do want to see how all of this works out on AR64 once, you know, um, this support is in. Um, after all of this has settled and um, we want to get into adding support for recovering original value of the arguments. So uh, there were some proposals uh, out there which were basically uh, arguing for adding an additional column in EH frame. I think that also fits with this here that maybe you know we, we, we follow with adding additional support in CTF frame because I think it keeps the whole thing very compact and easily, um, easily recoverable um, original value of the arguments. And I think that is all I have. If you have questions, we can take them. You mentioned uh, supporting this in BPF. Does that mean that you're thinking about getting this into like the kernel for doing the uh, sampling uh, backtraces then? Is that one of your next steps there? Or? So uh, at least. Uh, so if, if, it, if that is one of the next steps, somebody will have to you know, jump in and try it out. But the only intention that I had was to try it out if it works for that use case, which is that I do want to try if I can unwind user space, stacks, user space stack traces. So that will be my first step. I could try also via BPF. But then that's the next step, because BPF has more restrictions. And, and then if it goes to other use cases that you want to sample or you know, collect more stack traces for other purposes, uh, sure. At least I was wanting to go one by one, and that seems to be you know, the next in line after the first two things. So for recovering the original arguments, you think that users are going to be willing to to accept the cost of all the extra act stack space in each in each call to a function? We have, yeah. So at least they are interested. Now, there is an obvious argument there. People will say, you know, yeah, users might say that this is not something I want to do for sure. We have a solution already for that space, right? If you don't want to use it, EH frame works very well, right? It just, um, it's best suited there. But if you do want to pay that overhead, there is this option you could use. Yeah. In fact, even so, this saving on stack space is orthogonal. You, at some point, it might also be a good idea for adding it to EH frame. And in that way, maybe some of the, I don't know. So you were comment, you were 
hinting at that, so I'm not sure if I make that statement, it's true. So if you do have a stack offset, which tells you where, the st where these arguments lie on stack, maybe some of the overhead of unwinding that people complain about is now that argument goes void because you do not have to recover using EH frame, you can go recover via. I don't know, so yeah, it's, it's just a supposition at this time and maybe it'll help. Unwinded. Where, where to put it? Uh, there is a, this lib backtrace in Binutils that, to be honest, I did not know it existed until I looked. Um, I think it's only used by GDB. Is it used by GDB? So, so you, you've, got right, you've, you've got your FREs, right, which are variable length at the moment. I was wondering if you could make them fixed length and also um, so the, the variable part, you actually have no, another level in direction. You move that off, right? So you have a fixed length FRE and in, in the f FDE, the function, you say how many FREs there are uh, and the FREs are address sorted. So then you don't need to go through scanning one by one by one to find the one you want. You, know, you, you do a simple binary sort or something to find the actual entry. So you speed up the lookup that way. And because the, they're fixed sizes, you just leap about. And I suspect that um, the information about where to find the CFA and the RA is going to be similar for lots of different functions. So you don't have to record that information lots of time. So you make the f file format smaller. Well, the, the so I also thought about it. I had it in my mind, too, that maybe it's a better way. So yeah, I think what you're saying is the same thing, which is that, as you see, most of the time, many functions will have a similar looking offset. So what you can do is make this um, fixed size, make the first part fixed size, and have an additional subsection where you store these, all of these offsets. Yes, it will make it much more compact because this information is highly repetitive, and there is a good amount of it that can be just pruned off. If I, have to, if I can, and I, I think I want to say a number, it will be at least 50% down, for sure, minimal. So it will turn it down, but yeah, we could try it. And there will just be one more memory access additional to get to that, you know, you use that in direction, but that's fine. Yes. 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 I'll have to see because the assembler is very um, specific in the way it generates stuff and then keeping a map of stuff, it just, yeah, I'll have to think about it. If it's easy enough to do in the assembler, I had it in mind, on my mind too. Yes, thank you. Yeah. Can you unwind through PLT slot? Because that's, that's quite complex. Uh, at least in, in dwarf uh, frame information, it's, it's very complex dwarf expression that allows you to comp 
compute who actually called you. So interesting. I didn't cover that at all. But there is an encoding that we put in. Um, there is an encoding enhancement that we put in just for PLT. So yeah, for PLT, yeah, dwarf encodes is in a CFI expression. But the expression itself is easy in the sense that you can encode that whether the addresses are so. Yeah, dwarf encodes is in an expression. So we took we took it on CDF frame format then to add an additional enhancement so you can encode that information still in a small size. So there is an additional bit that identifies that this FRE is for PLT. And instead of this being an offset, treat it as a mask. So just like for EPLT, for on x86, what you say is um, you, add, you see the last two bits, right? So you see, there is a pattern of instruction. So basically, you just encode it, saying that rather than treating offset, treat it as a mask. So that gives you that striding pattern. So it is encoded, that one. It's a special case, yes. So we had to do it, because otherwise, you lose that capability. and. Yeah, asynchronicity was something that we have been trying to get as much as we can and get 200%. So that was a big, um, you know, that was a needed addition. And Another special case I, I see in the uh, uh, AMD 64 um, GLIPC is, is the Restore RT. Uh, so, so signal frame, if, if it's something you can handle. Yes. So, Wayman, I don't know if you're online. Um, Wayman, are you online? No. So, he has been looking at that, and he will send something. <laughs> so, yeah. But the signal frame thing, yes, the CTA frame format does not yet even indicate that this is a signal frame. Maybe that's also something we need, because Unwinder might find it easier if it's encoded clearly that this is a signal frame and unwind so and so. But thank you, yes.